Chapter 1 23, an odd number, a prime 2. The number of missed calls greeting me on my recently lost and found brick phone. Also the number of years I had been on this planet. Coincidence? Or was it just a part of the strange happenings going on around me recently? With my brain fog settling in, I just could not decide. A few hours earlier. I started my slow walk leading to my Boston apartment. I walked noiselessly, treading carefully with my exhausted feet. I tried to focus, but it was hard. Misty's calming purr startled me and also brought things into perspective. Hey, you woke up? I asked, turning to face her cuteness. The white furball peeked outside my backpack and rubbed her ears on my back in unison. Misty, how did that goldfish thing happen? I said. Everyone keeps telling me I cannot keep a job. I paused for a moment. And you know what, I am getting the feeling that they may be right. How that goldfish had disappeared and then reappeared out of nowhere right next to my boss's desk, correction, ex bosses no one would believe me. Here it was, my one chance at being an FBI intern, and I had lost it. Okay, I planned the prank, but I had no intention of destroying things. And I would certainly never put a goldfish, an animal, or anyone in harm's way, this was just not me. I kept walking, the chilly October wind piercing my jacket greeting me as I recalled my time at the internship. I was not sure, but I think they called it a suspension, suspension, termination, whatever, I couldn't care less. Although, for the brief time of my prank, I had a blast. So had all the other interns, except, unlike me, they were wise enough not to show it. And the boss, oh well, he definitely did not get the joke. It was just a harmless prank, a simple jack-in-the-box out of a cardboard cake. But then, out of nowhere, his precious pet, the goldfish, had appeared inside. How did it even get there? One moment she was in her bowl. And the other in that box? And in my attempt to save her, I had destroyed his printer, wet his file cabinet, and oh, how can I forget what happened when he sat down on his chair, yes, the whoopee cushion. Truth be told, although I had brought the cushion along, I was certainly not planning on actually using it. As luck would have it, I had placed it for the time being and then forgot about it. And the rest, as they say, is history. As I came back to reality, the apartment door stared back at me beckoning me to use the key. I fumbled inside my backpack as Misty jumped outside. She was hungry and impatient. As I turned the key and pulled on the door, the musty smell of wood hit my nostrils. In my family, I am known for my sense of smell. My little cousin called me Shark Nose. And I did not blame him. Because sharks can smell things miles away. Every single fish in the ocean? and a superpower sense of smell? It must be awful to smell or taste. And then to swim around in it? I couldn't even imagine. Yuck. As I turned the lights on, the brightly colored walls of my bedroom greeted me. Seeing my room like that was relaxing, almost magical. Although I had trained to be a forensic computer scientist in college, art and colors were just my things. When I was young, my parents let me paint my room the way I wanted. The first attempts were ridiculous. But eventually, I had found patterns and colors which worked for me and did not completely repel anyone who dared enter. My legs ached, the long walk from the bus station had taken its toll. I am the old school type and simply cannot take a cab in the evening, even if it meant having to walk for long miles, in this case. I removed my shoes. My feet felt the cold floor as the old heating system gradually caught up with my arrival. I sat there, once again jobless and, perhaps, soon to be penniless. Hey Misty, what do you think? I asked the little kitten perched firmly in my lap. Do you agree with Mum? Do you also think Riza cannot keep a job? Misty's concerned eyes shone back at me. I was in my room, my castle, my home. Here I was with this bundle of extreme cuteness, tugging on my hoodie and purring as if there was no tomorrow. 
Oh, you queen of cuteness, you know you are probably the best thing that has happened to me in this entire time, I said. Let me find something for you to eat. Misty turned to me and gave me her cutest meow. My world suddenly brightened up as I held her for reassurance. Misty had settled in. I had given her some cat food and some of my leftover fish burger. Still in my jeans, I jumped on my bed. I stared at my bedroom, which clearly was in a royal mess. My recently removed coat was hanging on one side of a stand and the rest of the room, well that is another story. I lazed on the bed, too tired to get up, my eyes mechanically scouted the surroundings for cleaning targets. An initial analysis presented several targets. The bathroom, the closet, the kitchen, and, of course, the room itself. Oh really, why had I not arranged all my things when I left? The room looked like so much work, I could hire someone, or rather, given my financial situation, I could pay myself for a month to just sort my own things out. Still, something had to be selected to start with. My eyes turned to face the obvious first choice. The closet stared back at me, waiting and inviting me to get up. I kept staring at it lazily. Then I closed my eyes and meditated. A strange sound woke me up. It felt almost like someone had thrown something inside the closet. Had the closet cleaned itself? Nah, my psychic skills did not go that far. I could not do telekinesis. At least, as far as I knew about my skills, which were erratic and never helped. I dragged myself out of the bed. I had given it time. So many days since I had not been around. So, maybe my psychic senses were say, by some odd chance, maybe, just maybe, I might find it all cleaned up, all arranged. Oh, I wish. The only way forward, though, was through opening it. Come on, grasshopper, face your fears. Five minutes of uneasy procrastination and staring passed quickly. I finally got the courage to get up. One small step for Riza, one giant achievement for the apartment. I opened the closet door. An enormous pile of hurriedly stashed stinking smelly partially dried clothes hugged me unconditionally. Their proud owner, I had no option but to return their love. I could practically hear them speak. Dear Riza. The FBI does not deserve your smarts, no, no madam, not at all. After all, you stayed there for three weeks. That is two more than your usual, from all the jobs that we can recall. Still, we are glad you are back, safe and sound. I finally decided to unhug them, letting them pile up on the floor. My legs ached badly. I was dead tired. But with the agility of an aging, Dying leopard with tied legs, I leaped towards the bathroom to get ready for my prayers. Everything felt like happening in slow motion. My aching body resisted, but prayer was the respite I always looked for. Five times a day, I would return to do my meditation by reciting Dyke after my Muslim prayers, and it did not take long, anyway. I wrapped the multicolored silky scarf around my long brown hair, which was held together in a clip. I could smell my mum's faint fragrance in the scarf as I laid out my late father's soft prayer mat, pointing it in the right direction, and took off my slippers. Memories, sweet memories. His face came in front of my eyes as I stood on the mat. I sucked my tears in and emptied myself. My heartbeat started resonating with my body as I went deep in prayers. It was midnight by the time I got free. Prayers and meditation had always helped me get empty and stay focused. I was always excited about meditation, which I would do when I got free. My daily meditation, which was termed Marakaba, a part of the Naqshbandi Sufi tradition that I followed. I closed my eyes, bent my neck, went deep, focused on my heart. Dub dub. Dub dub. My heartbeat sounded louder and louder. I used the sound to meditate. I felt Misty crawl beside me and purr. Suddenly, something happened. Something that had never happened before. I was there, but I was not there. But wait, then where was I? The room still looked like my apartment. 
somehow, I could smell my perfume. It felt a lot stronger than how I recalled feeling it the last time I had put it on me. I looked up. My eyes glistened. I could see in the room a lot clearer than I could previously. The room was bright. Almost dazzling. It also appeared a lot larger than I recalled. Or. I just realized something. It was me who had become small, and I was in someone's lap. I looked up. I could see myself sitting there with my neck down, eyes closed, cloth covering eyes. If this was me, then where was I? Did I just die? Or was I out of my body? It was then that the reality dawned on me. Misty and I had become one. I was in her body. I really didn't know how to explain what had just happened. But somehow, in my meditation, she was me, and I had become her. And together, we felt one. Our thoughts were one. It was serene. But nothing perfect lasts forever. And then, before I could figure out what was going on, I was back. Misty looked at me lovingly. I held her paw. She also knew that something had happened. She had seen me vividly from her eyes. At that moment of the connection, I saw everything. But how could this be? Was this just a dream, or was it real? I did not know. A hot cup of joe helped reboot my brain. As my mind started working again, I thought to myself, is there somewhere I need to be? Or was there something I need to take care of? It was just then that I realized I had just committed a colossal blunder. My best friend Marine is a fine piece of art, if I may. Caring, yes. Bossy, a lot. And turns out, I had completely forgotten to inform her about my return. I shuddered at the thought of what she might do if she found out. I took out my phone and dialed. Ninety percent of me hoped she would not pick up. Ring. No pick. Ring. No pick. Yes, yes. Just one more ring and I can drop the call. And then I can tell her in the morning. Ring. Yellow, said the deep voice on the other end. Marine, it's me, Riza. Oh my goodness, Riza you, you rascal, did they just let you call from the FBI compound? Tell me all? Or rather. Listen, it's not what you think. Riza, oh oh, is the FBI listening in on you? Shoo. Okay, just tell me in code. Let me think. Okay. Big place. Pigeon. Message. Message. M. M. Talking with or chirping. Is that what pigeons do, right? I cannot even think what pigeons do. M. To R. S. Oh Marine, you are really silly. It is not what you think. Erm. Um. Well, I have been, hmm, what is the correct word? What are you doing, girl? Are you okay? What have they done with you? Tell me? You are killing me with the suspense. Tell me quickly. I will sort them out if they did something to my best friend, Marine said. Well, I did a prank, sort of, and got suspended, I said, giggling at my embarrassment. You did what? Said Marine, taking hard breaths, probably trying to figure out what I had done wrong this time around. You mean you got fired? Again? And where are you now? Tell me. Are you in trouble? Are they doing something terrible with you? Just tell me. Erm. Um. Marine, I am fine. And I am at my place. You are back? Evil monster. And you did not even bother to tell me you were coming. Could you not just call? I would have picked you up. Like an overfed gremlin, Marine had just evolved in seconds from a scampering mouse to a wounded lion. I was not ready to face her. Not now, at least. Yes, I was going to tell you, but my phone. See, I lost my phone before going and over there, I was just so confused and... 
I am coming right now. What? Now? I was dead tired and was hoping to hit the bed. But alas. Marine. I am fine, really, I said, trying to change the tone from my usual confused self to sweet and reassuring. Alarms sounded, red lights flashing everywhere. My imaginary place of tranquility, gone. I so hoped Marine was not coming over right now. But now there was no stopping the inevitable. If you are not already dead by the time I get there, I am coming to ensure it. Just wait, and bye, I am getting my keys, she said. The phone clicked shut before I could say anything. So it looked like no one was going to let me sleep. My aching body was becoming too much to handle. Oh well, I grabbed a bit of shut-eye before the monster friend came over. Lying in the bed, I was having varying thoughts. Marine fighting with me as I shoved my ex-boss dressed like a clown and a long line of other ex-bosses, all waiting in a line to fight me, I slept, giggling. You did what? Marine's face exhibited a mixed set of feelings, comedic amusement coupled with total disbelief. Well, I thought I would get away with it. It was a well-thought-out plan. And I thought. You thought they will award you the Nobel Peace Prize for destroying official property? Well, maybe the IG Nobel, the one people get for research that is funny, I said, giggling. Okay, on a serious note, now that you put it this way, it might not have been the best thing to do. I had purposefully left out the part about the reappearing goldfish and my attempt at saving her with a glass of water, which had backfired awfully. Not the best thing to do? Risa, you are killing me, girl. How many people get to work for the FBI? You were always the ace student in the class. And from the American Muslim community? If you do things of this sort, they will always brand us as outsiders. Don't you realize? It could have been something great. I know. But trust me, things really got out of hand there. I did not mean things to get this bad. You know me, Marine. I am just uncomfortable with formal things. Yes, I got the chance to be a part of the FBI. But law enforcement and all. That is just not me. I would rather be a magician or something. Yes, but your father. Uncle, he was military too, right? And he kept his job till said Marine. He was an intelligence officer back there, yes, a colonel in the army, I said. A sadness befell me. But I can still remember how he, his body came back in a casket. He saved countless lives. He had a life worth living. Did he not? He got the terrorists, Riza, said Marine. Yes, but I miss him, miss him badly, I said. I tried hard to suck my tears back in, failing miserably, two hot drops rolled down my cheeks. It violated my facade, Marine would know how I felt inside. Marine hugged me. Well, I think you would rather be a stand-up comedian or something with your attitude, she said. Okay, no harm done. This was just one job. While you do not have an excellent record in the past, still there must be so many jobs out there. I pushed myself to cheer up and respond. Yeah, maybe. Maybe someday I shall find a job and stick with it. As I giggled through my droopy eyes, I could see Marine had lost the energy to fight me more. Her eyes were telling me what she felt, she was struggling between hitting my head with a pillow or something dirtier, perhaps my shoes, or worse still, some of those smelly clothes in the closet. I shuddered at the thought. It was 3.30 a.m. when she finally left. I jumped into my bed. By then, sleep had left my eyes like a just-missed subway train whose only sign of being there was a glimpse and a trailing swoosh. Misty had been asleep throughout Marine's commotion. I gave the closet a try. As I wormed my way towards the closet door, for a moment, I held it open. Lo and behold, I saw something hiding behind one of my folded shirts. As I bent over to touch it, I knew I had found my missing phone. 
This ancient piece of technology was my brick phone, heavy and durable, capable of almost a month-long standby time. From the looks of it, it still had charge and was beeping. I moved my hands to lift it. The green screen on the phone had something flashing. As it beeped low battery, I pressed the button. The phone screen turned on. 23 missed calls. A sense of alarm suddenly shot through my spine. Who had been calling me while I was not here? Was it mum? Or someone else? I had to see. The numbers on the screen did not seem to be from my contacts. Not even one. But the country code showed them to be from the U.S. As I was trying to think who it could have been, the phone beeped one last time and died. Anyone who has experience using phones from a decade ago would know one thing for sure. It's hard to find adapters capable of charging them. I tried everything. But I could not find any reasonable way to fit a charger connecting in its charging socket. Until after what seemed like a century, I finally located what I was looking for. Plugging it in, I lifted my bed's cover, an object which seemed more exciting than ever. Before the sheep, goats, or cows could jump over my head, I passed into a deep sleep. Chapter 2 I had just woken up after two hours of sleep, the only respite from my escapades last night. In my dream, I was in a boat, floating in a stormy ocean, with no oars or sails. Risa I heard someone calling my name. My heart beat fast as I struggled. I tried to look for the caller. The voice sounded familiar but lost. I woke up. I looked at the clock across from the dressing table mirror. Sunlight peeked brightly through the window. As my right foot touched the wooden floors, the cold felt comforting. My wandering feet finally found what they were looking for as I slid my feet inside the soft, warm bedroom slippers. I took hold of my hair, adjusting the clip. Nuzzling the side of my spring mattress, I rose and arched my back as my brain still struggled to boot up. The sun kept shimmering and watching playfully through the window as I lazily slithered across the floor. As I brushed my teeth, the events of the night came back to me. The phone. The missed calls. Instinctively, I brushed my teeth vigorously. The two mandatory minutes of cleaning had become my second nature. I could almost hear my mum's sarcasm. Riza, if you still want to have teeth by the time you are twenty, I suggest you spend at least two minutes on your brushing, she would say. Ah, the joys and pains of having a doctor mom. I was twenty-three now and mom, I still had teeth. I imagined mom watching me. My mom was in a faraway Asian country, treating complete strangers when. In my hurry to get out of the bathroom and check the phone, I almost slipped. The phone lay there in an inviting fashion. I zoomed past the table, disconnecting it from the charger. The unknown numbers stared back at me from the bleak green screen. I examined them to see if they made any sense. My cognition failed, they were all from random area codes. Suddenly, I had an idea. I dashed to the side of my backpack on my bedside and opened the zipper. The faint smell of paper hit my nose as I pulled my trusted contact register out. Having a degree in computer forensics had made me a skeptic. I never relied too much on cloud-based sync services. So, I had kept a copy of my contacts in hard form as well. Besides, I had a lot of ideas that I got from reading mysteries. I had always been an introvert. My mom used to say, Riza, you and your detective novels and she was right. My novels had always kept me company. I went from one page to the other, but nothing. This was getting weird. Someone who had been trying to call me desperately, but the numbers seemed different each time. A puzzle. Interesting. I loved puzzles. Hmm. What could it be? What good is having a 150 IQ when I cannot even solve his simple puzzle? Wait, could it be? Suddenly I got what it was. I was in college and had to contact one of my teachers. 
Now, my prepaid mobile phone was low on credit, so I was using a calling card, and she would just not pick my calls up. So, I found out she would not pick calls from unknown numbers and the calling card made my number appear different each time on the caller ID. Eventually, she called me back because even with low credit, my number had shown up somehow. So, if this person really wanted to reach me, perhaps he or she might have tried using a personal phone, too. With my left hand, I pushed the drawer open and brought out a partially sharpened pencil. Oh no, more hurdles to work. My mom hated me for this. I could never write with a pencil unless it was perfectly sharpened. Even if it was a critical moment, even if it was a time like this. As I pushed my hand deep inside the drawer, I found what seemed like a sharpener. I seemed to be lucky today. With my other hand, I kept flipping pages in the notebook. Finally, I found what I was looking for, an empty page. I opened the phone up and started looking for matching numbers. I noted down the numbers on the page, each on a line of its own. Most seemed different. Different digits, different area codes. Suddenly, patterns started forming. And then, out of nowhere, bingo. I had found it. There it was. The number, which appeared twice. My pulse elevated, and adrenaline started pouring. I felt excitement well up inside my stomach. In my imagination, I patted myself. A job well done. I chuckled as I imagined myself standing on top of the world's toughest peak to climb, K2, holding a flag in my hand. Reporters snapping pictures. Wait, what? Reporters on K2? Risa, come back to planet Earth. Now that I had the number with me, I waited and held the phone, and pressed the dial button. The bell kept going. I waited. Hoping to hear someone speak. Wondering who it would be. Voice mailbox. I dialed again. The bell kept going. Ring. Ring. I waited patiently. Voice mailbox again. The puzzle was challenging my sanity and calm. My pulse raced. Something inside me hoped and prayed, whoever it was, at least, I would get to know. It must have been important. Really important for the person to contact me so many times. I kept waiting. Nobody picked the phone up. A wave of despair passed through my stomach. I felt shattered. I placed the phone down. Despite all my efforts, I had failed. What had seemed like a simple call was causing me anxiety. An uneasy lump welled up in my throat. Someone had been trying to reach me. Someone had been desperate enough to call me so many times. And now the person was not responding. At least, I needed to know that the person was fine. I hoped secretly that, maybe, just maybe, the person would call back. I kept holding the phone, staring at the ceiling. A cute purr brought me home. Misty had woken up and had jumped into my lap. I looked at her and relaxed. As I let go of the breath which I had been holding in my tummy, a vibration startled me. I look at the phone. A number was calling. But it was not the one that I had called. Hello, I said. Who am I speaking with? The female voice on the other side of the phone was polite but authoritative. Actually, you are the one who called me. So, I am sorry if I did not introduce myself properly. I am Officer Jenny at the Mulberry Police Department. A police officer? What had I gotten myself into now? Hi Jenny, how can I be of service? Actually, it is a kind of odd situation here. We have a body, a John Doe. No ID. Just a locked phone. And your call just came through. A body? Oh, my goodness. You are telling me this phone came with a dead body? Yes, I just said that. Ma'am, can you please introduce yourself first? Okay, to be honest, I am still not sure I can trust anyone over the phone. So, if you are who you say you are, how can I verify that? 
Let me give you the official phone number of the station. You can call me on that number, she said. I called her back to verify. Turned out I had to plan a trip to this small little town, Mulberry, M.A. Ma'am, we would appreciate it if you can come early though, as we have to wrap things up. I shall be honest with you. If you had not called, this body may have ended up as a cadaver for med students. I would hate that to happen. But I can only hold on for a day. So, I hope you will come and identify. Can we count on you? Yes, you can. I shall look your town up and try to come as soon as I can. Okay, that looks like a plan. And ma'am, is this the number that we can reach you on? Yes, that would be fine. Hmm. On second thought, please also take my other number. I offered her my smartphone number as I realized I could not guarantee this phone being active, with the weird connector and all. Okay. Looking forward to meeting you in person soon. Have a great day. As I disconnected the call, my mind was going through a million different things. Why was this happening to me? Was Jenny a real police detective? Whose body was it? And why had he been calling me for so long? And the worst thought of all, could I have saved him if I had attended his call? The packing did not take long. After all, I had just returned. I closed the zipper on my carry-on bag and put it beside the bed. I sat down at the bedside and started recalling things. Memories of the good times. The bad times. Memories of my mum. Memories of my auntie, of my father, who would come and tuck me into my bed. My father had died a brave man, part of the inter-services intelligence wing of the Pakistan army finding out locations of terrorists in the northern part of Pakistan. He had died protecting innocent people. My mum was an American, a doctor. We had never been the same after his death. At first, I thought she would get closer to me. But then, as I grew up, we grew apart. The long work hours as she kept making herself busier at her work, the missed school meetings, all came back to me. Then I still recalled that night she opened up about why she could not tolerate me. She said she would see his image in me and just could not handle it. Time passed and eventually, she moved abroad, leaving me with her sister. And then my aunt died of a stroke and left her apartment for me. I looked at my lonely place as I adjusted my shoelaces, dusting mud flakes off. Whoever it was, I had to go to Mulberry and find out who he was, how had he died, perhaps find his family and friends. I had to ensure he got a good burial. Everyone deserved a good burial. And find out why he kept calling me. With a heavy heart, I turned towards the wall and felt the smooth switches with my fingertips. The lights turned off one at a time, the thick red curtains causing the room to go dark. As I locked the door behind me, the afternoon sun hit my eyes. My hand slid down the pockets of my slacks, looking for my shades as I attached the key inside the backpack. As I boarded the bus, the queue inside moved slowly. Hiding behind my dark brown shades, I peeked around at the people. The usual bus crowd was there, the young and the old, the smartly dressed and the shabby ones. The bus itself had the aura of fresh perfume, like the smell in a car wash. Air from the side vents blew on the side of my face as I crept onwards. Seat 21A, I looked at my ticket, inching towards my seat, trying hard not to bump into people. People were placing their bags in the top holders, some were sitting, others talking. Different fragrances of perfumes and deodorants filled the air. I felt eyes following me like they always did. Somehow, people found my attire odd as much as I tried to blend in. Still, I would think a Muslim girl with a headscarf dressed in modern attire was pretty common to come by these days in this area. After all, the Boston, being an academic hub, had people from around the globe. Or maybe the people on the bus were just not from around here. As I squeezed myself onto the window edge of the seat, I noticed that the seat beside me was pleasantly empty. Empty was good. The introvert in me was happy. I always preferred to be left alone to my thoughts. 
My experiences on buses had taught me that there was nothing worse than a serial talker on a long trip. Misty purred as she glanced outside the backpack in my lap. I opened my journal and reviewed the day plan that I had hurriedly scribbled the night before. The shadows outside were just past midday. Their shortness and darkness mirrored my internal feelings. A swooshing sound told me that the bus driver had closed the doors shut. Hi there, sweetie, said a tiny voice beside me. It is a wonderful day. Why look so glum? I turned to face the aging but sparkly lady at my side. Hi, not really. Not glum. Just enjoying the ride while I can, I said. I am Heidi by the way, and you are? She smiled and showed well-maintained aged teeth. I am Risa. Great to meet you, Risa. You seem like a very confident young lady, the lady said, watching me intensely. Gray eyes complimented her fair skin. Her short boyish silver hair seemed to be fashioned in an Einsteinian hairstyle of sorts. I pulled myself back to reality and smiled. Nice to meet you too, Heidi, I replied politely. I was behind you in the queue. The counter clerk told me you were also going to the same place that I was going. And I told her I would be lucky if we go together. So here we are, Heidi said. Yes, as luck would have it, that is the case. Are you also going to Mulberry, M.A.? I asked. Yes, I am, she said, pausing momentarily. Have you been to Mulberry before? Not really. I shall be honest with you. I just came to know of the town's existence, I said, exhibiting a smile to hide my embarrassment. Ha, huh, well, you don't have to be ashamed. Risa, I have traveled across the world, and trust me, few people know about our sweet Mulberry. So, don't you worry. I was not sure how to respond, so I tried hard to make a face that would appease the old lady. She seemed helpful, though, and I didn't want to do anything to annoy her. Oh, and who do we have here? Asked Heidi, looking at Misty, who had just woken up and had gotten out of her hiding place, leaping into my lap. Oh, this is Misty. Misty, say hi to Heidi, I said. Heidi patted Misty on her head. Misty playfully purred in response. I am sure Mulberry must be an interesting place. I just do not know it well enough to comment, though, I said. Oh dearie, it is indeed a very charming place. We have the falls, we are next to a state forest. And then we have a mountain range. Oh, a very scenic place? Yeah, it is, but young people, like yourself, don't like it much there. Why don't they like it? Is there a problem living there? I asked. Would there be life if there were no problems? She said. It is just that there are several areas around Mulberry where there is no cell phone coverage. We have such a low population density that perhaps the telecom companies do not think it worth it to place towers there. Oh great, and here I was hoping I was not walking into a complete nightmare on the Elm Street scenario. I noticed Heidi studying my face. Great, a face reader companion for two hours. What else could go wrong? Heidi turned out to be a far better companion than I had initially expected. She was polite, warm, and unassuming, and she did not judge me. By the time we got close to Mulberry suburbs, she had made me so comfortable that I felt she was my age. I almost felt as if perhaps she was just wearing an elaborate disguise to make herself appear older. Here you see those nice mulberry farms. Can you see those green coverings in the distance? She said. Oh, are these farmhouses? They look like little. Frogs, as if ready to jump, right? Yes, that is exactly what I was going to say, I said, giggling in amusement. Oh wow, just two hours together, and you are already finishing my sentences. A few more hours and people might consider us related. That is true, said Heidi, chuckling. Risa, dear, do you have any place to stay here? I don't know about your business, but I hope you have planned your trip well. I could feel my face turn bright red under her polite but intense gaze. 
Well, not really. I thought I would get a motel as I am only staying anyway for one night, at max. And that too, if I cannot help it. If you need any help, just call me. My house is in the cell phone area. And just so you know, if you are in an area where the phone does not work, you can walk into any shop and ask them to let you use the landline. I shall certainly keep that in mind, I said, making a mental note about Heidi's usefulness. By any chance, would you know anyone in the police department there in Mulberry? Of course, we have Jenny Rogers, but you know she really does not have much to do, per se. Other than perhaps find out if someone's chicken gets lost or maybe sheep, Heidi said, chuckling in a lively manner, and we have Sheriff Kevin Jackson. Let's just say his bark is worse than his bite. Well, I have tried searching online. I could not find a place to rent for the night, but I hope they have motels. There are some here, right? I asked. Well, we have a place, but it gets filled up often. It's a bed and breakfast, so you typically need to check with Sam a couple of days in advance if he is around and working his B&B. Oh, you mean there is no walk-in kind of thing? Sweetie, this is Mulberry. As you might find out soon, they almost forgot to include us on the map. More than half of the town comprises forest land, and the rest is next to the mountain range. Most people here work on their farms. We probably have just five people per square mile, she said, moving closer, and Sam, he is a very strict type. He also gives camp training and sometimes comes to my shelter, too. Your shelter? I said. Did she just say shelter? A shelter for what? Ah yes, a shelter for animals. I will be happy to tell you more about it, dearie. It was just then that we passed the town welcome signboard which read Welcome to Mulberry. Founded 1,779. Population, 345. Chapter 3. The bus came to a gentle, unsurprising halt at a railway crossing. I looked outside at the late afternoon landscape in the charming New England sun. As I slid my hand into the back pocket of the seat next, I felt the smooth contour of the old brick phone. I tried to check it stealthily, but Heidi's chuckle told me I had failed miserably. My cheeks and ears warmed up with embarrassment. Oh well, I could not hide much from my 61-year-old companion, could I? Oh, the trusted Nike phone. And I thought kids these days did not even know these things existed, said Heidi, peering at my hands from behind her thick black glasses. Really? Well, I don't know about others, but I value it a lot, I said, adjusting to the sharp lady. I was struggling to find good reasons to justify my use of ancient tech, something which may have been very cool once, but then smartphones happened. Erm. Nothing matches its battery life and, of course, durability. Although there are newer models, I still prefer this one. Truth be told, it was not the model that I cherished. It was the phone. I had formed a sentimental bond with the phone. It was the one my father had with him, so even if I did not use it regularly, I kept thinking about it. Still, I was not one to express my feelings in front of others, especially people I had just met once. Yes, I am sure it does, dearie, she said, smiling comfortingly. The bus moved forward, giving me a momentary respite. I peeked quickly at the lit green screen, half expecting to see some fresh trouble brewing up. The cozy empty screen shone back. We are almost there, Riza. It has been a pleasure talking with you. I am missing you already, said Heidi. Feelings are mutual, Heidi, I said. If you get into any trouble, remember Heidi is there for you. Any time. Anything at all, okay? Asked Heidi reassuringly squeezing my hand. Thank you so much. I shall keep that in mind, I said. I had agreed instinctively, though I secretly hoped that I did not have to rely on Heidi. Heidi was nice, but perhaps the problem was with me. And the way Heidi was, I worried she may tell me things about myself, things which either I did not know or maybe did not even want to know. Either way, 
I hoped Mulberry would be an open and shut case. After all, how complicated could it be? Go to the town, deal with the police and go back home. Wait, I was not quite clear about what would happen when I got to see the body, but could just try to go with the flow, as long as the flow meant returning to Boston within a day or two. The cool Mulberry air greeted me as I disembarked from the bus. The bus swished past us on to its next destinations. Misty snuggled close to me in the backpack. She had been peeking periodically, inquisitive about all the new things, noticing all the new people around. The bus station smelled of the freshly cleaned floor with shining yellow polished wooden benches, its elegance only matched by its emptiness. Heidi seemed to know everyone personally. I tagged along as her silent companion while we transcended slowly towards the gate. She greeted everyone, from the janitor to the bus driver. Risa, dear, are you sure you are going to be all right? Asked Heidi, her face showing genuine concern. I know I am asking this repeatedly, but you look so fragile and lonely. I hope you stay well. I will be fine, Heidi. I am stronger than I look, I said, flexing my right biceps. And I shall definitely contact you if I need any help. She smiled. We hugged in a quick, warm goodbye. As I held her briefly, I noticed the fragrance of her refreshing, expensive perfume. Heidi was certainly very well-groomed and elegant, and she had a great taste in fragrances. And thank you for the invite, I said, whispering in her ear. You might regret it, though, in case you end up not getting rid of me so soon. I am counting on it, said Heidi, chuckling. Still, I was secretly hoping to be gone from this place before I had even seen it, and yet, something in my gut was telling me otherwise. My gut seemed to have an uneasy connection with the universe. Having tied itself in a queasy knot, what was it telling me now? I hated to find out. Heidi caressed Misty's white, silky mane. The driver stood by as she entered the elegant car. The old man smiled politely at me as he meticulously closed the door. As the car drove purred away smoothly, I stood there, waiting, lost in my thoughts. I looked at my smartphone. Despite what I had known about the town till now, I was feeling foolish, hoping that I could get some cab service around here. Wait, what? The lone signal bar painted a gloomy figure. The internet gremlins had brought the net down for me. Misty. Any idea what we should do now? I said. Misty looked at me with a supportive face. She had adjusted to my stubbornness and knew that I would not get help from anyone if there were even a minute chance of getting things done without it. I adjusted the straps of my backpack, lifting it, sliding one arm after the other, with her peeking outside curiously. As I gently drew my breath in, the fresh smells of recent rain hit my nose. The road shone with a tinge of the red setting sun. Mulberry defied its scarcely populated impression on the get-go. It may have a small population, but its roads seemed well-developed. The brick pavements on the side could easily have been mistaken for a big city. As I dragged my feet across its unknown ways, my brain ran into overdrive. I wondered where Sam's bed and breakfast was. Where would I stay for the night? And what if I did not find a place to stay? As I walked along alone on the road, I realized it might have been better if I had asked someone at the bus station. My smartphone search engine did not seem to work either. Of course, the signals had to go away just when I needed them most. Riza, you realize that you have successfully stranded yourself in a ghost town, I said to myself in a low voice. Misty let out a little growl. Yes, both of us. I have stranded both of us in Mulberry. Five more minutes on the road, and I came across what looked like a small shop. A shop in the middle of nowhere. An American flag flew crisply in the fall wind. Thank goodness for humanity. As I moved closer to the door, I saw the open sign on the old, cracked glass. I pushed the old door as the unoiled hinges resisted, creaking. As I peeked inside, the shop seemed well stocked. An old man stood at the solid wooden counter. I placed my hand and looked up. 
The man was busy alternating between writing in a dusty register and looking at an equally dusty point-of-sale terminal. Excuse me, I said. Hello there, who do we have here? Said the man, peeking at me through his glasses. He was tall, I estimated around six feet three inches in his late seventies. His hands wrinkled, green veins showing signs of chronic, ignored arthritis. Hi, I am looking for Sam's BNB, I said. Sam's BNB? Aha. Oh dear, the man's gaze and composure changed in a microsecond from uninterested to deeply amazed or perhaps even startled. So, I am guessing you are not from around here? Are you? Not really. I just got to Mulberry the first time, I said. The man looked on, sensing my awkwardness. I am a bit confused, young lady. It is kind of weird, but may I ask how come you are looking for this place? He asked, his voice toned down a bit. Well, I have to stay in this town for a day or so. Someone I met on the bus told me about Sam's place, I said. I looked around at the shop instinctively. A few pet toys hung behind him, waving as a gentle wind blew from the open door. The man said, the thing is, Mulberry had Sam's BNB back in the 80s, but it burned down 10 years ago. Now it was my turn to be surprised. My jaw dropped. I gasped. What was happening here? How could this be? Heidi seemed like a local. How could she not know about this? I felt a cold defying bead of sweat well up and trickle down my forehead. I took a deep breath and said, I am really sure the lady I met on the bus, why would she lie to me? She did not. But I got you, did I not? Said the man, chuckling. What do you mean? I said, gasping. You should have seen the look on your face, he said, laughing. I resisted my urge to reply, but just looked at him with scorn. See, a lot of us old people live around here. And we don't get many visitors. We get some town visitors, people who come and stay in the mountains or the state forest for months or even years, but they know everything about this place, he said. So, sir, do you think it is cool to startle strangers? I asked. Well, you would have to agree it can be fun, especially when an old person like me can play a prank on someone so smart as yourself, is it not? He asked. Okay, have to hand it to you. You got me, I said, trying to check my embarrassment, which I was now sure was showing up with halos and lights, like in the comics. I could picture a thought bubble on my head, saying, embarrassed. Well, Sam's place is just around the corner. I hope you have made a reservation, though, he said. Sam, he can be rather particular about procedures. Reservations are his thing. I did not reply because I felt that anything that I would utter now would just cause me even more embarrassment. Best of luck, miss? Asked the man. Risa. You can call me Risa. And you are? I asked. I am Larry. Good luck, Risa. I hope I have pronounced it correctly, he said. Yes, Larry. You have. Perfectly. Good luck to you, too. I rushed towards the next turn on the street. Farms surrounded me. Vast areas of fenced green areas and crops with buildings in the middle. It was getting really late now, and I secretly hoped to find the place soon. A sudden loud noise started me. As I moved on, peeking on all sides, I overheard it. A rather large house stood up on my right. Its construction differed from the farms that I had passed by. I have told you, sir, I do not sleep during my duty hours. Do you think I am stupid? What have you taken me for? Sir, I did not mean to be disrespectful. And I really appreciate all that you have done for me. What do you think about this then, tell me? The older man was holding a register. Sir, I really do not know why she has written those comments about me. Wilbur, you know very well that our business runs on clients. Sir, I realize that. If you did, 
then you should ensure that hot water is available for every guest? Said the older man. Bingo. Misty, it looks like we have finally found the BNB. The old guy must be Sam, I said. Misty purred as if agreeing with me. If you had realized, then you would have been attentive and ensured the water was the right temperature before anyone was up, the man said. You know what? I have had it with you. Sir, please forgive me, the younger man said, pleading. I will think about it. But you can take a break for a week. I will look for better help and meanwhile you are welcome to look for another job as well. If I decide to hire you back, I shall call your mother. Excuse me, sir, is this Sam's BNB? I said, interrupting the exchange. Yes, it is. And who are you? Asked the older man. I am Reza and sir, would you be Sam, the owner? I said. Yes, that is me. Reza? Is that how you pronounce it? He asked. It is actually Reza. R-I-Z-A, I said, spelling my name politely. Well, off you go, Wilbur, the man said, ignoring me. The employee moved slowly through the gate, avoiding my gaze. Yes, miss whoever you are. Anyway, how can I help you? Erm. Um, I was wondering if I could get a place to stay. Just for a day or two. Okay, yes, that is what we are here for. When do you want the room? The man opened a large register, holding his pen. He then adjusted his reading glasses. I don't know. Would tonight be okay? I asked in a low voice. What? Said Sam. He raised his eyes from the register, glaring at me. Miss, may I know how you came to know about my place? Oh, I met a lady on the bus on my way here. She suggested I try your place out, I said, hoping that the man would let me explain. My backpack felt heavier than usual. Misty shifted uncomfortably in the bag, as if scolding me for being careless. And did she not mention the rules? The man said sternly. Young lady, I don't know where you are from. But over here, we have rules. I think she might have mentioned, but see I am new here, so, I said. So you thought you do not have to follow the rules? He said. I noticed his face turning a crimson red now. I am sorry about that, but I really need a place to crash, I said. Well, that is not my problem then, is it? Said Sam. What was with the people around here? I turned around to leave. If you still want it, I can make a booking, he said. Considering you are new, I can get things ready for you the day after tomorrow. Remember, that is just for you. I did not respond. I certainly hoped I did not have to stay in this strange town any longer. I want this lunch finished, young lady, Jenny said, her eyes intense. Mommy, just because you wear a police uniform, it does not mean you can act like one at home, too. So, don't young lady me please, said the little girl, matching the stare back with her shiny little eyes. Okay, you also don't mommy me right now either. All I am asking is, said Jenny, head turned back to face the girl in the back seat, with a voice toned down a teeny bit, in response to the little monster's anti-mommy tactic. Yes, yes, you want me to finish the broccoli and the lunch? Arg. I think you really want me to ask the principal to give you detention, said Jenny. Yes, why not? All the other cool kids are in detention every day. Jenny realized her tactic had backfired as the little girl had turned the tables around. Well, no, there are good kids and then there are bad kids. And you are in third grade, said Jenny trying to get a hold of the confrontation. Okay, now please go or you will be late for school. The little girl exited the car, making a face that Jenny ignored. She watched her daughter walk inside the school before turning the car onto the freeway. Just as she was about to enter, her car shook wildly. Something whizzed past as her car's shocks compensated. She turned her head and looked outside. 
she glimpsed the back of a white truck speeding away. Before she knew it, it vanished in a cloud of dust. Her heart beat faster as she turned the car to see what had happened. As she drove past the farms, she could see the dust still flying in the air, gradually settling. Mulberry was a small town, and she cherished her life here. There was almost no crime, no drama other than the occasional bar fight and sometimes the cow or the chicken theft. And often, the theft turned out to be animals that had wandered off to another farm. She had options of joining the state police, but she had opted to join the Mulberry Police Force. Jenny wondered. What was happening in her town? First a dead body, and now a maniac truck driver? As she moved along the road, she saw a place with a broken fence. Jenny pressed her foot on the brake and pulled the car to a stop. She looked outside at the long stretch of destruction left by the speeding vehicle. The smell of fresh farm air with a tinge of the fragrance of fall flowers hit her nose. She opened the door of her police car and put a uniformed foot on the ground. Mulberry was a small town, but the sheriff took the uniform seriously. Kevin Jackson ensured that both he and Jenny dressed up properly in a uniform. So, what do we have here, miss? said Jenny. The woman turned around and looked at Jenny, visibly agitated, I don't know, young lady, but someone was in a real hurry here. I can see that. Was there any damage other than the fence? Other than the fence? What do you mean? Have you given it a thought on what if there was some animal or some child was on the road? I did not mean that, she said, realizing quickly that she had asked the wrong question. As there was nothing much going on in this town, the result was that other than town council meetings, Jenny did not get to meet most of the Mulberry's residents. So she only knew those who were regulars at the town meetings. Or else if she ended up facing someone at the local grocery stores. But she still knew little about them. Well, officer, said the lady, peering at her name tag. Jenny, you need to investigate this in death. The person was a maniac. He was driving like the wind. Ma'am, I certainly will. Can you please describe the vehicle? Well, to be honest, I cannot. Okay. So I am not really sure what to write in the complaint then. Can you not look at your cameras or something? Ma'am, I am afraid Mulberry Town Council never approved funds for surveillance cameras. So, I don't think I can go with that. If, however, we have an eyewitness, I can try to locate the truck, she said. I was myself down the road and saw the rear end of a truck before it went along the road, but I don't think there is enough information to catch the person. Yes, we all know it was a white truck. But who was driving it? And who was going to pay to fix the fence? Jenny felt an acidic lump forming in the middle of her chest. She was not good at this kind of interaction. Especially when there was not much she could do. Ma'am, I wonder, did you have any insurance covering this damage? Officer, I don't think you have been around Mulberry a lot, have you? Why would you say that, ma'am? Because over here, very few people ever spend money on insurance. Jenny walked to the side of the police car and, bending over the window, opened the glove compartment to bring out a notebook. As she moved the notebook outside, Jenny enjoyed the smell of the fresh pages. She penned the incident down. The freshness of the notebook seemed to go stale with all the new happenings which she now had to report. My visit to Sam's B&B had not turned out to be a pleasant one. As I walked outside the enormous gates of Sam's place, the sun was already setting. A few streetlights were illuminating the way. My mind was racing across the various possibilities. As much as I did not want to, I had done something completely irrational, so there was no one else to blame but me. I dragged my feet around and checked the road on either side. 
As I wandered along aimlessly, suddenly, a light bulb lit in my mind. As much as I hated talking with the sharp old lady, Heidi seemed to be my only respite. Or maybe I should call the police officer. I placed the backpack on the ground and opened the zipper. My trusted Nikea was lying there in all its antique glory. I slid my hand in and took it out. Misty jumped outside. I picked her up and placed her in the front side large pocket of my hoodie to keep her warm and dialed the number. The ring went on three times. Come on. Now. Pick up the phone. Hello, you have reached the official line of Mulberry Police. Our office hours are Monday to Friday, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The office is currently closed. If you have an emergency, you can call the county office hotline at I disconnected the phone. As I walked past the Mulberry Town Mid-Center, the familiar sight of New England fall greeted me with the trees turning and the weather getting colder. It would have been pleasant if I knew I would have a nice place to sleep for the night. As I walked around looking at my phone, trying to find a signal, I walked past what looked like a boundary of a large enclosure. I recalled what Heidi had told me about half of the town being owned by some big rich guy and most of the rest of the town working for him at his ranch or farm or something. I wasn't paying much attention when she talked about this as I was just going to be here for a brief period anyway. A sudden rush of excitement came over me as I felt there was someone nearby. I stopped and looked around. There was no one. I relaxed a bit. But instinctively, I trod cautiously. Then suddenly it happened. The trap sprung out of nowhere. One moment I was there walking nimbly and the next, I hung upside down from a tree. I struggled to keep my backpack on while trying to look around. Misty was on the ground in time and was looking at me with troubled eyes. As I twisted and turned, trying to free myself, a powerful flashlight blinded me. Well, well, well. Who do we have here, trespassing? A man's voice called me out. Let me go, please. I was not trespassing. Who are you, folks? I said. This looks like one of those pesky outsiders. Another voice came from the side. I could not make out how many they were because of the light. Look, I was not trespassing. For all I knew, this road was a part of the path to the town center. Now you really have to get this rope off me, I said, calming myself, controlling the sudden adrenaline rush. Whoever these people were, I knew well how to play mind games. This was something I was good at. Aha, we have a talker. She can talk even while hanging upside down from a tree, the first voice said aloud. Whoever these people were, they were not afraid of being heard. That meant they were locals. And that meant they really did not know who I was or what I could do. We will get you down, Missy. We will. But first, tell us who you are and why are you here? The other man asked, bellowing in a husky voice. Well, I will tell you after you let me down, I said. I had decided I would not budge. No, never in front of these rascals. Let her loose. What can she do at most? Pounce on us? The first man said. Yeah, let me do that, but hey, you need to see she does not run, said the second. I clenched my fists and tried to recall my years of kung fu training. My father had put me in my first martial arts club when I was barely eight years old. And while we moved through towns because of his military postings, one thing was constant, and that was I would go to the local martial arts school within the first week of our move. From Taekwon due to Bando and Chinese Kung Fu, I have had self-defense training in various styles over the years. My father's face came into my eyes of Riza, you need to practice martial arts so much that it becomes your second nature. You should be able to defend yourself if someone attacks you, even when you are fast asleep. The blow was completely unexpected. It dazed me for a moment. The man hit my head again. And a third time. Then I felt my feet being untied as I felt the crisp and slightly wet ground. Desperately, I tried to gain consciousness. 
Muffled laughter was all I could make out. They were looking through my backpack. Then I heard one of them cry out happily. Bingo, she brings us a nice stash of cash, thank you, sweet lady. The man complimented me as if someone had tasked me with bringing a gift for these lowlifes. And that is when I got my second wind. I took a deep breath inside and sprang my right leg directly into his face, and it connected. I felt the cracking of a bone in his hand. It would be his wrist if I were to guess. But I was not guessing. I knew for sure. He had tried to raise his hand instinctively in response to my movement, and that was exactly what I wanted. I wanted to break his hand. And I had done just that. Oh my hand, this cunning little fox is very feisty. She broke my wrist, the man said, screaming in pain. The other guy was in a state of shock as he tried to figure out how to proceed. Slow, are you not? I said, my left arm ready for the next move. Before he could say anything, I attacked him right in his neck. It startled the man. I did not mean to hurt him, but I wanted to make an impression. This was the only way they would let me go. And my plan seemed to work. My attackers stood there in a dazed state. Now, however, was not the time to rejoice. One of the first principles of self-defense that I had learned from my father was to confuse and distract the attacker and just get away as soon as possible. I staggered to my feet. My quick attacks had been successful, but the men were big and strong as compared to my small frame and I could not repeat as now they were on guard. I looked at my backpack and my stash of cash lying there. On one hand, I could try to reach it, but then I would come in their range of attack and they could try to grab my foot or something. I made a conscious decision. Luckily, my phones were still with me in my jeans pockets, one on each side. Misty was near my feet. I picked her up and tried to sprint away from the two and towards the town lights. My head was still spinning because of the blows to my head, so it was hard to keep a pace but I did not slow down to look back. My estimate was that they were about ready to get up by now but my blows had made sure they knew they would not want to come after me. As I ran towards the city center lights, I felt a buzzing in my pocket. Oh, thank goodness for cellular signals. But I did not stop to look at the phone. I had to get to a safe place somehow. As I reached the town center, I was short of breath. Under normal conditions, I would not have even broken a sweat, considering that I ran five miles daily in the morning alternating between sprints and jogging. The first lights I saw were of a store next to a gas station. I peeked inside as I stood near the door. A landline was visible next to the counter register. Whether or not I liked it, I had to get a hold of Heidi. That was no other way now. You poor sweetie. Mulberry did not treat you well on your first day, did it? Heidi was sympathetic as she applied a dressing to the cut on my head. Maybe we can get you checked up if you are unwell. It is a bit of a drive, though. The nearest big hospital around here is an hour on Interstate 495. That is all right. I think I gave them more than they gave me. Well, no one is counting hits in a fight like that, my dear. You just need to be careful and safe. Heidi, yes, you are right. I am lucky, I said, trying to hide my embarrassment as I analyzed the situation while Heidi left me briefly. I walked into that trap, which resulted from me not investigating the area before I had come to the town. Heidi came back with a cup. You need to get this milk in you, Riza dear, she said, raising the cup to my lips as if I was a little child. I took the cup from her hands and said, thanks. Riza, may I ask, do you have any special meal preferences? She said, her eyes briefly skimming over my head covering, which I had adjusted again by now. Well, I am not a vegetarian, but you can say we eat specially prepared meat, I said. Ah, you eat halal meat only, right? It is like kosher, right? She asked me inquisitively. Yes, you got it right, I said. 
I was relieved, as it was awkward having to explain it to people. Well, we might not have that type of meat just now. So, I guess I can make vegetable soup for you if that is okay? And perhaps some fish and chips? Yes, that would be perfect. I rested my head on the pillow and planned my next day. Mulberry had posed more challenges for me than I had prepared for. I meditated. My heart focused on what had transpired. I needed to get back into the mindset that I had learned while training for my three martial arts styles. I would never be a weak girl. What if I had failed to enter the FBI? I had to be strong. And strong was also my last name. It was frustrating to get trapped when I knew I could have avoided it. But meditation calmed me. I did not know when sleep overcame me as I kept recounting and analyzing my mistakes. Chapter 4 Riza dear, may I ask what is troubling you? Asked Heidi, her keen eyes examining me through her glasses. It was her gazes that had me squirming like a tiny sentient organism subjected to an examination under a microscope. Ah, well, I am just trying to understand what is happening. And I shall be honest with you, I am having a hard time, I replied, avoiding direct eye contact with Heidi. So, you really kicked them upright? I hope that teaches them a lesson to never think of attacking anyone, especially a girl, said Heidi. I could see that she was distracting me from the world of gloom. Yes, I fight like a girl. See it even says that on my tee, I replied, pointing Heidi to my t-shirt. Oh, nice one, Heidi chuckled, adjusting her glasses back on her shiny white nose. I did not want Heidi to know what was going on in my brain though, and it was hard with her looking at me with her bright, hypnotic eyes. I was stuck in this town, stripped of my cash, and was not even sure who the dead man was. And I had to set up a meeting with the detective today. In the morning, Heidi had reported the incident to the police over the phone while I was resting. Heidi, may I share a little secret with you? I asked. Yes, Risa dear, an old lady like me keeps a lot of things hidden deep inside, anyway. Besides, if I tell them to someone, who is going to believe? Heidi said, chuckling. I felt a bit more confident this time around, so I said, I am here to meet the police officer, Jenny, as I had told you earlier. Oh yes, dear, you told me. It is about a dead body. The person's phone was locked, so when I called them, they called me back to identify him. It is just that the person had been calling me on his phone so many times, and I, I hesitated. My cheeks must have turned red because Heidi sat up and sobered up a bit much unlike her usual cheerful nature. Yes, dear, tell me about it. I never really checked my phone. Maybe I lost it, as it has an association with something terrible from my past. Now I just returned home, found the calls. One thing led to the other. And here I am. I said, trying my best to summarize my ordeal. Riza dear, if you need to stay here longer, you know you can always stay at my place, right? Said Heidi, gazing at me. Well, thank you so much for the offer. But I honestly do not want to trouble anyone, especially someone as kind and generous as you, Heidi. No, no, I would not mind a little company myself. After all, how many times do I see a young, smart girl like you coming over to me? It is almost a miracle. Really, you will not bother me at all. Do you know I run an animal shelter? Did I tell you about it? Oh, not really, tell me, I replied. There is nothing more exciting than taking care of animals. When I was in my school, I used to rescue and care for injured birds until they could fly again. My favorite was an enormous owl that we had found who was too old to fly and was almost starving when we found him. And then there was a squirrel, some sparrows, and the list goes on. We have a shelter here where I have a dear friend of mine who helps me out. And turns out, we have been looking for a helper and if you have nothing else to do, maybe join in. My friend is the caretaker for the shelter, but we are both old and retired from active life. Really? This is wonderful, I replied, 
trying hard to contain my excitement, but I was sure my telepathic companion would have figured it out. Yes, we do not pay a lot, but it will be enough to live comfortably and you can take the annex beside my mansion to stay. Okay, I would have taken it but, I said. To be fair, this was the best thing that had happened to me in the last few weeks, and I really needed a break, but I could not do something just because it excited me. My mum would never approve. See, I don't really know if I shall stay here for long. Maybe if I meet the officer tomorrow, we do the formalities and I might be on my way, I said. I sensed disappointment in Heidi's facial expressions. Oh yes, that is what you came here for. Right. If you still change your mind, though, the offer stands. Yes, I will definitely let you know. And Heidi, I said. Yes, dear. She asked me. Thank you so much for this. You know maybe I can try the shelter once though, I said. Sure, that would be great, she said, her eyes lit up. Okay, I will be back after meeting the police officer and will be there at the shelter for the day then, I said. Sure, Riza dear, you are very welcome. My travel alarm clock buzzed by my side as I waded out of my dream world into reality. My eyes still hurt from a lack of sleep. I had always been a deep but sensitive sleeper with a tendency to wake up at the slightest sound. I lay in the plus-sized bed for a few minutes. It was the first time I could observe the wonderful furnishing of the room. The side table was a cream color with a gold-tipped carved and shaped full-length mirror attached to a dressing table. I dragged my feet down to feel the soft, luxuriously carpeted floor gently massaging my tired feet. A lot of things to do today, a lot of challenges. I was planning on starting with meeting Officer Jenny, then going to check out who the dead guy was, perhaps spending the rest of the day at the animal shelter, and hopefully planning for my exit from this place. I rose and pulled apart the plush velvet curtains. The sunlight hit my eyes hard. I moved my head a bit to the side. Outside in the distance, I could see the outline of a mountain range. As I peered down to the right, a footpath and an enormous garage stood shining in the early morning sun. A man was working the lawns, which were interspersed with arrays of flowers. Below, on the other side, I could see the sheer drop off the ledge the mansion was on. Heidi's mansion not only had a very expensive designer's decor inside, but it also had a vast estate and several workers. As I went down, Heidi showed me her car collection in the garage. They were mostly old but well-maintained. Riza dear, do you drive? She asked me. I have a license but don't have a car nowadays, I said. If you are interested, you know you can drive any of these, she said. I know, but really, I am not sure where to go around here anyway, I said, chuckling. Oh right, well, if you were here with me at the shelter, you would learn all the roads around here pretty soon. I was still undecided as I was unsure of living here and working in the shelter and seeing the challenges I was about to face today. I tried hard to not show my feelings. George here will take you to town then and bring you back too, said Heidi, looking at the old man. You have met him once, right? Oh yes, he picked you up from the bus station, I said. George opened the car door for me. I was not used to such gentlemanly behavior, but then it did not seem bad at all to be treated this way. I could get used to this life. Nah. On second thought, if I was living around here, I would definitely get a bike and ride it around everywhere. Hi, I am Riza Strong. We spoke on the phone, I said. Oh, hello there, Riza. Please have a seat, Jenny said, smiling as she raised her gaze from the computer screen placed in front of her. I sat down wondering how did the police work around here. I mean, what would she do on a regular day? Thank you. So, you wanted me to come all the way here? I hope we can get this done quick. Jenny smiled, but I could see something was going on in her mind. I would not say this is going to be quick. I am sorry to have called you, 
but as we had discussed it on the phone, we need to do the formalities right, she said. Oh, okay, I said, impatiently adjusting myself in the chair. I was missing Misty, whom I had left with Heidi. The John Doe, whose phone you called, said Jenny. Actually, I just responded to his missed calls, I said. The owner of the phone you responded to, well, there are a lot of things troubling us. The first one is, of course, his identity. No one seems to have reported anyone missing, so you can see the dilemma I am facing right now, she said. I felt a strange coldness creeping in my sneakers, as I did not want to be around here any longer than needed. I am here to help you identify him if, of course, I know who he was. See, you are the only person who was in contact with this dead guy. And we need to find out now how are you connected to him. And if you can help us, that would be wonderful, she said. Well, wouldn't that be a pretty open and shut case? I mean, you must deal with bodies of this sort every week or something, right? The look Jenny gave me next was not very reassuring. Not really. We only rarely get any dead bodies. Sometimes there are falls from the rocks and then sometimes there are animal attacks, but that is about it. I sank back into the sofa, contemplating what this might mean. As much as I wanted out, I also needed to find out who John Doe was and why was he trying to contact me. Of course, I will definitely get all details from you when the time comes, but for now, how about we see the body? Shall we? Sure, that is what I am here for. Let us get this over with, then. The coroner's office was not that far from the station. We rode in the police cruiser. I had asked George to wait, but he told me he had some chores to do in the town so would then wait for my call. The coroner was a short, bald man, with a mustache, which reminded me of that short character in that game. Hi, Mr. Nicholas. I hope we did not come at a bad time said Jenny, a wry chuckle in her voice. Oh no, not at all. The people that I deal with have nothing else to do, he said, giving out a good laugh. He turned around to face me, his beady little eyes staring. So, is this the young lady who called the dead guy? Jenny nodded, uttering nothing. Then she said, so, how about we show her the body and hope she knows something? Nicholas gave a nod in affirmation and pointed us to a white door. The little guy was really sprightly on his feet for his looks. He fumbled in his white overcoat for a moment as my pulse beat faster. Nicholas tried one key. The lock did not open. We waited patiently. He took the second key out, waved it at us, and said, Aha, this one should do it. The door opened, and a stinging chemical smell hit my nose. Nicholas was smiling at me, and I noticed something in his hand. It looked like a bottle of Vicks. I don't use it but I really do not want our guest to, you know, spill her breakfast in my workspace. I was about to complain, but then sanity got me. I quickly scooped the item with my finger and stuffed a cotton ball into my nostrils. The smell dampened the effect. Once in, he opened a locker. No, not this one he said as he pushed the body back in. After taking a couple more bodies out, he finally stopped. Aha, hello, mister. Doe, here is your mysterious friend from far away. My jaw dropped as I saw the face. I knew who he was. It was hard to see Enrique like that. Yes, I know him, I said. Nicholas said, inspect, miss. No, please put him back. I will tell you who he is. Nicholas turned to Jenny as if asking her if he should do as I had asked. Jenny peeked at me and, seeing what was going on with me, quickly said, yes, that is okay. For now. It was only moments later that I felt myself sliding to the floor. When I woke up, I was in the coroner's office. Jenny was looking at me in an amused manner. Risa, please take this juice. You really had us shocked. Why? 
What did I do? I fumbled with the straw and sucked. The cold apple flavor's sweetness went inside as I composed myself and realized where I was. You don't remember? No, really, I just recall watching. Calm down, you passed out on us, said Jenny, her face showing apprehension. Oh, I am sorry, but it is just that I really cannot stand dead bodies. Jenny took me to the station. My legs were shaking with each step I took. I was trying hard to focus. My world seemed upside down. I was not used to seeing dead people. The last person I saw dead was my dad. And I had lost consciousness that time as well. I had been avoiding seeing any dead bodies. So, seeing him like that was a completely unnerving experience for me. Well, so we have been waiting for you to regain consciousness. Looks like you knew him, asked Jenny. Yes, I knew him, I replied, chewing on my lips from the right. And? Asked Jenny, her voice exhibiting her impatience. Well, he is, I said, pausing, was. Enrique Cruz. Jenny took out a notebook and opened it. She then removed a pen out from her pocket. I stared as she pulled the pen cap open and asked me, So, who was this guy? I met him a few years back in the blizzard. Keep going, said Jenny, scribbling notes as I spoke. We were both stuck in a shelter, and he was very kind. A father figure, if I may say. Jenny looked at me with a surprised look. Okay, so you have been in contact since? Off and on, yes. See, when he came to the shelter, he brought along the little bird that he had found outside. And he cared for it when he was there till the bird was well. After the blizzard was over, it flew away. I am confused. Let us cut the bird story out and focus on how much you knew him. That is what I am telling you. I helped him care for the bird. And we had a common interest in caring for animals, I said. He would call me sometimes, maybe once a year, and would just talk about all the animals he had saved. And that is about it. Wait. Are you saying this Enrique Cruz only knew you casually? You can say that. I mean, I never met him afterward or seen him until today, I said. A faint sob escaped me despite my best attempts at concealing my feelings. He was a great and caring person, and I really respected him like an elder brother. I do not know about that, but what we have found out about him contradicts what you are telling me. What do you mean? I am not following you, I said. He seemed to have been on drugs. There were several needle marks on his arms, said Jenny. That makes little sense. At the shelter, Enrique was the one who cared for everyone. There was this other kid there who was addicted to drugs. And Enrique would give him some time and advice every day. And eventually, the boy agreed to be treated for drug abuse and went clean. I am sorry. I can only tell you what we have discovered. I am confused. How can it be? I said. This is not the Enrique I have known. And what about his cause of death? Well, about his cause of death, we know it was a drug overdose. The coroner has since confirmed that he hit himself on the head before that, though. Perhaps he fell down after taking drugs, said Jenny. So, Riza, tell me why I was calling you repeatedly. I really do not know. In the past, he would just email or maybe a text and on the rare occasion, he would call me. But it was always about some animal or if he had given guidance to someone. The man was passionate about animals and helping people. We have a bit of an issue in terms of how to unlock his phone. It is one of those smartphones and here we don't have any facilities to crack it open. Would you know anything that would help us unlock it? Said Jenny, shifting her weight on the other leg. I cannot think of anything just now. But if I can, I can let you know. Well, you are the only one who was linked with him. So if you can think of anything, anything at all, let us know. I will. Since you are the only person connected, I guess I wouldn't mind giving you the phone and his other belongings. Would you like that? 
Jenny looked at me with a face partially curious and partially anxious. Erm. Um, I am not sure. But shouldn't you keep the phone with you? I mean, it is a murder investigation, right? Well, Riza, I never used the word murder. He hit himself on the head, but the cause of death is a drug overdose. So, we cannot just call it a murder, if we do not have any solid reason to suspect it is anything other than a drug overdose. Are you saying you will just let the case go? Just like that? I said, my voice raised considerably. Risa, you have been very cooperative and for that we thank you. But this is a police case now. We have done what we could. If you want to locate the person's relatives or something, it is up to you. I am giving you his things so you might find out about his family and help them find closure. We will, of course, keep working on it our way too. Whatever we can, we will do. The police here were clearly unhappy with doing a murder investigation. Maybe incapable or just uninterested. I wondered. But he was a real person. A very gentle person. I have met him. And he would do no such thing. Drugs? Never. People change, Risa. Things happen. We see a lot of that in the real world, said Jenny, completely unmotivated by my requests to reconsider. If I can find something, then would you be able to open up this case? Please? I just want to clear his name. In death, I want to find out who killed him. I am sorry. This is not a job for civilians. Especially not for an out-of-towner. It is not your job. You have been helpful. You can find out about his family, and that is about it. I really do not appreciate you disrupting police procedures, said Jenny. And how many days did you say you are going to be around Mulberry? I. I said nothing about leaving just yet, I said, lowering my tone a bit. Think, Riza, think. You cannot just leave Enrique here. I am going to stay a few days. I have nothing to do currently, so I might hang out here. I have a job offer at the animal shelter, so I don't mind staying here a few days. Well, as long as you don't cross paths with the law enforcement here, that is not a problem, said Jenny. Thank you, officer, I said, getting up from the seat. Jenny pushed the box with Enrique's belongings towards me. I lifted it and felt like the weight of a mountain was upon me. As I rose to leave, I recalled something and turned back. Officer Jenny? Jenny was still taking notes, but lifted her eyes a bit to look at me. Yes, is there anything I can do for you? Ma'am, about the incident I faced yesterday? Jenny put the pen down and sat upright. She looked at me with her gleaming blue eyes. She said, yes, have a seat. Heidi told me about it, but I forgot to ask you for the details. So, yes, please tell me. I narrated the incident in as much detail as I could recall. Jenny's face was perplexed as she listened to me and entered the information into her computer. Let me make a formal report for you. She pulled open the desk drawer and picked up some sheets. She jotted down the details as I sat there waiting for her questions. She started entering the data on the computer and I thanked her and left the station. George was waiting for me in the parking area. As the car purred along smoothly, I kept thinking about everything. While I looked perfectly normal on the outside, my insides felt like mush. My heart was heavy as I tried to grasp the situation. Enrique had been trying my number. The signals around Mulberry and its mountains were so weak that he might have used a calling card. And I had not been there for him. I had lost this phone in my cupboard in a hurry. This phone brought back terrible memories. I had not picked the last call from my father since I was in school. And now I had let Enrique down too. Chapter 5 An eerie silence marked the drive back to the mansion. The wind blew outside as I looked at the trees getting ready for a New England fall. There was bright orange in some and a tinge of red in others. The cold buzzing wind coming through the partially closed glass window brought in smells. 
I looked outside, trying to focus, but failed. Tear droplets formed, wetting my eyelids as I snuffled my nose. The mansion crept in as the luxurious car came to a gentle stop. George parked the car in front of the mansion. I sat there for a moment. My brain still could not process what had just happened. Enrique, a person who I could only remember as a dear, humble, fatherly figure, always caring for the poor and the animals, how could he have become an addict? This made little sense. What was he doing in this ghost town of a place? Did he call me when he was here? And why did he call me so many times? He never called me like that. What did he want to tell me? And the most dreaded question of all, I trembled as I felt the weight, would he have been alive if I had picked the call up? If I had only looked for the phone before I had left for the internship. The ghosts of the past haunted me. I sat there in the car, looking outside. I couldn't think of what poor Enrique must have gone through. Wondering if I was perhaps responsible for this was terrible. George waited for me, looking back, Miss, would there be anything else for me? Not really. It was a very pleasant ride. I sucked on my tears and avoided eye contact. The old man seemed to understand. That is all right. You are welcome to call me if you need me to take you any place, Mississippi. Thank you so much. I will certainly keep this in mind, I said. I pushed myself closer to the door, feeling my hand press the handle. As the door opened, the fresh smell of the midday breeze hit my nostrils. The grass, the wind, the trees were exuding a sense of being alive. As I set my feet outside, the ground seemed uneasy. I walked towards the mansion doors in a state of denial. I pushed myself upstairs once inside, taking my time holding on to the rails. Heidi did not seem to be around and I needed some time to think things through. My plan had been to return soon, but apparently, that was not possible. I was hoping to get out of this place for good, but then this happened. Now, if I left Mulberry without trying to redeem Enrique, I could never forgive myself. The bed seemed welcoming after this long day. I kicked off my sneakers and jumped on the bed, burying my head in the pillow. Misty jumped into the bed, greeting me. I held her close. I missed you too, Misty, I said, caressing the purring feline. It was a few minutes before I started thinking about the phone. If only I could do something about it. Maybe open it? I could find something about him. Enrique could never have done all the things they had blamed on him. I had to clear his name. To the police, he was just a John Doe. To me, and especially to his family, he was a loving, caring man. His name had to be cleared and there was no one other than me to do it. I got up and opened the box to look inside. There was not much. There was an old Seiko watch inside, but it was not working. The glass was broken and the needles were stuck. I looked. The time was 6.46. I looked inside for the other items. There were his folded clothes. And then there was his iPhone, an older model. I touched the screen. It was off. I paused for a moment, holding it in my hand. My mind was racing, imagining the things it held inside. It was a mystery, and I had to solve it. I pressed the button. Enrique was a simple man. When I met him, he would forget his phone all the time. The shelter had been the best place for a loner like me. I had meant to travel that weekend, but then flights were cancelled and so were the buses. It had gotten so bad that one could not even see a few feet ahead if one tried to venture outside. There really was nothing to do. His phone brought back old memories. I looked at the phone. It seemed to be the same one that he had the time we met. Enrique could never figure out how the tech worked. So, I had taught him how to lock his phone. What if his password was the same? A burst of excitement passed through my veins. I sat up and tried the password that I made up for him. B. L. U. 
E. J. A. Y. It didn't work. I tried again, this time in small letters. B L U E J A Y. Still nothing. I felt blood draining from my hands. I tried one more time. B L U E J A Y. Still nothing. My hands quivered. The phone slipped onto the thick carpet. I bent my neck down and prayed, feeling helpless. Everything seemed like a dead end. I closed my eyes and bent my neck in the meditation posture with Misty sitting close to me on the side. I lifted my legs back onto the bed, pulled my knees up, and crossed them. Holding my legs with my arms, I meditated. My breath slowed down. Things around me faded away. The room dissolved into nothingness. I could hear my heartbeat. The rhythm continued. I focused deeper. My body faded away next. I could feel myself going deeper in the alpha rhythm till all I could hear was the sound of my heart beating and I focused on it, saying the Arabic name of God with each beat. Things slowed down. I emptied myself. Suddenly I saw Enrique's face. He was smiling. Risa, dear, remember what you told me. Enrique, are you all right? Was it, was it just a bad dream? Remember, what did you tell me about secure passwords? That they must have a number and a symbol in them? But what was the one you used? I cannot remember. You know I told you the only number I cannot forget? Said Enrique's vision. Oh yes, I recall, but the symbol? I pleaded with him, feeling he was going away, please tell me who did this to you. The symbol? What a good question. Goodbye, Riza. I know you will avenge me. Enrique's shape dissolved into thin air. No, no, please tell me more, I said. And it was over. Are you all right, dear? Asked Heidi, standing by my side. I raised my head. Heidi, I shall be with you in a couple of minutes, I said, trying hard to stop my sobbing. Okay, dearie, I shall wait for you then, she said. Heidi was kind enough to let me be. I took one more look at the phone. What was it, Enrique? What number and symbol were with the password? I smelled the caffeine-filled cup of coffee from afar as I prepared to transcend down the white spiraling steps of the mansion. Once again, Heidi had figured out my deep dive into an emotional abyss and had countered it with coffee and biscuits. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you so much for this, I said, eyeing the tasty creamy coffee and biscuits as I made myself comfortable on the plush sofa beside Heidi. Yes, don't we all need coffee and biscuits? She said, chuckling heartily. Yes, and pleasant company. Thank you really, I said. I waited for Heidi to ask me about what had happened upstairs, but she did not. She behaved as if she had seen nothing. Then I decided I had enough with secrets. I said, Heidi, that was my friend's body that the police found. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that. Were you too close? He had been a remote father figure for me. Although we never talked about anything other than our common interest, animals, I said, Trying hard to control tears, he would pop in off and on, just call me or text me. He must have been a wonderful man, then. Yes, he was. And I cannot believe what I just saw. And Officer Jenny. Why, what did she say? She asked. I really don't know what to think. He could not have. Tell me, Riza dear. She says he died of a drug overdose. That is impossible. I knew him. He was a champion against drugs. He helped people face addiction and even paid for their therapy from his own pocket. I can understand. This is indeed very disconcerting. And Jenny says people change. But I really don't believe it. 
He was a man of character, I said, realizing that I had gone from hidden tears to full-blown sobbing by now. I suddenly felt the warmth of Heidi's embrace. She had come closer and cuddled me. I felt like I was hiding in my grandma's embrace. So, dear Riza, looks like you are going to be here with me after all, said Heidi, with a chuckle. Certainly looks like it, I said. Heidi had been listening to my rants and calmly responding to me with her soothing voice. Word gets out here so quickly. You know, everyone knows everyone else. Still, there are several surprises here for you to discover, said Heidi, with a wink. Really? What kind of surprises? I said. Heidi had transformed my mood and raised my spirits in just a few minutes. I really need pleasant surprises. They would not be called surprises if they don't hit you smack in the face, would they? Said Heidi. Well, considering what has been going on in my life for the past few days, I am not so sure I will be happy with something smacking me in the face. I said, smiling. It is not an awful place. And while we do not have a large population in Mulberry, we have many visitors and a lot of things to do. Really? I did not know that, I said. You will see, my dear. You will see, said Heidi, so, on a fresh note, tell me a bit about yourself. Since I need to hire you officially, we have certain formalities to fill. Yes, sure. I am Riza Strong. You know that by now. Yes, I do. So, I have recently finished a degree in computer forensics. And I have been keeping pets and saving animals since I was perhaps just three. Three? That is a very young age to start. Yes, my parents have endured a lot, I said, laughing. Well, Riza, what do you do in computer forensics? Heidi said. And what about your work history? So, there it was. The elephant in the room. Heidi had finally asked me the question I dreaded the most. Too bad I did not even know what I was doing with my life. The degree was fun, but I had never planned to do a job in security and all. Our career development folks at the university had told us that there were a lot of jobs in this domain. So, yes, and the FBI had picked me. And I had messed it up. Well, I tried an internship at the FBI and... I can see it did not work. Good for us, though, said Heidi, masterfully changing the conversation, possibly because of a change in my facial coloration. Yes, that was not my proudest attempt. And I was going to look for a job. But then, hey, here came Mulberry, M.A., with all its surprises, I said, winking back at Heidi playfully. The old lady laughed in a friendly manner as she sipped on her cup. Let us then get you acquainted with the mansion. And you need to pass Alice's... ...interview if you have to work for the shelter, Heidi placed the cup down and pushed herself up from the plush velvet sofa. I have to pass Alice's criteria. Say what? Humph. I was certainly more than qualified. Oh, is there a test for joining the shelter as an assistant? Dr. Alice Carroll is just very attached to the animals. So, she can be quite particular about who she allows there. She would rather do everything herself than allow someone who does not satisfy her criteria. I am friends with all the people who work for me. You will get to meet them in time, Riza dear. Oh, okay. If they are many, maybe I need to make a list. Nothing that elaborate, dear. Dear. You will get to know them as you might have to work with them periodically, said Heidi. I shall be happy to meet them all. So, let's go to the shelter, shall we? Said Heidi, getting up and beckoning me to join her. Reluctantly, I pushed myself up. I had to do whatever it took to get the job. Heidi, this town is not that large. Is it? It is rather large Riza Deer, and its population is spread out around the area. Is there a place where I can borrow a bike? 
Oh, that is very good if you like to ride a bike. I think Alice had an old bike, which she keeps maintaining. Let's hope she can lend it to you. I know it is too hard for her to use. Old bones and bad knees, you know. Said Heidi, still chuckling. I had developed a liking for Heidi and her style of making bad things look good. And George will drive you around if you wish to go anywhere, said Heidi. There is no public transport here though, as it is a rather remote location. Such an old-fashioned place. I guess that's why I love it here. Heidi gazed out of the large bay window. I do not see electrical wires. Are you not connected to the grid? Oh, no dear. We are mostly off-grid and use solar panels. I love the area out in the woods and I guess I just want to keep it preserved as much as possible. It is a lovely place, the old ruins, they have a charm of their own. As I came back to my room, I wondered about the weird experience earlier. Seeing Enrique's ghost seemed so real. Maybe I was thinking about Enrique too much. Whatever it was, it had unsettled me. I lay down on the bed, look, looking at the ceiling. Enrique's face was still in my eyes, so I could not sleep. Maybe I could try unlocking the phone one more time. I dragged myself up and adjusted my hair with a clip. It had been a real feat for me to care for my tresses during the past few weeks. The phone looked at me bleakly. Oh, come on. Risa, what good is your forensic degree in computer science if you cannot even crack open one phone? Hmm. I could probably crack it if only I had federal supercomputing facilities such as used by the National Security Agency or the FBI. But even in the FBI, I could never do it ethically. After all, this was a personal thing and I would never use public resources for something personal. This was something my dad had taught me since I was a little kid. How about one more try? I closed my eyes and focused. What were the missing two letters, Enrique? I recalled something. Enrique's birthday was the seventh. I tried another combination. Still nothing. I did one more try. The familiar clicking sound welcomed me as the phone opened up. My heart was beating out of my chest. I began looking at the contacts. There it was as a Catherine Cruz, but the country code was different. I googled the code. It was plus 52, Mexico. I copied the number on my phone and called. A soft voice answered in Spanish, Hola esta es Catherine. Hello, I am calling from the U.S. This is Risa. Risa Strong? Is that you? Yes, you know me? Of course I know you. Enrique would never stop talking about you and the animals. Oh, and I am his little sister, Catherine Cruz. Catherine. I, I said. Risa, how are you doing? And have you heard from Enrique lately? His number has been off. We were all really worried. I took a deep breath. This was going to be a hard task. It took me a few minutes to tell Catherine what had happened. She was sobbing out of control and there was nothing I could do. Risa, this is not our Enrique. He was such a good person. Are you sure it was him? I am so sorry, Catherine. Catherine. I know. And I just don't know what to do, I said. Risa, I know it must be very hard for you. But we don't have a visa to come on over. We shall arrange for the body to be sent over, but can you do something for us? Okay. Tell me, please, I said. I listened to Catherine's request carefully. I did not want to commit to finding out more, but I felt guilty for having been unable to attend his calls, even though it was not in my control. I really could not commit to this. It was not a mystery novel where the sleuth figures things out with no help. It was real life. But Catherine, her helplessness.
I simply could not say no. That was just not me. My family had always taught me to stand for truth and justice irrespective of the odds against me, that was just how we were. Okay, I shall do whatever it takes to find out about him. I promise you, I said, feeling I had taken on one of the most onerous tasks ever. Thank you so much. Risa. We will all pray for your success, said Catherine. Whatever you want from us, from me, tell me. What can I give you? No nothing. I owe it to Enrique, I said. And I shall keep you posted as things move. Take care of yourself. I said a hasty goodbye and fell back on the bed. Oh, Riza, where have you gotten yourself? How will you fulfill this promise with no clues at all? Where would you even start? I did not know what would happen next, but I knew one thing. If I agreed to do whatever it takes to solve the mystery, I was going to do it. I was going to find out who killed Enrique, even if it meant I had to stay in Mulberry for as long as it takes. After a sumptuous dinner with Heidi, I had calmed down a bit. Riza dear, you know it is good that you are staying here, said Heidi. I really appreciate the help, Heidi, I said. Well, I am sure you will find out what happened to Enrique. That was his name, right? Yes, Enrique Cruz. You need to under understand something. Not sure what you mean. Please tell me, I said. You are not alone in this. We have a small club here. We are a bunch of old ladies who meet, knit sweaters, and solve puzzles, Heidi said. Oh, what type of puzzles? Any puzzle at all. We call it the Odd Puzzle Club. Dr. Faith Odd formed this club. She is a genius and has a PhD. An actual NASA rocket scientist. She was going to be an astronaut, but then she lost her legs in an accident during training. Dr. Faith Odd has connections with the FBI as well and can be very resourceful. But she is difficult to convince. Though once you convince her, she is with you all the way. I was watching Heidi with a wide open mouth. A puzzle club? In the middle of nowhere. Must be interesting. And knitting. That sounds like a wonderful thing to do. So, who else is in the club? I asked. Other than yourself and Dr. Odd, I mean. You will meet all of them in time. One member who is around nowadays is Tiffany Malcolm. Dr. Tiffany is our resident bug lady. She has a PhD in entomology. And last, but not the least, we have me. You know a bit about me, right? Only that you are a philanthropist and save animals. And are very intelligent. Yes, well, my father had deep pockets, but he made me work for everything. He wanted me to stand on my own two feet. And I did. I went to college, paid for my education partially by investing my pocket money, and partially by loans. And eventually, I paid them off. He did not give me anything till his death when he left it all to me. I am rather thankful to him for that. I would never have been the person I am now if he had made me feel like having a silver spoon in my mouth when I was growing up. I could never have guessed, I said, twisting my legs in the comfortable sofa. Heidi packed her rain suit. Is it really going, going to rain? I asked. You will get used to Mulberry's weather soon. It's the way it is. We have a saying here, if you get bored with one type of weather, just wait. I have a spare umbrella in the pantry. Would you be so kind to pick it up? Heidi said. I got up quietly, responding to Heidi with a smile. We had been sitting in the ground floor living room area. The plush carpet, the wall decor, was antique but elegant. You had to hand it to the old lady. She had quite a collection of things and they were all well maintained. I got up from the sofa, looking around at the trophies. I spotted what looked like ancient artifacts. 
On the wall hung a set of swords encased in a glass box enclosed in silky red velvet. Then there was a big golden medallion with the yin and yang symbols. I moved past the eastern wall of the living room onto the wooden door. As I opened it, it moved seamlessly without making the slightest sound. The effect was certainly uncanny, considering the size of the door, which seemed at least as tall as two feet above my five feet and nine inches. I treaded the long hallway to the pantry and found the umbrella. Riza, so you were telling me about your father and how he would allow you would keep all those animals, said Heidi. Ah, uh, yes. I might have mentioned it. It was the best time. I spent my childhood around animals, I said. As I had told you about Dr. Alice Carroll, she is a bit of an eccentric, said Heidi. She trained as a zoologist and retired a few years back. She is very passionate about animals. Oh, that sounds wonderful. The drive to the shelter was short. As we got out of the car, I looked at the shelter. The front of the shelter had a metallic gate. As we entered, there was a reception desk on the side. A tall older lady stood near a cage playing with a baby monkey. She had a content smile on her face, her hair was reddish-brown, and she wore a watch on her arm. She looked busy feeding the little animal. Riza dear, meet Alice Carroll, said Heidi, candidly introducing us. Alice, meet Riza Strong. How do you do? I said promptly. Hello, dear, said Alice, barely looking up from the monkey, who she was nursing with a bottle filled with milk. Alice, do you remember you had asked me for an assistant? Said Heidi. Aha, yes, I do, of course, said Alice. Heidi, can you help me get the keys for that cage? Heidi complied and said, yes, sure, here you go, giving away a rusty pair of keys. Alice opened the cage and carefully placed the baby in a makeshift bed inside the cage. You can never be too careful with poachers around here, can you? Yes, you are right, we need to be careful as always, especially with such a diverse variety of wildlife in the Mulberry State Forest area, said Heidi. I looked back to check my backpack for my all-time companion. Misty was looking around at all the animals in utter amusement. Okay, I am done. What were you telling me? Well, Alice, as I was saying, I have found you a great helper. This is Risa Strong. Risa, can you tell Dr. Carroll about yourself? And your experience of caring for animals? Heidi said, her eyes shining. Hi, yes, well, I do not have a formal qualification in handling animals, I said, and then I noticed the disappointed look on Miss Carriol's face. My degree is in computer forensics from Boston University, but I have been caring for animals my entire life. Really? How so? Alice's sharp eyes felt like piercing rays of a laser. She seemed to be x-raying me with her gaze. Well, let me see. I was around three when I first took in a squirrel. H.M. I wonder how anyone could take care of a squirrel, especially at that age? Said Alice. I have scars to prove it, I replied, pulling up the sleeve of my right hand to show long scratches from my not-so-friendly pet. Oh, that was pretty brave of you, but didn't your parents forbid you? Yes, and I hid it, it, till, of course, the squirrel ran off but not before she scratched me badly, I said. Okay, so that does not prove you can care for animals. Well, you are right. That certainly does not. But if you let me explain a bit. Okay, go on, I am listening, said Alice, taking a seat on a wooden bench beside the animal cages. Over the years, I have taken care of so many animals, ranging from a hawk, an owl, and several birds, some of whom had fallen off their nest and would have died otherwise. Goats, stray cats, dogs, rabbits, and even ladybugs, I said. Alice's face lit up. She turned to Heidi and said, I like this girl's spirit. Maybe I can give her a chance. I am telling you, you will like her, said Heidi 
and Riza Deer, as I was telling you, Dr. Alice retired early because she wanted to be in the field and caring for animals rather than do research on them. She still gives guest lectures at some universities, but she, being my dear friend, has graciously helped me set up this animal shelter. It will be my pleasure to work with you, I said, feeling genuinely grateful that she was giving me a chance. So, assuming you are okay with my work, when do I start? I will give you an overview of the shelter, but you need to understand. You need to think of it as a full-time job. We get a lot of animals. Some are suitable as pets, but others, well, they are exotic. For the ones which are not suitable as pets, we try to find habitats around the country or even abroad, said Alice. Sometimes people try to break into the shelter to steal the animals. So, that is also something we are very concerned about. Yes, things got terrible the last couple of weeks when someone broke into the shelter, said Heidi. They did? I was surprised. I would have never thought someone would be so interested in animals. After all, the animals that were here did not look prized at all. Yes, they almost got, got away with the I.I., said Alice. They got away? said I, trying to understand what Alice was trying to say as it sounded like gibberish to me. The I.I. is a rare animal from Madagascar, explained Heidi. Yes, scientists estimate that there are just 500 to 1,000 of these cuties around the globe. These poor darlings, said Alice, exhibiting facial expressions which probably would be the same as if she were talking about her own children. I am not sure I understand. Why are they almost extinct? I asked. I was genuinely interested now. Humans just don't like them. I eyes have an extra finger, which is rather long. And these poor things, which were originally called scolocophagus or worm eaters for their habits, use it to make holes along with their long teeth. They then find grub from inside wooden areas, Alice said. But the natives and some people around here as well, they think that just seeing an eye eye is bad luck, said Alice. Like the black cat superstition? I asked. Much worse. They think you can die if you see an eye eye, especially if it flashes its longer finger at you. So, they believe that the only thing to save the person is to immediately said Alice. I noticed the troubled look on her face and her clouded eyes. As I was saying, they kill these poor things. So there are very few of these magnificent creatures left now. They are the only extant member of the genus Dobintonia and family Dobintonidae. She noted my puzzled looks. Extant means not yet extinct, but going there soon if we don't care for them, she said, explaining. I see. And didn't you just say these were from Madagascar? So, are they not quite far from their place of origin? I asked. Yes, you are right. Strangely, we have found an I.I. here in this area. Considering that they are rare, anyway. Unless someone brought it here, I really, I really don't know how we got one, said Alice, looking down on the ground, as she moved her feet to trace a funny-looking animal with the dirt on the ground. Yes, that is true. Alice had to make special arrangements for the animal, said Heidi. We are glad that I, I made it to the shelter. Last month, we had a run-in of a lot of wild, exotic animals in the area. Several folks have shown me their pictures, but Bob was the only one that we could get into the shelter, said Alice. Alice has given him a name, Bob, chuckled Heidi. Alice, incidentally, I remember you had this bike with you. Do you still have it? Yes, Heidi, my old bones don't let me use it anymore though, said Alice. Do you think you can lend it to Risa so she can get along the town on her own? Asked Heidi. I felt relieved. It was tiring to use the car, and I was looking forward to using the bike. Yes, sure. I don't have any use for it, anyway, said Alice. That would be wonderful, Dr. Carroll, I said. Oh, you can call me Alice, she said. A hint of a faint smile crossed her sunburnt cheeks. 
I felt a wave of relief. My sweaty forehead felt as if a breeze of fresh air had hit. I had found a soft corner in Alice Carryall's heart. I should be rejoicing. But my gut was telling me this was not the end of my troubles in Mulberry. And as much as I hated it, I trusted my gut to never fail me. Chapter 6 I woke up the next morning early. It was still dark when my prayer alarm woke me up. I had a lot to get done today. I got up and stretched my arms before freshening up. The indoor heating felt very nice. I looked outside the windows and distant lights shone through. People were probably in their beds, sound asleep. I opened the window glass a bit to smell the fresh air. A slight wind was blowing outside. Sounds of crickets surrounded the green areas encompassing the mansion. Night lights placed on pillars marked the walkways in the enormous garden. Garden. I took a long breath and closed my eyes. Fall aromas filled my nostrils. There was a dominant earthy smell, filled with a texture of falling leaves, ready to decompose and give way to the next iteration in the cycle of life. I laid down my prayer mat and removed my slippers. I then stood, facing front, and started reciting the sulla, my prayers. Then I sat down on my prayer mat, ready to meditate. My neck bent down, eyes covered. Misty joined me. My heartbeat recited the word of power as I transcended into inner peace. Suddenly, I was misty one more time. I saw myself sitting next to my body. And I saw a ghostly figure standing next to me. I tried to speak. I could only utter a meow. The figure looked at me and smiled. He came closer. I recognized him. It was Enrique. It was surreal. Risa, look inside the trash, he said. What are you saying? Trash where? I asked. And please tell me what happened to you and who did it. Did you actually die from a drug overdose? He patted me on my head and said, check the call history. You will figure it out, kiddo. I called out to him, but he started walking away in a white misty fog and before I knew it, I was back. Back in my body. I opened my eyes. Beads of sweat trickled down my face. I looked around. It was almost sunrise. I got up, pushing against the carpet. There it was, Enrique's phone, lying on the side table. I pressed the button and unlocked it. I checked the call history. What I saw startled me. The phone and the call history were absolutely clean. Not a single call except the ones I had done. Also, there were no contacts other than a few of his family members, probably stored in the SIM card itself. There were no pictures. This was indeed strange. Someone had wiped the phone clean. Either the person knew the password or else Enrique had wiped it clean himself. And if he did it, then it meant he knew his life was in danger. Look at the call history, he had said. So, that means he definitely did not, not die of a self-inflicted drug overdose. It was a murder. Check the trash. What did he mean by that? Which trash? I looked at his belongings. There was nothing there that I would call trash. Wait, what if he meant the phone recycle bin? I unlocked the phone again and then I opened the photo app and inside it was the recently deleted folder. I checked it and there it was. A single picture. I opened the picture. It was Enrique, standing with an animal in a white truck inside a cage. It was a weird-looking animal, and Enrique had taken a selfie with it. I felt the animal looked familiar, but my mind was too cluttered to think clearly. I put the phone down to gather my thoughts. Suddenly, there was a faint buzz. It was my phone ringing. I guess it was our time to go. The drive to Dr. Odd's place reeked of anxiety. We talked very little. Heidi had sensed that I was perturbed because of some reason, so gave me space. We are here, madam, George said respectfully. 
Thank you, George, said Heidi as we got out of the car. Dr. Odd's place was an immense mansion on West Street. The way it was structured, it was completely hidden from the view. We had to pass through a completely covered area. Although it was also perhaps the same size as Heidi's estate, the construction made it appear from a completely different era. While Heidi's place looked as if it was from the 20th century, Dr. Odd's place was modern. Both were quite elegant, though. We were brought into a room with a lot of windows. There was an oval rug on the wooden floor. I looked at the circle of five comfortable chairs around the rug. An old lady with graying short hair and dark, gleaming skin sat on one of them. She looked as if lost in pensive thought. A well-groomed Siamese cat sat in her lap and, and looked at us intelligently. Misty looked at her with curiosity. The lady held a thick book elegantly in one hand. Hello, Heidi, and who do we have here with us today? The lady glanced at me over her reading glasses, giving me a welcoming smile. Hi there, Faith, this is Riza. We talked about her briefly on the phone, said Heidi. Oh yes, Riza, I am so excited to have you here. And you can just call me Faith, the lady replied. Come on, ladies, grab a seat. Hi, Dr. Odd, Verm, Faith, it is a pleasure to get to meet you, I replied. Dr. Odd looked at me, inspecting me. So, dear Riza, I came to know that you might have a puzzle for us old ladies to play along with or perhaps help you with? She turned her gaze to meet Heidi's eyes briefly. Yes, that is so nice of you. I am new around here and you can say I am in a bit of a predicament, I said, shifting uneasily in my otherwise perfect seat. So, let us start from the beginning, shall we? Asked Dr. Odd, wasting no time in getting to the point. And Riza, we don't have any formalities here. So, you can get our help any time. Thank you so much, Faith. It means a lot to me, I said. I received a few missed calls on my phone. When I called back, I ended up coming here to identify the dead owner of the cell phone. Aha, uh -huh, dear, that is an interesting situation, said Faith. Interesting and perplexing at the same time. Tell me more, please. I got her up to speed on Enrique and the police. Enrique seemed like a wonderful person, indeed. So Risa, why do you think he was calling you repeatedly? I am not really sure about that. Every time he had called me in the past, it was to tell me about some animal that he had saved. Now, what do the police say about his death? They think he did an overdose. They say they found multiple needle marks on his body. But that just makes little sense. So, you th think he was murdered? Asked Faith, posing the question I had been dreading to say out loud till now. I sat there quietly for a moment and then nodded to her. I said, I think he was. And I found he or someone else had also wiped his cell phone clean. I see. You might have a point. But the police here, you know they are not good, not good at all. See, we just have two officers here. Once you have met, Jenny. And the other is the sheriff. Even though we are a small town, there are multiple small communities spread over a large area. The police just spend the day patrolling or maybe catching the odd speeding car or finding missing cows. That is about their limit of practical expertise. Yes, that is what I was telling Riza about. If she wants to get anything done, she will have to be involved in it herself, said Heidi, who had been sitting quietly. That is true. And since she is a complete stranger here, she is going to need our help, said Faith. I would be really thankful if you can help me out, I said, feeling an adrenaline rush through my body. So, Riza, let us take this problem as a puzzle. That is the only way to solve it. The first thing to solve any puzzle is to think about it with no emotions. Emotions cloud judgments. Do you agree? She asked. Yes, that makes sense. I am with you on the same page, I said. You also need to realize that you may end up finding things you were not expecting to discover. I can respect that, I said, 
trying to assess if I still wanted to move ahead with the investigation. Okay, so we don't have a clue or anything about the murder. May I ask, did you examine the evidence or the place they found him? Asked Faith. Not yet, I said. Should I go ahead with it today, then? Yes, that would have to be where we start, said Heidi. Okay. And I would like to mention that I found a picture on his phone, I said. What was in the picture? Asked Heidi and Faith almost in unison. At first I could not figure it out. But now that I have thought about it, I think it might be Bob, the I.I. in the animal shelter, I said. Here, look, please. I placed the unlocked phone in Faith's hands. Both Faith and Heidi's eyes were wide open with surprise at this strange coincidence. Jenny had been kind enough to let me know about the place they found the body. It was 8 a.m., and I had been up for a few hours already getting ready for my first sleuthing exercise. I had read about it in mystery novels, but then novels and reality are so different from each other. I wondered if I would need the traditional magnifying glass that all detectives seem to carry. I mounted the borrowed bike and started pedaling. The wind blew against me as I pushed harder. I felt heat from inside my body. It felt good against the cold, which had been creeping in. The early morning ride took me a good thirty minutes before I was near the summit of Mount Mulberry. Jenny had told me they had found him lying close to this place. I laid the bike down on the ground as I seriously doubted anyone would be interested in the rusty old bike, even for scrap. I first took hurried steps till I got to the side trail, which vanished deep into the forest to the left. It was ten minutes before I got to the clearing surrounded by police tape. I stood and observed. If they found the body here, then it means Enrique had come all the way. That made little sense. Suppose if he ever wanted to do drugs, why would he have to walk this far, anyway? There were several suitable places between the town and this place. I then started looking around the area for more clues. If someone had brought Enrique here, they would have left something. But considering that there had been so much rain in the past few days, most evidence would have washed out. Still, it did not hurt to look. I started going around the site in circles, gradually expanding my search radi radius. The fall fragrances were very refreshing. I looked around, feeling the breeze brush past my clothes, my scarf waving and dancing. If it were not for the gloomy situation that I was facing, I would have loved to spin like the dancing dervishes. I came near a patch of mud. Suddenly, I spotted a set of tire marks. I took pictures with my smartphone. Although the rain had washed most things away, this area was muddier, so things had been better preserved. I also found a brown shoestring and a white cloth stuck in a low-hanging tree branch. I bagged the items carefully using pincers in zippered plastic bags. After spending another hour around the site, I finally started my bike ride back. So, was the trip helpful at all? Asked Heidi. Yes and no, I said. I mean, I found some things. I found tire marks and a shoelace. Heidi chuckled and said, Well, Riza, don't be disappointed. We always must start from somewhere. Right? True that, I replied. I think I should next interview the person who found the body. That is a brilliant idea, said Heidi. Jenny was telling me about the guy, I said, opening my journal up as I turned the pages. She was saying it was a farm boy. Oh, is it those farms north of the forest? Asked Heidi. I am not really sure, but we'll check today. That sounds wonderful. Keep me posted, Deary and Risa said Heidi. Yes, Heidi, I said, looking at my mentor. Remember, if you need any help or anyone gives you any trouble, remember we are all with you. Thanks, Heidi but I know how to handle myself. You surely do, dearie. The farm boy was rather short and stocky in comparison with most of the townspeople. He was busy working on a machine that looked somewhat similar to a tractor. Excuse me, sir, I said. 
The man kept tinkering inside the front side of the massive machine. I raised my voice and asked again, Sir, can I talk with you briefly? The man drifted his head out, his greasy face and hands holding on to the massive machine's front side as if he had just come out of the mouth of a giant alligator. Yes, miss? He said, eyeing my headscarf with a visibly uncomfortable gaze. What do you want? I was wondering if I could talk with you for a few minutes. Okay. Let me come down, he said. He jumped off the machine and was on the ground in a minute. Yes, talk. I wanted to ask you about the body, I said. Oh, that is why you are here. Are you a reporter too? Everyone wants to ask me about it, he said. But I ain't got no time for talking, miss. I sensed he was about to ignore me, so before he could jump back to his farm tasks, I stepped in front of him quickly. The man who died here, he was my friend. So, I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about what you discovered. Can you please help me? The man's face changed. Please seemed to have been the magic word. Well, I was coming to work that day. I come to the farm early. There are a lot of things to do here. And I saw this guy sitting next to a tree. I called him out. He didn't respond. And when I tried to move him, that is when I realized he was dead. So, may I ask what time would that be? That would say something like 5.45 a.m. or so, miss. Did he seem to have been dead for long? Miss, I would say that. He was completely blue. He was lucky the wolves did not get him. Although not that lucky because he died, anyway. Yes, he was a good man. A good man? I don't know about that. I have seen him once before, too, and I don't forget faces. Where did you see him before? Can you tell me, please? I said, trying hard to avoid the conversation regarding the drug-related facts concerning Enrique's death. I have seen him drive a white truck. And he was at the trucker's den, you know, just at the start of Mulberry. Have you seen it? We go past that place so often to get soda and fries after work, on weekends only. My sister and I. I pick her up after work. She works in the town mall. So, that was, say, around two weeks back. There was this other truck driver there. He was mad at this guy. They had a fight. He said this guy had stolen his job from him. Oh, that is really helpful. Can I ask you, this dead guy, did he look like a drug addict back then? Nah. He looked fine to me, he said. Although druggies, you know, they don't look like addicts most times. Especially the ones who use intravenous drugs. Would you be able to help me find that other trucker? Miss, we are small town folks here. We don't want no trouble. I know, but perhaps if you can help me, I can help you too. I opened the zipper of my bag and showed him a $20 note. Okay, I guess it does not harm me. But please don't tell anyone that I told you this, he said, slipping the note inside his shirt. As he gave me the name of the person, my eyes opened wide. The man was Sheriff Kevin Jackson's brother Quinton Jackson. My bike came to a halt right next to the pavement. A sudden jerk passed through its old shocks, which made a screeching sound as I applied the brakes a bit too hard. I was apparently taking the slow route, getting used to the bike and the town. A smile welled up inside me as I nuzzled the bike to the ground. Its stand was broken, and the bike would only stand if there were something to support it. The bike fell with an unexpectedly high-sounding dull thud. I twisted my head around to see if anyone had heard it. I pulled the bike back up and, as a goodwill gesture for my old companion, tried to use the limping stand. The bike again attempted to stand briefly in the air. Then it went down again. A second thud. I felt my cheeks blushing. The station looked quiet and desolate. On one side, there was a desk with the title Jenny. Behind Jenny's desk was another room with bright sunlight shining through the windows. I squinted my re-
recently uncovered eyes. Hi, Riza, Jenny said, quickly as she moved in from the other room to the one on the other side, a room that seemed like a filing room. Jenny placed a coffee mug on the desk. The inscription read World's Most Annoying Mom. She kicked the chair back and sat with a thump. Why don't you have a seat? Hi, Jenny, thanks for that. And I hope I am not disturbing you, I said, looking around as my eyes finally adjusted to the fluorescent lights. Oh, just the world's most important tasks, said Jenny, lifting her mug in the air. Wisps of steam fumes from the cup painted an animated abstract in the air. I made out a chuckle at the hardened lines on Jenny's face. My mom used to say, the facial lines never lie. A person can smile as much as they want, but the lines don't lie. Jenny's lines were telling a story of her life. Aha, you are a mum, Jenny? I asked her, squinting to feign my inability to read the text on the mug, I think it must be a tough job, maybe harder than holding the station, so to speak, I said. Yes and no. My kids are the sweetest. But yeah, very creative and bossy, said Jenny, taking a sip from the cup, so, tell me what brings you here? Jenny diverted the topic from her parenthood to me rather abruptly. I wanted to discuss with you some things that I found at the scene of the crime, I said. Nope, I think you mean the place where the body was discovered. Officially, till now, I cannot see any evidence to show how this would be anything other than a simple case of a drug overdose. I felt a wave of emotion well up in my tummy as my abs countered by crunching inadvertently. How can these people ignore the evidence? What would it take for her to consider this investigation seriously? Inhaling a long breath of the cold cinnamon-flavored air, I put on my strongest face. Well, I found some things there. And I was hoping you can look. Look. I opened the zipper of my cream leather handbag and pulled out my evidence zip bag placing it firmly on her desk. What do we have here? Riza, a piece of cloth, a shoelace, said Jenny, her face assuming an I-don't-care look as she eyed me. Well, are you not even going to look? I insisted. Lazily and reluctantly, Jenny looked at the packet. All right, I have it with me now. Is there anything else you would like me to do? Jenny's impatient face was showing wariness. Just as I was about to say something, I heard a thud behind me. I followed Jenny's surprised eyes back to the door. A well-dressed woman in a red shirt and jeans was standing next to the door. Hello, I am assuming this is the police department, she said. Yes, it is. What can I do for you? Said Jenny, leaning forward on the green leather-covered front desk. I am, how do I introduce myself? Well, I am Enrique Cruz's wife. Ex-wife. Enrique's ex? Enrique never mentioned her. As I sat there listening to her talking with Jenny, she claimed the state police contacted her recently. Her face was covered in foundation, and her lips were well lined with red lipstick, her brunette hair neatly cut to shoulder length, high shoes to complement her look. Clearly, she had taken time to dress up. Looked like the lady was coming to celebrate rather than mourn. I am Riza Strong, I said, hoping to break the ice. Enrique's entire family knew about me. I thought that if this lady were his ex for real, or even if she had been in touch with him, she would certainly know about me. A blank gaze welcomed me. I am Pedra Gill, she said, moving her hand towards me, followed by a confused look. Pleased to meet you. I guess. I shifted in my chair as my legs felt the weight of a thousand trees. Who was this lady in reality? Why had Enrique never mentioned her? And how come she was here now? So Enrique, Enrique never mentioned me? I asked. As much as I tried it, my facial expressions probably gave away all my thoughts. I am sorry. Are you somehow related to Enrique? She asked, raising an inquisitive left eyebrow. It is a long story, I was about to continue, but Jenny preempted me. So, Miss Gill, would you mind holding on for a minute? Riza dear, can we save this discussion for later? 
I have other business to attend to and really need to speak with Miss Gill. My face dropped. Was it just me, or was it because I was an outsider? Was it my outlook, or did Jenny treat everyone in the same manner? I smiled nervously and said, I shall be in contact with you on the phone. I have some important information and we'll discuss it then. As I got up and pushed the chair back, the wooden feet made an annoying noise, but Jenny ignored it. I decided. I would find out more about him myself. I exited the station sullenly. One thing was sure. There was more to Enrique's murder than was apparent. First, the trucker and then his ex, showing up all dressed up, as if to celebrate. After asking around the town, I finally figured out the way to the trucker's den. It was almost noon when I reached the place. Although I was a regular runner, my legs were just not accustomed anymore to this biking. I felt muscle cramps in my lower shins as I passed by the entrance of the den. There were a couple of trucks parked outside in the open area. The sunlight lit in between the leaves of the tall trees. I parked the bike on the side and looked at the den. The road sign was an old piece of wood, painted white. The letter E in den had almost faded, though. I walked towards the door, and the sand on the ground in front felt gentle as I pressed on with my sneakers. This was unlike most of Mulberry, where I would feel the hard concrete or else just regular soil. There was a smell of fresh food cooking in the air, with a tinge of barbecue. I thought the cramp in my leg had settled in by now. I moved forward, but suddenly, a muscle in my right leg, leg twitched. A wave of pain passed through my body. I stopped, trying to slow the onslaught of the pain. A man was sweeping the front deck of the trucker's den glancing at me periodically. He noticed my facial expressions. The pain was excruciating, but this was me, Riza Strong. I stood for a moment and took a long breath in, deciding not to show weakness to anyone. My plan worked as I sucked it up and acted as if I had one of my laces open. Sitting down, I pulled open one of my shoelaces and tied it back again. I got up and smiled formally and said, Good day, sir. I was wondering if you can tell me if Mr. Quinton Jackson would be here? I slowly put pressure on my leg to help me stand. My leg gradually felt better. Yes, the sheriff's little brother? You looking for him? Asked the man, standing holding the broom amidst a small dust cloud. Yes, that would be the one, sir, I said, still fighting the urge to sit down and nurse my leg. He is not here right now. However, I can give you his number if it works. Sometimes he is in the mountain or the forest and there are no signals. I would appreciate that, I said, watching the bearded man take out a piece of paper from his pocket and a pen. He turned to a stool near the open deck and placed the paper there. He then brought out a yellowing contact book type diary from his pocket and scribbled the number for me. Chapter 7 I was waiting at the shelter for Alice. Normally, she would be here early. But I don't know what was up today. I had given food to all the animals, cleaned up the cages, and even talked with the inhabitants, the animals, of course. Some of them had an attitude. Others were so sweet and would come over when I talked with them. Bob, the I.I., not so much. Although I felt he had a sweeter side somewhere deep within. I was sure all of them did. After all, they were not human. Alice came aboard her Buick 69 on her own time. Time. Hello, Riza, she said, as she got out of the car. In the last couple of days, I think I had finally found some room for myself in that icy heart of hers. It was mainly because she had seen me working nicely with the animals. And the way I was gentle with them and all. Hi Alice, how are you doing today? I said, shifting my weight on the other leg, one arm carrying some of the cleaning stuff. I must have looked weird with the yellow rubber gloves, my cream-colored hijab, and all. But showing off was never my interest or skill. 
I was more of a tough gal, at least that is how I considered myself to be. I had learned how to defend myself by the time I was six. And had learned to make my tea when I was nine. I am doing fine. I can see our guests are all cleaned up, right? Said Alice, a look of apprehension still visible on her face. Even after so many days, she was still worried that I would somehow ignore some animals. Yes, all guests are ready for inspection, I said, smiling back at her, ignoring her apprehensive looks. Her face softened as she took a careful look at how clean the shelter was. Thank you, Riza. I have to admit, my old bones could never work this much. You are really a godsend. It is my pleasure to be here, I said. I was wondering if I can get a quick break today, as I need to go somewhere important. I put on my sweet look, as I wanted to get some time off. It was not personal, though. I wanted to keep following the breadcrumbs leading to the killer. Oh, that is perfectly fine. You know the schedule around here. If you keep the animals well fed and cared for, I am fine. You can leave the desk to me any time, Alice said, facing me with a smile. Thank you so much. I shall go by midday then, I said and added. And be back in a jiffy. My ride to the trucker's den was considerably more pleasant this time than my previous one. Maybe it was the time of the day, or maybe I had just grown my biking muscles in the last couple of days. Whatever it was, I was happy to have no more leg cramps. As I pedaled my bicycle up to the entrance, I noticed there were a lot of trucks around. My last visit had been at an inopportune time, apparently. It was good because I hoped to find the trucker I was looking for. I got off the bike and opened the recently fixed stand. I was proud of fixing it, as I was used to doing such things in my home as well. When I was small, my mum would always do a clapping dance whenever I did something on my own. She was not around here, though. The door opened with a creaking sound. I went inside as the familiar food smells greeted me. The place inside was warm and the old person I had met last time was working the counter today. He looked at me, his eyes momentarily showing a look of recognition before he got lost in his work again. Hi there. How are we doing today? He asked me, looking up. What can I get you? I looked to my right. Almost all tables were filled with men chatting about things that men probably talk about. A few heads were looking my way. I could see a couple of lady truckers also seated there. One of the older ladies looked at me and smiled softly, as if to make me comfortable. I smiled back. Then I turned back to face the counter. Can you please tell me the menu? The old man pushed a big war-torn plastic-coated menu card towards me. I decide to go with something safe. Can I have the mac and cheese, please? I said. The man said, have a seat. I will serve at your table. Oh, and incidentally, would you know where I could find Quentin Jackson here? Yeah, he is sitting beside the corner on that table over there, he said, pointing his wrinkled finger across the room. The man sitting there looked formidable, almost like a real-life G.I. Joe. He sat upright with legs sprawled wide under the table like an alpha claiming territory at some important meeting. He was alone. I moved towards him, placed my hands on the empty chair, and said, Hi there. Would you mind if I join you? Hmm, said the man, looking up nodding. Nah, make yourself happy. I looked at him, thinking of how to start the conversation. He avoided eye contact. The old man came up to me and said, Here you go, miss. Your fish and chips. Thanks so much, I said, not bothering to point out it was not what I had ordered. We kept eating our food in our own personal bubbles. The man ate clumsily, making noise as if to assert himself even while he was eating, while I kept eating the way I usually do. My meal was about to end and I still had not asked him anything. Nice weather here, I said, trying to break the ice. H.M. Yes, it is the way Mulberry is, he said sullenly. 
May I ask you something, sir? I said. Like what? His eyes suddenly darkened. I am new around here and I don't know, but you look so familiar. Have I seen you somewhere? I asked. His facial expressions relaxed a bit. Oh, I get that a lot, he said, opening up a bag of potato crisps as he talked. So what is a kid like you doing around here? Sir, I am 23, certainly not a kid, I said, feeling belittled. Well, you look like the teens. And look around you. Do you see anyone even lower than the mid-forties? Most people here are in their fifties. You are not from around here. If you were, you would know people your age don't hang out here, he said. I smiled and said, it is my headscarf hijab, right? Did that give me away? I tried hard to minimize my nervousness in this strange place and gently blew in a full breath. I remembered my doctor back when I was in the sixth grade. She had told me, and I used to do it whenever I was about to have a panic attack. You don't have to worry. My brother is the sheriff in this town, he said, but you probably know that, don't you? Was my cover blown? Or was he just playing with me? One thing was sure, the guy was certainly smarter than he looked. I did not reply. You know, this is a small town. Word gets around. I heard someone was looking for me. And here we are, he said, not even batting an eye as he kept eating. So, what do you want from me, little lady? I am glad you have heard of me. I shall be honest with you. Yes, I have been looking for you. You know why? I paused. Heard you fought with Enrique, and now he is dead. Is he, really? Everyone gets whatever they deserve, don't they? He said. If he was surprised, his poker face certainly did not show. Look, sir, I want to know, I said, pausing briefly to catch my breath and think the words through. Yeah, you want to know if I had anything to do with killing him? So you are what? A detective or something? And you are considering me a suspect? In what capacity, miss? His face contorted into a ferocious look. His nostrils were swollen. An angry vein rose between his eyebrows. Well, why did you fight with him? Please tell me. I asked, ignoring his comments. Look, little lady, I have nothing to prove to you. As per police work, I am not even a suspect. And this is not a murder, anyway. But considering that you seem to be related to that cheating guy, I shall be decent enough to tell you, he said, that guy, you consider so highly of, he was a cheater, he used to hang around here and so here we are, one day discussing a highly paid job ad. It's about animal transport or something. And Enrique, he says nothing and vanishes. A day goes by. I think about calling but get late. And next thing you know, no, when I call that number up, guess what, Enrique has already joined there. So, you fought with him? And then? I said. My face felt like being put on fire. My eyes went moist, thinking about him and Enrique. Poor Enrique. He must have taken that job just for his love of animals. Yeah, we roughed it out. So what? He said. Many people here do that. That means nothing at all. Looks like you have never been in a fight, an actual fight. Seen too many movies, have you, kiddo? I kept silent. I had been in a little too many fights of my own, but I had no intention to boast or share. In my book, when we fight, every fight is our own to keep. Win or lose, we don't share. A fight is a fight. You know we can argue about the theory of fights all day long, but how about we focus on what did you do after the fight? I said. I did nothing. This guy? Was he related to you? He asked. Let us say I respected him a lot, I said. Well, I hate to break your bubble, but if he was such a good person, tell me why was he hanging out with all those druggy folks? Huh, tell me? He asked. His face was getting redder by the moment, 
as if it was going to burst any minute now. I wanted to answer him, defend the honor of my dear friend, my mentor, but that was not my role here. I had to do what I had come here to do, and I had no intention of divulging any information to this guy. And how did you know he was murdered? You did not even bat an eye when I talked about it? Tell me, I asked. Word travels fast in this town. I told you. We have just a few hundred folks who are living here. Rest are just outsiders, like yourself. Do you think we will not know what happens to someone around here? He said. In some ways, he was right. But then who knows he could be lying. There was no way to confirm. For now, at least, he was going to be at the top of my suspect list. The second was, of course, Enrique's ex. I didn't know what that woman was up to, but really, I, I assumed she was up to no good. I took a deep breath slowly as I looked him in the eye. Thank you for answering my questions. I'll be in contact with you if I have anything else, I said. Like I am waiting for you or something, said the man and started laughing loudly. I did not look around, but was pretty sure that everyone was looking at me by now. I moved towards the counter and paid my check, adding a few dollars for the tip. Thank you for the food. It was wonderful, I said. I love the place and maybe I'll keep visiting. The old man smiled, anytime, Missy. You are very welcome here. Tell me what kind of food you like next time, and maybe we can add something exotic to the menu, just for you. I could see he was visibly happy. Seemed like I must have somehow gotten on his good side. Before I go, I was just wondering if I could ask you something about a man, Enrique, I said, turning back as an afterthought. Yes, Missy, shoot, he said, smiling with his well-aged mouth and missing teeth. Who? The person who died recently? Yes, about him, I said. Chapter 8 The sound of my phone's ringtone interrupted my sleep. I opened my eyes. The night outside was still young. I looked at the phone and seemed like it may have been just two hours since I went to bed. I struggled to open my eyes. Blurry eyes made it hard to read the caller's name. The phone kept ringing. I tried unsuccessfully a couple of times to attend the call in my half-asleep state before I was finally able to attend. Hello, this is Riza, I said, still trying to figure out who it was that wanted to talk with me in the wee hours of the night. This is me, Alice, said the voice. I hope I did not disturb you. Oh no, that is all right, I said, pushing myself up. Tell me, are you okay? There has been a robbery. Bob, he is gone, Alice said, her voice frantic. What do you mean, gone? I said. My eyes were now wide open. Is he all right? Someone came, came and took him and some of the other animals too, she said, sobbing. Say what? I said, as an uneasy feeling welled up in my stomach. Who could this be? Why wouldn't I, I be so important to someone? Are you sure, Alice? I said. Yes, I am sure. I was strolling around my house in the night. Couldn't sleep. You know it is right at the back of the shelter and suddenly I heard animals crying. They never do that. Unless she said, crying. Unless there was a predator or some other danger at hand. Over the last few days, I had learned one sure thing about Alice. She could be wrong about a lot of things, but there was one thing she was never wrong about animals. She was so good, she could almost be a pet psychic. Everything was happening at a sped-up pace. The handyman came early to do the installation of the closed-circuit camera system. Who would have thought an animal shelter would need a closed-circuit system to monitor? I started my day by updating the animal ledger. As I walked past the scene of the crime, I could see someone had cut the lock clumsily. Whoever it was, the person sure seemed to have been in a real hurry. I wondered what was it that had caused the thief to hurry like that. The cage was empty. 
nothing but the regularly cringeworthy smell of the eye I came from inside. Outside, I could see a faint set of marks. I took out my phone and zoomed in on them. There were some shoe marks, but I really could not figure out much from them for now. I took a couple of photos, making sure not to disturb the evidence. Jenny came late. Her face had a weird, unpleasant look. She went over the robbery incidents briefly and before I knew it, she was gone. Gone. I went back to my place at the counter tending daily tasks at the shelter. Suddenly, a man's voice alerted me. Excuse me, miss? Yes, sir. How may I help you? Are you new at the shelter? He asked. Well, yes, I am. Are you a regular here, sir? I said. The man was tall and burly, probably in his mid-fifties, if I were to estimate. He was dressed elegantly in a lounge suit. He had a bald head and spoke with an accent. An aura of expensive fragrance emanated from him, but nothing he wore could remove the unmistakable feeling of evil from him. I felt it. Misty, who was perched on the counter lazing around, suddenly jumped up as if she was startled too. He glared at her. A wild one you have here. Well, I have some animals with me and was hoping we could do an exchange. He said. From the side, his face looked even more evil. I am afraid this is not how it works, sir. We just take in animals which need to be taken in, I said and then when they are well enough we release them to their habitat. In case they are not wild animals, we allow suitable people to adopt and care for them as pets. The man's face contorted, exhibiting rising impatience. I don't think you know who I am. Do you? He said. Well, sir, I am new here, so yes, you are right. If you would be kind enough to introduce yourself, then perhaps I shall respond appropriately, I said. The man ignored my query and said, I am looking for a lemur. Sir, sometimes we might have a lemur too. But these are wild animals, and we just transport them to an appropriate habitat as soon as possible, I said. I am not sure I can find and give you one legally though, even if we had one here though. Can I see one that you have now? He said, clearly not letting this go. Sir, we have shelter tours, but I just work here. You would have to talk with Dr. Alice Carroll about that. Nah. That is fine. I will see myself out, the man said, looking at me for a moment. He pushed his cell phone back into his pocket. It was then that I glimpsed what looked to me like a gun holster, which stood out against his red and white checkered shirt. Sir, May I ask what about the animals you were saying you wanted us to have? Well, you don't have what I need, so let us leave it at that. Sir, if you want me to contact you, perhaps you can give me a number, I said. I mean, if I end up with a lemur or something. I pushed a notepad towards him along with a ballpoint pen. Okay, whatever, the man said, pulling the paper form and pen half-heartedly, giving me a number, and left. I took the pen and paper with gloved hands. He was a weird man, and I just had a bad feeling about him. Perhaps Dr. Odd's FBI connections could help. My talk with the old man at Trucker's Den had been very helpful. He was reluctant at first, but then told me. This town was not short of secrets. And I was getting the hang of it a step at a time. I pushed the pedals uphill, the old bike chains complained. Slow as a snail, I adjusted the gears to match the terrain. Sweat passed down my brow into the eyes as I strained hard. Mulberry was a strange place. It was small and there was no public transportation. As I neared the hilltop, a rush passed my spine as the road wound down. I pushed hard to steady the old thing downhill as I quickly changed gears to counter the fast slope down. The path to Crook's Nook wound up and down like a snake. Three crests and troughs followed each other. The first was a small one, and then the next a large ramp, while the third was the biggest one of all. When I went downhill after that, a steep turn appeared out of nowhere. There it was, in, in a secluded corner of the woods, a hut. 
something out of a fairy tale. Bushes covered it on all sides. I could see how the drug addicts could come here to carry out their illicit activities. I moved closer to the nook and then parked the bike. The sound of wind ruffling the fall leaves and the frigid chill of mountain air hit me together. I tried to focus on why I was here. The investigation about Enrique had been one dead end leading to the other. Jenny had not been helpful. Heidi had been a supporter. And even Maureen had lent me her ear whenever I called her late at night. Yet, there was someone whose number I ignored, who had messaged me, but I really was not interested in her stories. I realized I was her daughter, but that did not excuse her absence from my life, from being there to help me solve problems in life. As I shook off the cobwebs of my past, I moved to the nook's door. The board gave a croak as I pressed on towards it. I pushed on the wooden door. Nothing happened. The door seemed locked. I stayed there and tried to turn the knob. I did not want to break in. The drug user community in Mulberry had turned out to be a formidable challenge. They had ways and means to get things done. Get anything done at all. They were not your typical addicts. Some of them were well-off folks who just liked to hang out here. I tried the window. The first one was closed from inside and the second one as well. The third on the eastern wall of the house was a little different. On the outside, there were several plants in front of the window. But placed lower. It was then that I noticed the other difference. There was a sliding lock, like the one windows have inside. But this one, one was on the outside and hidden from the view. Hidden in plain sight. I slid the lock and opened the window. There was enough space for a person even twice my size to jump in. As I went in, I pulled the window close. A small hand-sized opening was there. I pulled my hand outside and slid the lock back in place. The room smelled of chemicals unknown to my olfactory sensors. I was assuming it was some sort of fumes from the drug these people were taking. As my eyes adjusted, I saw another room. A bunch of people were sprawled on floor cushions. Two people tried to look at me with empty eyes. One girl looked up and gave me a welcoming smile. I smiled back. As I looked at them, I asked, Hi, Ian, around? Two folks tried to look up. Their looks were dazed. Ian? That guy with the funny hair? The girl asked. I guess that must be him, I said. My tone was indecisive, as this was a name I had just cooked up, but I did not think any of them were in a state to notice, so, what about him? Is he around? I don't know the name, but that one guy, he does not come anymore, she said. He is reformed or something, said one of the other people, who had woken up, trying hard to look at me with unfocused eyes. Reformed how? I asked, not sure what these people were saying. Who was asking? A girl was standing in the corner, sober. She was in her full senses and was staring at me. I am asking for a friend, I said, eyeing her from head to toe. He left the pack after that other fella started meeting him, she said. Which other fella, the Mexican one? I asked. Yes, how did you know? She asked me. I knew that Mexican fella, I said, and am here because he turned up dead. The girl's gray eyes clouded. What happened? She asked, grabbing a wooden chair. She sat with a loud thump. Did you know him? I asked. The girl looked crushed. We all respected him a lot. He was the only one who would come and talk with all of us. He would bring us us food and try to stop these kids from doing drugs, she said, her eyes welling up with tears. I cannot believe it. He was right here with us. What has the world come to? I thought he had a fight. I said, maybe if we know a little about who fought with him, then we could get to that guy. It was Owen Smith, she said, and the Mexican guy, he fought with him. He told him he had to leave this place. Do you think he could have killed him? She did not reply. 
her eyes looked down at her lap. Her hands hugged each other, fingers stroking each other. She seemed to be in a state of disbelief. Please tell me, tell me anything that could help. The police do not even consider it a murder. The girl drifted her head up, looked into my eyes. As our eyes met, she nodded and said, I cannot talk about this topic more. She looked at the walls and said, even walls have ears. She raised her index finger to the lips as if telling me to stop. Without saying another word, she moved to the fireplace. She lifted a piece of paper from the mantel and scribbled something for me. After she was done, she looked at it with a tear almost falling off her eyelid. She waited and then turned towards me and gave me the paper. Hi Riza, how are you doing? Asked Heidi, her eyes gleaming elegantly. Not very good, I am afraid, I said, my fingers playing with my hair. I called it my thinking habit. We have a long list of people who wanted to hurt or murder Enrique. How so? She asked. He seemed to be a very gentle person, at least from what you have told me. Yes, but the real world seems a lot more complex than fiction, I said, shaking my head as if to throw the worries away. So, first we have Quinton Jackson. The sheriff's brother? She asked, visibly surprised, a set of previously invisible wrinkles raised in a mound shape between her eyebrows. Why would Quinton have anything against this Enrique? He was not even from around here. Turns out, out Enrique may have, I said, hesitating. He may have stolen his chance at some job, and they ended up in a fight. That sounds strange indeed. But would he go for murder just because of a fight? Heidi asked, still not seeing the point. I know, but I have met the person, and he is holding something back for sure. And he can do it, I said. Yes, anyone can do it, but what did you say was the means of the murder? It was of rather, someone made it to look like a drug overdose, I said. So, Quinton is your first suspect. Who else is there on the list? She asked. It turns out Enrique was helping get some kids out of drugs. And he may have ruffled someone's feathers, I said, and that is a local drug distributor. Drugs in Mulberry? Are you sure you know what you are talking about? She asked. Yes, I am positive. Why? Can Mulberry not have a drug problem? It can. But people here are very much about keeping things the way they are. And drugs? Heard no one talk about them, not even once in my life. That is strange. I have been in Mulberry less than a week and I am seeing the other side of things a lot more than I would have wished. Riza dear, so who is the drug supplier? Asked Heidi, if I may ask. Does the name Owen Smith ring a bell? I asked, waiting patiently for a reply. Owen Smith, the one who works for the insurance company? I really do not know about that, I said, but the Owen Smith I am talking about deals drugs to kids. This is a small place, Riza. And if there were any other Owen Smith, I would know. Owen Smith has been selling insurance policies around here for a long time. So, you can say he is connected with everyone in Mulberry. That is news to me, I said, but why would Owen peddle drugs? Was he making good money in his insurance business? I don't think he was making much at all, said Heidi, people here don't believe in the big companies. He tried to sell me an insurance policy too. Did it work? Work? Well, I bought one, but not because I needed it. I bought it because he seemed like a good kid, said Heidi, chuckling, although, if he really has turned to pedal drugs, maybe I did not know him enough. So, I don't know anyone else, although there is the curious case of Enrique's ex, I said. Enrique had an ex? What about her? Asked Heidi, visibly shocked. Yes, the other day she showed up out of nowhere, I said. I met her at the station. I would have loved to find out more, but Jenny pushed me off. Yes, Jenny is like that. One minute, the girl is your pal and a community member, and in a moment, she can turn formal, said Heidi. So, 
I am not sure how she is linked or why she is here. But she did not even know me. And Enrique's family knows me well, I said, and the way she appeared, she did not seem perturbed at all. She looked as if she had spent an hour at a beauty parlor and celebrating. Really? That is indeed strange. And did you get to know what she was doing in Mulberry? No, Jenny did not let me, I said, not wanting to explain how Jenny had forbidden me from investigating. And there is the strange case of the picture on Enrique's phone. He was with Bob, the stolen I.I. I had a gut feeling that all the things were connected. But nothing seemed to make sense for now. The drugs, the trucker, the X, and the I.I. What was really going on here? If only I could connect again with Enrique somehow and find out more, using meditation. So, you know, at the Puzzle Club, we always solve mysteries by making a list of suspects. You have done just that. That is the first achievement. Although, said Heidi, stopping midway. Although what? Did I miss something? I asked, this is my first genuine case. The case was my first, of course but I tied my failure to failing Enrique, his family, especially his sister. What would I do about it? How would I tell her I could not find the murderer and he or she just got away? I was just saying maybe you should order it the correct way, though. The most likely suspect should be there on the top. Yes, that is a great idea. I just don't know who would have such a powerful motive and means. Wait, I think I have it, I said. Owen Smith is very resourceful in terms of drug supplies, correct? Yes, if he supplies drugs, and Enrique fought him, he certainly can do it. Exactly. And what better way to take his life than to discredit him employing the drugs, right? Aha, uh -huh, Riza, you are superb at it. You are right, he can easily do this, said Heidi, a bright color lit her face oozing excitement. I just hope Jenny would listen to me, I said, looking down at my hands. Why don't you let me try? Said Heidi. Maybe I can knock some sense into her head. The phone's loud bell woke me up the next morning. I opened my eyes, staring at the ceiling fan, sunlight coming from the window of the annex. Hello, I said, this is Risa. Hi Risa, can you come on over quick? Said Heidi. I have some news for you. I pushed the blanket covering me and got up straight in bed. I stretched my arms in the air and turned to the side. A small thud sounded as my feet hit the wooden floor anxiously. I rushed to dress. Whatever it was, I needed to hear it quickly. He has been what? I asked, staring at Heidi in disbelief. Yes, Owen Smith, he turned out dead just this morning, said Heidi. How? Where? I said, feeling my legs going queasy, he cannot be dead. He was the only one who made it to the top T top of the list of suspects. Jenny, she told me he seemed to have taken a ride off the cliff. He was doing rock climbing and seems like the rope he was using was old, said Heidi. Heidi's face spun in place as I tried to focus. So did the room. I struggled to center myself. Think, Riza, think. Did you get the place where he was killed? I asked. Yes, I can show you on the map, said Heidi. Are you planning on going there? Yes, I have to see for myself, I said. I have to be sure it was an accident. Good luck, said Heidi, pulling out an old map from her desk, placing it in front of me. We are here and if you take this little road down here, you should be able to get to the rocks near the mountains next to the forest. She traced the faint trail line on the paper map with a soft wrinkled finger. Heidi, can I ask you for a favor? I said. Sure dear, said Heidi. Can you get something to Dr. Odd for me? I shall write a note to go with it. Sure, why not? Said Heidi, her inquisitive eyes gleaming. Chapter 9 the ride to the rocks area was tiring in more ways than one. I pushed against the two forces, 
the pedals traversing the rough road against the strong wind and the force of my non-stop train of thoughts. Both were feeding on my energy. As I moved closer to the spot, the road narrowed to a trail. I tried riding the bike. But then it became more of a hassle. I stopped and got off. The chilly mountain air hit my nostrils. I could discern many smells. There was a smell of fresh trees, dirt, coupled with a smell of something burning in the distance. I adjusted my cap over my scarf to shield myself from the wind. My ears felt cold to touch as I touched them briefly and held them to warm, the bike pressing against my side. The rocky area was hard to miss. It was a steep climb. And the yellow tape marked the area clearly. I could make out a few people standing there, along with an ambulance and a police car. They would have taken the long road here. Heidi had been kind enough to guide me to the shortcut suitable for my bike. As I neared the site, I saw Jenny and the sheriff. This was the first time I had seen him in person. Person. He certainly looked a lot like Quinton, the trucker brother. Jenny noticed me first and gave me an annoyed look. The sheriff turned and looked at me. Well, well, well. Who do we have here? If it isn't the famous Nancy Drew out of nowhere. Hello, sheriff, I said, standing outside the marked parameter. This man certainly was not happy to see me. Anne. I guess he must have talked with his brother by now. I was just thinking this might be a great place to meet you. A scene of a potential crime? A murder? He said, his eyebrows raised as he was visibly agitated. Why don't you come back later, miss? Re. Rees. Whatever your name is. It is Reza. I know this is not the best time. But now that I am here, would you mind telling me a bit about what happened here? I said, ignoring his not-so-veiled threat. I will not. And if you distract us or interfere with the investigation, we can book you for obstruction of justice. Maybe that would help you rethink what you are doing here, Miss Reza, he said. I am sure she is here just to see you, isn't that so? Said Jenny, intervening between the now-flared conversation. Isn't that why you are here? I caught Jenny's micro-wink and said, I am not here to cause any trouble. I was just hoping to help you and offer my services. Well, thanks, but no thanks, he said. You just need to stay out of trouble, and then you need to go back to wherever you came from. I understand, I said, trying hard to keep my lips sealed in response to Jenny's unspoken words. Yes, Risa, just like the sheriff said, you need to stay out of official police business. It is for your own good. I smiled coyly and said, sure, I definitely will do that, gradually shifting and joining a couple of other onlookers outside the tape. While the body had been removed, I could see the general air area. As I looked up at one ridge, I thought I saw a man. I wonder who it was. If this was not an accident, then the killer must still be out there and looking to hide the clues, if any. I had to find some other way to access information about the body. The room shone brightly, like a jewel. As I entered, my eyes were not yet willing to adjust. Dr. Odd's place had a strangely long covered tunnel where my eyes had adjusted in the dim light. Now, as I moved to her dining room, it had the sense of a grand ballroom. I removed my coat in a temperature-controlled environment. A smell of old furniture polish surrounded me. I placed my coat on the rack. There was a small coffee table in the middle of the two chairs. Dr. Odd was facing Heidi and chatting. Heidi was sitting comfortably as I entered. Both looked at me. Hi there, Riza, said Heidi. I noticed a small bundle of papers tucked inside a brown file held in Heidi's embrace. Heidi was glowing in the well-lit room. Her gray hair exuberated a motherly aura. Hi ladies, I said, turning my head around to find a suitable chair placed a bit to the left. I pulled it close to the table and sat down, joining the conference. Hi Riza, 
Heidi and I were just discussing some happenings going on around here, said Dr. Odd. She turned her head to face Heidi. Heidi dear, would you be so kind to discuss the contents of my findings? She said, motioning Heidi towards the contents of the file. My heart raced. What new things are here for me? Maybe Dr. Odd had found something from the fingerprints that I had shared with her. Or maybe there was something else. I could not wait to hear. Yes, please do share. I am at a dead end in my exploration. There are a lot of things going on. And I don't know if they are related, I said. Heidi slowly raised the heavy file. There was a string attached to it. She pulled on its knot as I kept watching intently. As she opened the set of documents, documents, she pulled one paper out of the lot. Reza Deary, what Faith's contacts at the FBI have found for us, you need to keep it confidential, said Heidi, expecting me to comply. I nodded in agreement. Of course, I understand that, I said. What that really means is that we cannot use this information directly or in a court of law. Faith has done this especially for you, she said, turning her face towards Dr. Odd. I might have caught a brief smile morphed by her lips morphed as she looked into Dr. Odd's eyes respectfully. Yes, definitely. I realize that, I said. So, the prints that you had given matched with the animal guy. Turns out the guy has a record. He goes to high places. State police have registered several complaints against him from his neighbors, but the strange thing is, there have been no proven offenses. Most people simply back off in a day or so, said Heidi. Yes, they always seem to come up with excuses such as, said Dr. Odd, oh, I must have been mistaken. He is such a great guy, you know. And so on. That really is strange, I said. There definitely was something unnerving about him. But when I had seen him, he did not look that dangerous to me. So, how many complaints we have against him till now? Let's see, said Heidi, turning over the pages. This is one, this is another one, three, four, she said, keeping counting the papers. There seemed to be a lot of them. Okay, I probably missed out a few, but there are at least twenty odd complaints here. And they all just vanish? I asked. Yes, that seems to happen every time, said Heidi. That really is weird, I said, and are the complaints different each time? Most of the complaints seem to be about loud noises and weird animal sounds, said Heidi. Wait, there are also a few where a trespasser was attacked by some animal. And there is one where a person was threatened by him not to complain. Apparently, he still complained. Though nothing happened somehow. They did not charge him with a crime. So, do you think he is so intimidating that people end up taking the complaint away? Asked Dr. Odd. It certainly looks like it, does it not? Asked Heidi, I think Riza you need to be very careful with this guy. He does not seem to like people who mess with him. I am always careful. And you know I can handle myself in any situation, right? Yes, we know. But we also care for you and do not want you to get into any trouble. You know all that kung fu thing, but there are bad people in this world. They can hurt you in more ways than one, said Heidi. Her eyes gleamed with concern. And Heidi, you still haven't talked about the interesting part, have you? Asked Dr. Odd. A faint smile formed around her lips. No, we have not, said Heidi, smiling kindly at Dr. Odd. So, Dr. Odd's contacts also used some advanced tech to find some other details about our suspect. If location information is correct, his phone was around the location of the rock climb, and he has not come forward to the police till now. Jenny could find no one around as a witness, said Heidi. Yes, rock climbers around here. Some people are from around here and some are from other parts of Massachusetts. And then we have people from neighboring states as well, 
such as from Connecticut, New York, New Hampshire, and even farther. Some people come on over for the weekend. And some are here for the long run, said Dr. Odd. What Faith is trying to say is that we can have visitors which stay in the state forest and climb mountains for months. If memory serves me right, we had this one guy who was here for the entire year and no one ever saw him in town, said Heidi. Yes, and still we had no witnesses. Not even one, said Dr. Odd, as if someone chose the timing specifically so that no one else was around. Would that have been easy to choose? I asked, sipping on the chocolate-covered swirls floating on top of the coffee, which Dr. Odd's butler had brought for us. No, not unless the person was a regular here. So, it is difficult to choose a time like this, said Heidi. It was clear I was up against someone very intelligent. Whoever it was, was connected with the drug peddler, I said. So that would imply that the peddler had something else to hide which the killer did not want him to disclose. What could that be? Could it be related to drugs? Said Dr. Odd, peeking above her golden glasses. Could be. Or it could be something else. But I don't have enough information right now to do something about it, I said. Faith, Heidi, if I promise to be careful, will you allow me to go ahead with meeting the animal guy? I was worried you were going to go ahead with it, so I want to share another thing. The animal guy is well trained in combat as well. He seems to have been a mercenary in the past. I thought Faith and Heidi got worried a bit too much. I just wanted to talk to him. That was all. How angry could he get if I wanted just that? It took me a good 45 minutes before I got to Victor Parsons's gate. The black gate was at least twice my height. A thick gray concrete wall extending from both sides surrounded it. The place looked more like a military compound than a person's residence. I pressed the bell. Nothing seemed to happen for a moment. I pressed it again. Who are you? And what do you want? A strongly accented voice came out of nowhere. I looked at the source and found a small gray speaker well hidden in the wall's texture. I also caught a gleam of reflective surface next to it. So, whoever it was at the other end certainly liked to keep things private. I looked back towards the camera. Hi, I think we met? At the shelter? Oh, you are that girl from the counter. What do you want? The voice bellowed. I thought maybe we can talk. I recall you were looking for some animal. Right? I said, hoping he would catch the bait. Mister, do you want to get your hands on that lemur? And if not, I guess I can return, I said, changing my strategy to see how he behaved. There was no sound. I waited. I waited. Nothing happened. Time stopped. This guy was really hiding from me. And I needed to meet him, otherwise, I would have nothing. Slowly, I turned around, ensuring that the camera caught my movement. Still nothing. I placed my hands on the bike's handlebar. Come on, man. I know you are up to no good. I am your bait. Come on now. Just as I was about to mount the bike, a sound crack from the speaker, Okay, come on over, the voice said, but no funny business. Got that? I turned back to face the camera and raised my shoulders in a shrug. Hey, what can I do? I am just a helper at the shelter, I said. A loud rumbling sound came from behind the wall. The gate moved. It was going inside. Okay, this was new. I did not expect that. In a minute, the gate had completely vanished into the ground. I pushed the bike to the side of the wall and walked inside the compound. As I got in, the rumbling sound started again. This time louder. I looked back. The black metallic gate was going back up. In front of me was a wooden house. And then behind there seemed to be a forest. As I moved towards the cottage, 
I saw a man standing outside the door. I moved towards him. Hello, sir, I said, looking at the man. This was our second meeting, but after all the detailed instructions from my two mentors, I observed him a little more carefully than the last time. Victor looked intimidatingly tall and was dressed casually this time, in a shirt and jeans. He had a rough, tan face with small sunken jet, jet black eyes. He was top heavy and had bulky farmhouse arms. I was not scared. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. This was something I had learned in my time at my martial arts clubs. So, you were there at the animal shelter, he said, taking his hands out of his loose faded jeans. Yes, sir, I was there. Nice to meet you again, I said. I quickly analyzed the surroundings in case I had to make a run for it. The backside seemed to be open in some kind of forest region, starting with some farms. And there were sheds similar to those for holding aircraft. He caught my eyes wandering off and snapped back at me, so, do you have information about what I was looking for? He certainly was not wasting any time. Sir, yes, I could not talk freely about it that day. We had a lemur, sort of. You know he was a weird animal. Was? What do you mean? Is he dead or something? He said, visibly agitated. No, no, sir. I hope not. It is just that someone stole him from the shelter the other day, I said, observing his reactions. Stole? Who stole it? And did you find out about it? He asked. I do not know. What I mean to say is that we informed the police and they are working on it, I said. Sir, was he your pet or something? I mean, I would help if you were attached to him? Why would I be attached to an animal of this sort? And the police? What do you expect them to do about it? I am better at finding it than any of these two so-called police officers, he said. In case you get to know about his location. Even if you cannot get to it, how about you send me a text message? Sir, I shall definitely send you if it means so much to you, I said. Bob meant nothing to this man for sure. He was not an animal lover at all. He was perhaps the antonym of animal lovers, but somehow he seems to be interested in our I.I. What it means to me or not is none of your business. Business. There is just good money involved and you will get a good cut. You send me a text when you find its location and details of your online account. I will send over 500 bucks if you let me know before you tell anyone else. $500? For a rough-looking lemur? I didn't know what was going on, but it was something sinister. Sure, sir, please give me your number, I said, giving him my Nike a phone, half expecting him to take it away and bind me. The man typed his number in and gave me back. I left quickly. What are you implying, exactly? Jenny asked, her hazel brown eyes coming together in a frown. I say that this animal guy is definitely suspicious and maybe, I said, just maybe, for once, you people will listen to me. Mr. Parsons is a precious member of Mulberry. You realize you are accusing such a renowned person? Asked Jenny, shifting her attention from the computer screen in front of her, to look at me in the eyes. An invisible ball of self-doubt blew up in my tummy. I knew he was guilty. Okay. Maybe I was not sure what he was guilty of. But hey, who can trust a man who calls an animal it? He offered me money to find a lemur. Don't you see how strange that sounds? He is paying me 500 US dollars to just get him a lemur, I said. Oh really? So, you are saying if a person loves animals so much that he will pay for it, that makes him a seasoned murdered capable of killing two people without batting an eye? Asked Jenny, the loudness in her voice had now just crossed an unsaid limit of annoyingly intolerable speech in my mind. I am saying you should at least try to investigate him, I said, trying hard to make my case. As opposed to what? 
a non-resident annoying person, like yourself, with little or no credibility, and just coming here to mess things up, said Jenny. First, first, I did not come by my wish. You asked me yourself to come here. Second, I have just been trying hard to find out something about Enrique because that is just not how he was. And I owe it to his sister to find out who murdered him, I said. Fine. You came here because we wanted to find out more about the body. Although we also had alternate ways to do that. Like the fingerprint results, which had come just before you arrived. And regarding your stay, I have already helped you enough in your imaginary quest to avenge your drug-addicted friend. So, your invitation to stay in town is no longer valid. If I were you, I would simply pack up and leave the town. Why should I leave? I am an American citizen and can stay in any place that I want to stay. You cannot make me leave. I can make you leave the town if I wanted to, said Jenny, but I am asking you politely to stop interfering in official police business or you are going to get into more trouble than you would have thought you could get in, said Jenny, her tone becoming more menacing by the minute. But you are not doing your job, are you? I said, Enrique has gone. And nothing, not even one official suspect. Yes, because there is no concrete evidence that your friend died an unnatural death. This is where we differ. I knew Enrique well, and it is up to me to prove his innocence. You are not the only one looking at Enrique's case. His ex is here too. She is very concerned. Pedra? Do you really think she is at all concerned by Enrique's demise? Did you see how she made up before coming to your office? There is nothing wrong with a lady getting dressed up to go out. And I am sure Pedra dressed up for for coming here. How about if she just used makeup to hide how much she had been crying? I cannot believe it. Jenny had made potential criminals into innocent people. How could she do that? This was totally unacceptable to me. And what about Pedra? What was she here for and how did she come here so quick? Because I called her myself. Risa, as always, your investigation is leading you nowhere. If you really want to stay and keep working here at Heidi's shelter or someplace else, then you need to stop doing this amateur sleuth thing. This is not fiction. This is real life, and neither of the two deaths seemed linked. Unless, of course, you are hiding something. Are you? Why would I hide anything from the police? I cannot think of anything. Whatever I had with me, I have tried to tell you. And you are not even willing to make a formal statement of my complaint. Yes, because your complaints are not even against a single person. I think if I do it your way, I might have to arrest the entire town. You are paranoid. Are you getting me? You are not letting me do my job. And this is obstruction of justice. A loud bang came from my back. I turned around to see the sheriff standing behind staring at both of us. If she is disturbing you, then why don't you arrest this young lady? And let us book her. Oh, this is so lovely, I said. The pendant looked nice. Its silver design shone brightly with the embedded emerald. You really think so? Asked Alice. Yes, it is really cool, I said. Well, I got it from the Parsons. Parsons? What is that? Oh, that is the jewelry store around here. You mean that is owned by Parsons? I asked. Yes. Everyone knows that, Riza, she said. Oh, so Victor Parsons must be rich and famous. He tried to trick me when he came for the first time. Maybe he thought I was new, and he did not want people to find about his visit here. Hello, you are Riza? Said the tall lady outside the holding cell. I looked up at her and nodded. Yes, that would be me. Me. I am Ella Malcolm. Heidi is out of town, so Faith sent me to get you out of here, Ella said. Jenny opened the door, and I stepped outside. 
Two hours in the cell had been important to me. They had helped me think. I had meditated and centered myself. Officer Jenny, I did not mean to be a pain, I said, as Jenny guided me outside. Well, Dr. Malcolm has convinced the sheriff that she will ensure you will be careful from now. So, I hope this does not happen next time. I said nothing. This was a difficult situation for me. But I had to make the best of it. As I walked with Ella outside, the sun was already setting. The evening chill had set in. Dr. Odd's car was standing there for us. I thought about what to do next. This town had a lot of secrets. And the police seemed like they would cooperate only if the case and the clues were all handed to them on a silver platter. Would that be all, Riza? Asked Larry the grocer, smiling through his dentures. Yes, that is all I can carry on my dear old friend, the bike, I said, chuckling back at Larry. Ah, and here I thought you had an actual friend to carry the stuff. No such luck there, Larry, I said. My apologies, sir, but can you please give me a bag of flour? A man stood beside me at the counter. Why, sure, Wilbur. Your master seems to be in a hurry again, said Larry. Wilbur looked vaguely familiar. Now, where had I seen him before? Yes, Master Sam forgot to add it to the shopping list and now he is going to blame me if I don't get all things in the kitchen before the guests arrive, said Wilbur. Aha, you were the bellboy at Sam's B&B, right? I asked, turning my head in his direction. Wilbur was a small-sized man with skin that looked tanned by working in the sun. A nervous sweat was creeping down his forehead. Yes, ma'am, I still am, said Wilbur. But I thought when I last saw you, Mr. Sam was having a conversation with you regarding I decided not to complete the sentence because of the colors coming on Wilbur's face. Yes, ma'am, he gave me a notice. But then he decided against firing me. Mr. Sam is a generous man to work for. So, you are back. That sounds great. Yes, it is. There are few jobs around here in Mulberry for people, said Wilbur, people like me, who do not have a college degree or experience. So, we are lucky if someone hires us and then keeps us for anything more than a few months. Oh, that is sad to know. No, not really. I am eternally grateful to Mr. Sam, said Wilbur, pushing his list towards Larry who was busy getting the flour for him. Here you go, just the right amount of wheat and chaff in this one, just like what your master likes. Thank you, sir, and can you please also refill these things? He asked, pointing at the list. Let me look and get back to you soon, said Larry, taking the list in his hands as he adjusted the bifocals to look at the list in perhaps a better manner. Larry then took the piece of paper and turned to the back of the shop. So, Wilbur, I discovered that Sam's B&B is the only formal place for guests to stay in this entire area. Is his a myth or a reality? Yes, miss, we are very proud of our B&B. Everyone who comes to stay at a hotel in Mulberry has stayed here. Oh, really? You know, just recently a dear friend of mine, Pedra, visited Mulberry. I was wondering if she stayed at the B&B? Oh, yes. Miss. Pedra Gill. She has been staying with us since she came a few days back. But, Wilbur, may I ask you something? Yes, miss, please ask. I recall, Sam always only allows people to stay at the B&B if they already had a booking. I had an unpleasant experience myself, if you recall, I said. The man nodded, yes, miss. And you should not feel bad about it. Mr. Sam is rather strict in his rules. And he does not relax them for anyone. Anyone. Anyone at all. So, I was wondering how Pedra got her to stay when she was also new, just like me. You know, I hope Mr. Sam is careful in balancing between guests. He always takes care of these rules. I have made mistakes in the past. But I have learned now, he said, uttering a nervous laugh. 
So, tell me, how come Pedra could stay without a booking? Mississippi someone actually booked Pedra in the name of Mr. Owen. You mean the Owen, who just lost his life? Did he die? When did that happen? Yes, just recently. So, Wilbur, were they close? These two. No, miss, they were here for business. They had all their meetings in the conference room. And I recall having to take Miss Pedra to her room along with Mr. Owen, but he dropped the luggage at her door. And asked us to set the room for her, taking leave shortly. That is wonderful. Thanks for letting me know all this, I said. My mind was racing now. Owen and Pedra were connected, but I did not understand how. I had to find out more. Don't say that, said Heidi, shaking her head in disbelief. I am telling you, things are way weirder than they look. Facts are indeed stranger than fiction, I said. Heidi and Ella were both having a panic attack at almost the same time. Dr. Malcolm, I am curious, I asked. About what, dear? said Ella. Well, you know considering how scared I am of flying insects, I have heard that nobody, nobody at all who can deal with these roaches, can be startled. Is that true? Well, if you think about it, humans are a peculiar type of insects, I always like to say this, she said, looking ruffled. Chapter 10 The gate to Sam's B&B was wide open, like last time. There were cars this time. As I moved, I passed by a large black humby outside Sam's B&B. I treaded inside, carefully recalling my series of unfortunate accidents since I arrive in Mulberry, Mulberry, Massachusetts. The peaceful afternoon sun shone brightly and played peekaboo with the clouds. I entered Sam's B&B. I rang the bell on the counter and waited. Just a minute. I shall be right with you, said a voice. Sam appeared from behind the other room. Hi there, he said, stopping mid-sentence as he eyed me closely from intelligent eyes set deep in a rough battle-worn face. If I had not known Sam to be the owner running a B&B &B in this quaint little town, I could have sworn he looked more like one of those TV personalities who live in the wild and eat raw things. A shudder went through my spine at the thought. I can never eat such things. My mom would cook chicken thighs, and I could not even eat them because they were a little reddish. How do these people do it? I see we might have met before. Are you looking for a room to rent? Asked Sam, peering at me from unforgettable hardened eyes. Ah, well, I was, and maybe, I said, trying to decide on a story to start a conversation with Sam, I mean I have a place to stay for a couple of days. But I might look for a place here at your B&B shortly. Look, miss. I don't really entertain many guests here. So, as long as you book in time and give me enough space, I can put you in the register, he said. The register. Aha. If only I could get him to show it to me. Yes, please make a booking in my name, I said. Sam put his right hand in his left pocket and removed a golden key. He then bent down and opened a drawer with it. And pulled out a register. Yes, yes. I needed this. Sam opened the register carefully, facing him. I tried to peek in, but his hand was blocking the list. He lifted an old pen from the side of the register and asked me, Please give me your photo ID so I can make a note. I seem to have forgotten your name from last time. You can just write my name. It is strong, I said. I decided I would not show my photo ID to Sam. Okay. Miss Strong, I have noted your name. Anything else I can do for you? Asked Sam. Yes, I was just wondering if you know Miss Pedregill. Oh, that Hispanic lady? He asked me. Yeah, she has been here for a few days now. He looked up at me. His eyes adjusted curiously as if asking me, So, do you know her? I know her. So, was just wondering if she is still around here, I said, 
carefully looking at his reactions. Yes, the lady has been here. I don't know if she is in the house, though. But you can go in and check. Thank you, sure I can try going in and say hi, I said. Sam carefully folded the register and locked it back in the drawer. This way, Miss Strong. I followed him down the hallway. I knocked on the wooden door and waited. Who is there? A busy voice on the other side of the door said. Hi, this is Riza, I said. I wondered if she even remembered me. She did not seem to notice me the last time around. The door opened as Pedra peeked outside. Do I know you? She looked at me through unfocused hazel eyes. A wave of recognition hit her. Oh, it is you. The door opened. So, how long have you known Enrique? She asked, sitting comfortably on a white sofa. I shifted sides in my seat. A few years back, I met Enrique in a shelter, I said. It was a blizzard, and we were both stuck there, along with a hundred other people, I said. Okay. Did not have any conversation with Enrique about you, she said. I did not have any conversation about you either, I thought. Oh really? We just connected with animals. He was more of a mentor figure for me, I said. Yes, yes, he and his animals. He preferred animals to humans. A scowl appeared to peek from behind her heavily plastered face. She turned a bit to the side. I could see wrinkles. Life had not seemed to treat her gently. A lot was going on, on in those eyes. I sat and waited. She then said, so, what brings you here? Oh, interesting. I was just wondering the same thing about you, I said, chuckling to normalize her. Yeah, yeah, just some business, she said. Her eyes focused on some distant world. Business? In Mulberry? I asked, that is a genuine coincidence, is it not? I mean Enrique turns up dead and you show up? So, are you accusing me of something? She said, her eyes straining hard at me. I wonder what were you doing here? Officer Jenny called me, I said. She called me too, she said. Her voice snapped back at me like a whip. Oh, and may I ask, how do you know Mr. Owen? I said, deciding to ramp up the pressure on her. Who? Oh, Owen? She asked, her face briefly relaxing. Why are you asking me these questions? You are not the police. I should be the one asking you the questions. For example, how well did you know my husband? Your husband? Really? And here I thought he was your ex, I said. My ex or whatever. It is none of your business, she said, glaring at me continuously. So, who was Mr. Owen to you? Tell me. He is dead, you know that, right? I asked. Her face turned crimson. What? What are you talking about? Of course, I know Enrique is dead, she said. I am talking about Owen, I said. Come on. I needed to see her reactions. I waited. How? When? I did not know that, she said. If she was acting, it was superb and I had certainly rustled the hornet's nest. Bingo. I hope she was going to give me her genuine emotions. I came to know you came to Sam's B&B with him. So, I am surprised you did not know, I said. She looked around the room as if finding something. An answer, perhaps? She sat there, frozen in time. Then she said, I told you it was just business. I could see the realization hitting her. How could her dead ex and a dead drug peddler be a business thing? Okay, I knew Owen. Well, he, I knew because he had sold, sold us a policy several years back, she said, back when I was together with Enrique, and that is it. But Enrique dies, you come in and Owen checks you in this BNB, I said. 
and you say that nothing seems weird? How much was the policy? When Jenny called me, I contacted Owen. He was around. So, he got me to this place. That is it, she said. I could see fear in her eyes. Had she realized that if I went with this information to Jenny, things might not go well for her? Look, just be honest with me. I respected Enrique a lot. And am just interested in finding out what happened with him, I said. I really hoped my switching sides from bad to good cop worked. In the movies, there is just one difference. Good cops are two different people. Yes, me too, she said. Look here, I just came for him. I don't say that I have no interest in the insurance. Because I did not like Enrique. Not at all. After what he did with me. The way he would just find animals on the street and move them into the house. It was too much. He cared for them more than anything. More than me. She broke down into tears. Even though she was crying, it still seemed odd. My gut feeling was that she was hiding something. There was not even a hint of remorse in her eyes. The only reason she was crying was that I had caught up with her. Still, there was not much more I could do now. I had reached the end of my abilities to extract information from her. She had gotten into her shell and stopped responding. I got up to leave. Good day, Miss Gill. I hope you realize I will not withhold any information from the police, I said. She said nothing, just sat there sobbing. Hello, Heidi, I said. Hello, dearie, where have you been? Asked Heidi. I have some news for you, I said. Tell me, I hope you found something. Yes, yes, I did. Well, get on with it. Waiting isn't good for my old heart, is it? No, no, it isn't. Well, Heidi, guess what? Pedra, she has a motive. Motive. What? That Hispanic guy's ex? What could be her motive? Getting hold of his phone or something? I can't think of any good motive for killing him. Well, there was an insurance policy that Owen got for her back in the day. Oh, really? Sizable? She didn't tell me, but yes, it seemed like a sizable amount. Which is probably why she never once mentioned it. How large? Murdering large? Asked Heidi. I don't know. But I guess money can make people do strange things, can it not? Yes, it sure can. I guess, she said. And guess what? That is only less than half the story. You are really ramping up suspense, Riza. Come on, tell me. Owen, the insurance guy, drug peddler. He knew her as he was the one who got her checked in to Sam's. That is interesting. Do you think the two could have planned this all along? I think so. Because first Owen had a fight with Enrique. It could be for the drugs. Or it could have been for something else. And maybe Owen planned this with Pedra and then Pedra got rid of him, too. And I think he planned it all. Because he would only book Sam's place if he knew two days in advance, right? Oh Riza, this all clicks. You are wonderful. An authentic genius. All the puzzle pieces fit then. Yes, they do. Heidi, I said, do you think you can, you know, maybe send a hint to Jenny? And then I can go meet her. I sure can. Let me do just that. You have really cracked the mystery. It relieved me. Finally, I seem to have gotten things where I wanted them. I cannot arrest a person just because you think she is guilty, said Jenny. Well, you are really something. You know. I have told you every detail. She did it. Can't you see? I asked her. Jenny had been uncooperative, as always. And this was bugging me extremely. It was a drug overdose. No one murdered him, she said. 
How can you say that? I asked her. Because it turns out there were his prints on all items in his bag and needles, she said. Yes. Yes, obviously. Because the killer did it. She could have done this. Can she not? Or maybe Owen did it. That is not all. As a matter of fact. I have another witness, she said. What? Another witness? Who? Tell me please, I asked. It turns out when Enrique was staying at Sam's place, the bellboy, she said. Wilbur? Yes, I met him, I said. Yes, Wilbur, he saw Enrique with the drugs, she said. My legs felt soft. That made no sense. How could Enrique do this? That does not seem right, I said. He never did drugs. It never does. They never do, said Jenny. I am sorry, but facts are obvious. Okay, just one more time. Can you please let me see the autopsy report? I guess it won't hurt, she said. Jenny stood up and walked to the gray filing cabinet. She pulled open the second drawer. Here you go. Look for yourself. I sat down and read. There were too many technical and medical details there. Then I saw something that made me sit up straight. Jenny, if we suppose you were an injectable drug user? I asked. What? Why would I be an injectable drug user? Said Jenny. Just for a minute. Okay, no offense. Suppose I were one. Now, if I were to inject myself with drugs, where would I do that? I am not following you. What do you mean? I would either be left-handed or right. Correct? Yes, obviously. So, if I was right-handed, I would inject myself in the left arm. And if I were left-handed, I would do it on the other arm, I asked. Okay, that sounds about fair. What is the point? Asked Jenny. I pushed the report back towards her. Look for yourself then, I said. Jenny pulled the report, and her eyes widened. I don't know how I could have missed this. I know you just might be overloaded with things here. So much stress in Mulberry, I said. I didn't want to make Jenny feel bad. After all, she had taken my side twice by now. In the end, of course, my stupidity had helped me shoot myself on the foot. She had been helpful. Helpful. Yes, that is possible. Okay, let me think about it and discuss with the coroner, said Jenny, a crimson tinge of embarrassment rising on her cheeks. Sure, go ahead. We'll see you later? I said. I left. As I exited the station, I hid my smile. Things really were coming together. At least Jenny would now accept it to be a murder, and Pedra could be an official suspect in the dual murders. Risa, come quick, said the voice message. I looked at my phone with half-open eyes. What is up with Alice and messages in the middle of the night? I wondered what it was this time. I pushed myself out of the bed. The New England fall morning breeze greeted me as I steered the bike to the shelter. I wondered what had happened at the shelter. We now had cameras, and I had shown Alice how to monitor the shelter remotely in the after hours. As I entered the shelter, I heard a noise. Alice was standing with a man. Ma'am, I am telling you I did not do it. You are going to be reported to the police. I know what you are here for. Ma'am, all I am guilty of is trying to do the right thing. What are you talking about? I saw you on the cameras. Were you not sneaking in with Bob? Look, ma'am. Please let me explain. I live down the mountain and have a small chicken farm. And for the last couple of days, I found something, or someone had eaten or destroyed my eggs. So, I set a trap. And I found this animal in it tonight. So, I thought I would come to the shelter. 
you thought of bringing it in at 5 a.m.? Asked Alice. He was making so much noise. I waited for a couple of hours. I even tried ringing the shelter's number. I thought someone would be here. So, does that then allow you to sneak inside the gates? Tell me. Do you realize you are trespassing? Look, lady, I am not the bad guy. See this awful-looking animal? What if I had not caught him? He did the same with some farms in my neighborhood. A neighborhood. Make a wild guess what would they have done with weird-looking animals that steal eggs? Alice grabbed my arm and took me to the side. Risa, what do you think? Could he be telling the truth? I don't know about that, but tell me first. Were you able to look at how he entered or if his story seems plausible? He seemed to enter with the cage. Although I thought he was going to take another animal from the shelter. So, maybe he might tell the truth. I don't know. Also, Jenny does not like me barging in with my complaints. So, what do you think we should do? Asked Alice. Okay. I think we should let him go then. The man was standing next to Bob's cage, peeking outside. Okay, fine, we are going to let you go. But don't leave town, said Alice. We will check your story. And if it does not check out, we will report you to the police. Ma'am, I am a long-time resident of Mulberry. Where would I go anyway? As I moved the I.I. to his place, Alice bid the man farewell. Alice and I now focused our attention on the I.I. We stared at Bob for a moment and then looked at each other. I said, is there something different about Bob, or I am mistaken? There certainly is, said Alice, but I am not sure what it is, though. The windows were tapping sporadically. The sounds of fall. A mystical theater. Leaves falling. Clouds moving. Sunlight entered the windowsill. Clouds took over. Curtains moved. I went in. Deeper. Deeper. The rhythm of my heartbeat gradually sounded louder and louder until it was the only sound I could hear. I was there. A mountain. Clouds below me. Trees. A man calling out. Bob climbing a tree for food. Talking. Pointing at a man with a long finger. The man looked at me. Enrique stood there, calling out. His voice was unheard. Fog. Pedra, looking at Enrique. Fog. Owen is climbing rocks. A man on top. Strong. Faceless. Fog. A man pulling Enrique's lifeless body. Enrique calling. No sound. I run towards him. I hear him. His words. The fog is lifting, Riza. Beware. I wake up. My heart beating fast. Sweat on my brow. I was still sitting in the meditation pose with my knees up. Did you know, Riza, some mountain goats can climb tall hills and ledges? Asked Alice, petting the gray-haired, bearded goat. The goat had only recently gotten to the shelter. She was so friendly that it was hard to announce to her to be taken away by someone. Since I had been the one feeding and cleaning her, she had learned to follow me around all over the place. And considering she was not a wild animal, we had to decide to let her go any place she wanted. Unfortunately, however, she would just follow me around, so the place where she went was wherever I was whether it was the office or my temporary quarters, or the tea room. It was even hard to get rid of her when I tried to go to the bathroom. I cannot imagine how, I said. A shudder went through my spine as I imagined being on a straight rocky face, climbing with nothing but my four limbs to climb, like a mountain goat. Especially with them not using a rope or anything. Well, I think you need to get rid of all your fears, said Alice. I wouldn't call it a fear. I mean, it is more of a preference. 
I choose not to climb tall buildings or steep rocks, I said. Very interesting preference. But then have you ever tried? Asked Alice. Tried what exactly? I asked, are you talking about rock climbing? Yes, what else? You are avoiding rock climbing because you fear heights. Okay, a little anxious. But scared is a big word, I said, blushing my way to another embarrassing look. You know, can you believe there was a time when I feared furry rabbits? I looked at Alice in utter bewilderment. Yeah, right. Right. How can anyone fear those furry little cute rabbits? I really don't know what to say, Alice. I mean, what can be scary about them? They look so cute. That is because you haven't seen a mommy rabbit defend her little rabbits, said Alice. Okay, I give up. Maybe then rabbits can be scary beasts. If you say so, I mean, I said. Yes, so that was when I was in school. So, my father told me he had to get the fear of rabbits out of my system. Lo and behold. He took me to a petting zoo where there were a lot of animals, said Alice. And what happened to you and rabbits there? Did it work out? I asked. On the contrary. I got attacked by a mommy rabbit, said Alice. Oh, that is awful, I said. I looked closely at Alice. Who could have thought Alice would have a deeper, gentler side? And an evolutionary arc from an animal hater to an animal lover. But you know something? That trip helped me to understand animals. I realized that some animals just did not want to be disturbed. And others, like our cute goat here, do not want to leave their pet human's company, said Alice, chuckling. So, I am still unsure what has that got to do with my fear of heights. I asked. Well, I feared animals, and immersing myself in them gave me a deeper understanding of life. It also gave me a purpose in life. I love challenges. And so, I spent most of my life among animals, said Alice. I suggest you also try the same. So, I should start living on top of a hill or something? I asked. Well, that would be a future goal for you to achieve. Could it be not? I guess we can never say never, I said, chuckling. Well, I have a solution of sorts for your fear of heights. Do you know Sam? Of Sam's B&B fame? I asked. Oh no, not him. I recalled my last encounter with him. Yes, to my knowledge there just is one Sam around in Mulberry, said Alice, enjoying her sudden prowess over me visibly, a smile showing on the edges of her lips. Yeah, unfortunately, I have had an encounter with him, I said. It was the day I came to Mulberry for the first time. Sam did not treat you well, huh? Asked Alice. Alice, her facial wrinkles pronounced with concern. No, it was my fault. I just did not do an advanced booking. Sam can be like that, said Alice. So, what about Sam and my fear of heights? I asked. Oh yes, said Alice, her eyes refocusing as her consciousness returned from some deep thoughts. Well, Sam is the expert in Mulberry for rock climbing and hiking tours. He runs a tourist workshop for people new to them both. Sometimes it is a day-long thing. At others, you must stay for a couple of days and so when you graduate from that workshop, you are considered an expert. He gives a certificate. Oh, that sounds interesting, I said. I really did not want to learn about rock climbing and exploring steep hard rocks and heights. You know, he really likes to customize a lot of things. Like his B&B, he customizes and does imprints on everything from paperweights to registers. I remember the time when a friend of mine came to stay at his B&B. And as a souvenir, Sam gave an engraved Swiss army knife. Oh really? Engraved how? With the word Sam's B&B. What else? Asked Alice. Oh okay, I said. 
I could book a slot for you in Sam's rock climbing workshop in the next session. Alice, you are so kind. But really, I would rather work with these cute animals more than spend time on the rocks. Risa, you are so good with animals. I have a feeling you will have a blast there. So, I am not taking a no from you on this. I did not reply. I may not have shown it on the outside, but inside I was having cold sweats. I really hoped I could somehow get out of this, but the more I resisted, the more Alice was getting excited about the possibility. Finally, I quit. Chapter 11 It was a surprising Friday for me as I got to Sam's hiking workshop. The place was on a long stretch and it took me a while to get to the place. I had brought with me a small bag with supplies such as band-aids and other first aid kit essentials, at least that is what it said on the outside. As I moved closer to the location, I saw smoke rising from a place with around 15 people. As I moved closer, I noticed that the smoke was from a bonfire. Sam was standing in the center, waving his hands around and talking. I looked at my watch and apparently I had come earlier than my intended class. It read online as a class on survival skills in the wild. Hey, nice seeing you here, said a sprightly voice. I turned around to see the girl from Crook's Nook. Hi, I said. How are you doing? I just thought about getting rock climbing lessons. That is it, she said. I wonder how good his lessons are. I think he is an expert, she said. I have heard good things about him. He has been in some foreign military organization in the past or something. So, now he uses his skills to teach people other than his B&B business. Well, I got forced into attending this class. So, I hope I can make the most of it, I said, and to be honest, I do hope today is just about theory. Are you scared of the class? The girl asked. I'm going to make the best of it, I said. Oh look, the previous class is over. It is time to join in. We moved to the clearing. Some people left, and some others joined in. Everyone was seated on the ground. Some, however, had found themselves rocks. I found a location in the outer circle of the gathering near the girl. Welcome newbies to Sam's class series on rock climbing, said Sam. I wonder how he can remain so enthusiastic about this topic, I said, whispering. The girl did not seem to notice and was totally focused on the class. So, so, now that we have covered the basics of rock climbing, I have an important announcement to make, said Sam. I turned and looked around at everyone. Apparently, everyone except me was completely focused on learning the secrets of rock climbing. You will all be pleased to know that we shall do a quick climb today, said Sam, his face jubilant. I know I had announced about the climb being from the second class onwards, but at least half of you have contacted me to shorten or even skip the theory and get right back to the practical. So, here we are. We are now going to hike to the base of the wall, which I like to call the first course. Are you folks all ready for it? The crowd cheered. I felt an anxious knot in my stomach. The walk to the base was longer than I had expected. I tried hard to get more information from the girl on the way, but she remained tight-lipped. You know, I think it would be nice if you could get some information for me. I am sorry, but I really don't like to be a spy, she said. I am not asking you to be a spy. I just want to know some things about the town off and on. I don't have any contacts here. That is all, I said. That sounds reasonable, but I regretted even telling you anything the last time, she said. I shall be more careful, but I am blind here, I said, pleading with her to help me out. The girl still seemed unmoved. I still don't know what you would need? Well, I am not rich, but I can pay you for the information. It won't be much, but still. You know I don't really want to go for money. But there may be something you might help me with. Really, sure. Tell me, 
said I, you were telling me you are an expert in computers and viruses or something? She asked. Yes, my degree is in computer forensics. Anything you need, tell me. Well, I feel someone is reading my emails. And sometimes I feel I am being watched. Watched. My laptop webcam's light just turns on without reason. That is certainly alarming, I said. What about your emails? How do you know your emails were accessed? Well, I am not a very strong computer user, but sometimes I see my emails changing status to read even before I have ever touched them. And my bills often go to the trash folder. I missed one payment last month and had to pay extra for my card. When I called the bank, they told me they had mailed me the statement. And guess where I found the missing statement? Where? In the trash bin. So, tell me, she asked. Okay, deal. I shall help you find out who it is that is doing this with you. And you will help me whenever I need some information. Deal? I asked. Okay, deal, she said, nodding her head. By now, we were at the base of the rock. I looked up at the daunting height and my heart sank. I looked at the top above. Misty purred at me. I looked towards her. Our eyes met. It looks daunting, doesn't it? Misty fixed her eyes on mine and urged me. I had to make this climb work. Not just for me. But for both of us. The crowd left one by one. I sat on the campsite, exhausted. Every inch of me aching. My head down. Hey, I think I know you. We met the other day? Said the voice. I woke up from my reverie. Sam was standing there. A rare smile on his face. Yes, Sam, we have met, I said. It is good he does not remember the first time we met, I thought. I got up. How are you doing? I think I should be the one asking this question. Right? First time? He asked. Yes, you were great there. Very thorough. I don't think I had learned so much about rock climbing from any website or online video, I said. Yes, climbing is a practical thing. It is like picking a gun. You can never learn to fire one just by reading about it or listening to people talk or even watching videos. So, yeah, he said. His rough voice tore through the clearing. You are right. I have learned a lot today. Considering that I fear heights, I said. You do? Well, what better place to get rid of this phobia than to climb a rock, he said. Once you pass the basic training, be sure to ask me about some of the graded rocks. You can do one at a time to improve your skills. Oh really? I did not know rocks could get grades, can they? I said, chuckling. They can be graded. Like this one. I call it a baby climb. Nothing too hard. And then there are the medium ones like those which take a day or so to get to the top. Like the Pride Rock. And of course, we have some which take more than a day. More than a day in the air? How do people manage that? I asked, completely bewildered. I couldn't even imagine doing this once. And some people could be on this rock thing for a day or more. How would they eat, drink, and what if they fell? A shiver went through my lower back. Where there's a will, there is a way. But I say, if you got a will, there are many ways, said Sam. I seem to have cracked Sam up. So, may I ask how long have been climbing rocks? I was in the Marine Corps working for another country. We had a lot of training for this kind of thing. I noticed Sam did not disclose details of his involvement. But I was still getting better at my skills. At least, he had said something other than just asking about business things. I wondered if I could push his buttons and somehow get some more information about Pedra and Owen. You know I have just recently come to Mulberry, I said. 
No kidding. You do not know about this town, he said, pausing for a moment, but then most of the people in my workshop are like that too. So, no worries. Thank you, I said, getting up and adjusting my bag. Misty lifted her head out of the bag and uttered a disapp disapproving meow. I looked at her for a moment. She was agitated. She bared her fangs. I didn't know what I had done wrong. I shall certainly appreciate your continued guidance during this course. Okay, that is fine. That is what I am here for. You know I came here looking for my friend. Enrique. For a moment, I thought I spotted a recognition in his eyes. Or maybe I was mistaken. So, did you find him? He said, his face back to his poker face. Unfortunately, yes, he died here in the forest area. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. The police say it was an accident. But you know I convinced them otherwise. So, yeah, we will sort this out. Oh, really? How can you be sure it was not natural death? He asked. I mean, he was near a tree. Police say he was using drugs. But I cannot believe it. So you are telling me the police actually believed what you are saying? I mean, you are just a kid. I am 23. Yeah, but age is not the same as experience. And I would be surprised if Officer Jenny would take just an allegation seriously. I showed her something which she was missing. Like it was so obvious. The man was murdered. He had injections on both arms. A drug user cannot do that. You can either be a lefty or righty. Not both. Especially a drug user who is probably not in his senses most of the time. Right? Sam was listening to me carefully. Previously hidden wrinkles suddenly showed up on his aging face. Interesting that you found this out, he said. His chest heaved as I saw how he got back to his poker face in a minute. Well, I think you might be right. If you find anything else about this guy, discuss with me. I am uncertain if I knew him, though. His name is very common. I must have known at least a couple of Enriquez here. Thank you for being my sounding board. I appreciate it, I said. Sam could be a wonderful source. Source, considering most other people had been completely unhelpful around here. Misty hissed again, as if to get my attention. I wondered what it was. Maybe she hated the rocks and heights as much as I did. Chapter 12 I do not know what it was, but somehow my days at the shelter started slow, but then we always seemed to have a big bang. Misty and I fed the animals. At least I did while Misty roamed about the shelter, saying hi to all the inmates. And eating up spare morsels, which I had dropped by mistake. You are my good girl. Are you not? Cleaning up after me? I said, caressing the purring little furball. I had cleared up morning tasks till now, so now was my time to relax a bit. Just then, my phone rang. Hi, Riza, Jenny's familiar voice came on the phone. Hey, Jenny, I said. Did I startle you? No. Okay, a bit, I said. Seems like really early morning. Isn't it? It is not early in Mulberry. It is already 9.30 a.m., said Jenny. I wonder if you can come to the station. Oh. Everything okay? I asked. Well, something has turned up, and I thought you should know. I will be with you as soon as I can wind up my things here a bit. And bike on over to you. Wonderful. See you then. The phone clicked shut. Jenny was in a pleasant mood. That was odd. I wonder what had happened to her to call me up like that. As I parked my rusty old bike outside the station, my mind was going haywire. There had just been so many things going on here that it was hard to pin on a specific thing that could have made Jenny call me. I entered the room. 
Jenny was on the desk, talking on her landline. Yes, the lab confirmed it. It is the same substance. No, we haven't yet checked the prints, but we are on it already. Okay, I have a visitor, so we'll call you back as we make progress. Jenny returned the phone to its cradle. Hi, Risa. How are you? What's going on? I hope everything is okay. Did you find something? I asked. Well, yes, and maybe. Things are okay. Considering, of course, the two murders that just happened. Enrique's and Owen's. And maybe we found something. Owen was also murdered. See, I knew it. Jenny's color changed. I think she seemed embarrassed that she might have given some information out to me without reason. Oh, yes, well, there was a tampered rope involved. And Owen has climbed rocks and taken tourists around for a long time. I should not be telling you this, but you have been helpful in the past. Annoying, but helpful. Coming from you. Jenny. This is a genuine compliment. I should celebrate. Don't celebrate just yet. The reason I called you was that Pedra Gil has been arrested for the murder of Enrique Cruz. What? Oh, my goodness. So, does it mean I was right? I said. Well, someone located a bag with drugs in her room. The same type of injectables that killed Enrique. And she had a motive. Apparently, Enrique might have been trying to get her out of the policy as a benefactor. So Enrique contacted Owen for that and he talked with Pedra? Yes, that seems to be the case here. And then do you think she murdered Owen to ensure he didn't get part of the insurance? Don't you think that is rather odd? What part? Tell me, asked Jenny. The part about Pedra killing Owen. I mean, I am certainly not her biggest fan. But really, coming to think of it, she could not do that rock climb or plan the rope. Could she? I asked. Well, you were right about her being a suspect. The key evidence, in this case, was the case of the drugs that were discovered. So, that connects her to Enrique for sure. We are checking on the prince next. I hate to be the one negating you once again. But the puzzle seems to be still far from complete. How can you say that? That. Do you have evidence? Not really. It is just my gut feeling. Well, that is the difference between amateur sleuthing and actual police work, Riza. Real police work with hard evidence. Not gut feelings, not dreams, not hunches. I said nothing. So, that meant either Pedro was involved in Enrique's murder, or else someone else had planted that evidence. Without prints or any concrete proof, however, it would be impossible to find though. And if someone was this resourceful to frame Pedra for Enrique, they may have hit the jackpot as Pedra certainly was guilty, maybe not of murder, but at least of being in town. Wait, what? Jenny, if she were really in town for the murder, she would be here before he died, right? Yes, we have checked with Sam. She came to Mulberry a couple of days before. And so you think then she met him and maybe fought? And she overdosed him? Well, whatever the case, she knew he was here. And she did not come forward till I called her, said Jenny. I had to agree with Jenny. The lady certainly was shady. And a suspect. Prime or not. I could not say just yet though. For now, at least she was behind bars. If I could only get her to talk somehow. Hi there, I said. Pedro was sitting with her head down. She said nothing. Do you want to talk? I asked, trying to get her attention from across the table. She lifted her head up, teary eyes, swollen cheeks, faced me. What do you want to know? She asked. All my plans to ask her had come tumbling down. 
Her sad situation had blown away all the questions and doubts that I had in mind. Misty reassuringly meowed in my ear from my backpack. I really don't know where to start. And I know you are in a terrible state right now. But, if it is any help, I don't think you did it, I said. Pedra's eyes brightened a shade upwards. She took her flowing disarrayed hair in both hands and tried to clamp them behind her with an invisible clip. Clip. For a moment, the hair stayed there. And then it came back. I opened my backpack zipper and took out a spare hair clip. I pushed it across to her. She relaxed a bit. Took it. And clipped it in her hair. Thanks for that. No problem. So, where do I start? She said, adjusting herself to face me squarely in the eye. It always helps to start from the beginning. Okay. So, yes. Owen. He knew us. And he thought we were together. Apparently, Enrique was working here for some guy. And the person was very strict about regulations for whatever he shipped. Enrique contacted Owen for an insurance policy. But also, he wanted to change the beneficiary to his sister. So, Owen calls me up one day. And asks me if things are okay. And so I get to know what is happening. I ask him, where is Enrique? He did not tell at first. And then, she said. And then? I asked. Then he told me he is here. So, I come to meet him. But guess what? His phone number is not working. Something to do with signals around here. Two days later, I get a call from the police, he is dead. I sat up in my chair. That is one hell of an interesting story, I said. Misty muzzled against my neck, coming out from the backpack. Why should I believe it? Because it is what happened. Really? Trust me, she said. Misty hissed uncomfortably. What was going on with Misty? She was behaving weirdly. Several days had passed, and I had not gotten around to connecting with Misty. Misty. I decided perhaps I should try my connection with her again after I got free later tonight. And then you will tell me next that you did not know Owen was dead, too. Right? I asked. You know, I did not know about it. You were the one who told me about him, she said. Her eyes were pleading to convince me. I don't know about that. Aren't these a bit too many coincidences that you are here when Enrique gets murdered? And this is not some major town. It is a town next to a state forest on one a far corner of the state. And then the guy you claim told you to come here and could have murdered Enrique himself. He just one day falls off rocks using a rope, something he has been doing regularly in his life. And then a bag is found in your room with the same drugs and syringes with which Enrique was murdered. Yes, this all happened, but does it mean I am guilty? I know I am guilty of one thing, trying to find Enrique to convince him not to change the insurance from me being a benefactor. Fine, I am guilty of being selfish. But what do you expect? That policy was going to be the only nice memory that I had of this guy. This lunatic of a person. A madman who was obsessed with animals. It was too much for me to hear her rant. I took long breaths and focused on my heartbeat. Slowly, my pulse slowed down. Okay, but see, all this does not explain a lot of things. Like the bag. I don't know about the bag and the drugs. So, your prince will not show up on them, right? She did not reply. Look, I am trying to help you here, but you are not cooperating with the investigation. If you are honest with me, maybe I can put in a good word for you, I said. I hoped this would work. Even if this is true, if you did not put the bag in your room. Who else did? Who had access to the room? I don't know. I never locked my room when I went. 
There were other guests in the B&B when I arrived here. So, could be anyone, she said, looking down at her thighs. Her lips were sealed. She was not telling everything. I looked at Misty. Misty. She meowed an affirmation. Look, if you don't tell me everything, then I cannot do anything for you too. I got up. Pedra kept mum as I left the room. As I went outside, I passed towards the main room. Jenny was talking to someone. Where did you folks find it? Said the voice. It sounded rather familiar. Who could this be? We did not find it, Mr. Sam. The state police found it. They used it in a hit and run. Then apparently its engine collapsed a few hundred yards from the accident. The two suspects ran away abandoning it. This is awful. I hope I can get the insurance folks to fix it. With the local insurance guy Owen gone, I hope it's not such a hassle. Hi Sam, hi Jenny, I said as I came across the two in the main room. Hey, look who is here, said Sam, with a grim face. Risa, please take a chair. I will be with you in a couple of minutes, said Jenny. I took the cue and sat down on one side of the station next to the wall. Different clippings and aging wanted posters graced the notice board next to me. You can fill in this form. And we can hand over the truck to you. Truck? I asked. Both Sam and Jenny looked at me uncomfortably. Jenny said nothing. Which truck had been found? Wait, wasn't Enrique employed by someone here? If Sam had a truck, maybe he could help me out looking for other truckers here. The one Quinton had mentioned caused his fight with Enrique. I had a lot to think about. I needed meditation time to reflect on all these things. And, of course, connect with Misty. So, Riza, the reason I wanted to talk with you was that, well, the truck that was stolen from Mr. Sam a few days back. The perpetrators who ran off. Their description seems a lot like the two who attacked you. I have a picture from a security camera. I was hoping if you can tell me if they look familiar. Jenny pushed a large, printed black and white, blurry picture towards me. Even though it was blurry, the face faces were still quite clear. It was them. Definitely, I said, this one, his name was Upton, and this one was Dave. So, I am sorry they got away for now, but I am sure they will be caught soon. These people are just awful. If I find anything more, I will be happy to let you know. Thanks, I appreciate it, I said, so, these people stole the truck. Who was the driver before these people? If Enrique was the one, what if these two, you know, murdered him? That is an interesting point to think about. Mr. Sam employs temporary drivers for his business. I cannot really question him like that based on pure speculation, though. That would be wrong. And we don't even know who the driver was before them. This is not the only truck in town. And there are a lot of drivers passing through, said Jenny. I can understand. I was just hoping I could figure out something more about his murder. I think we can handle that properly. Your job as a civilian is just to hold on tight. If you find something else out, be sure to reach out to me. Okay? Yes, I got that, I got up. Misty was getting restless, and I had to take her back to my annex, the place Heidi had given me to stay on. As I passed outside, Sam had brought in a tow truck to pull the truck. I got a glimpse as it was going away, so took a quick snap. The truck looked strikingly similar to the one on Enrique's phone. As I boarded my bike, I looked on the side towards the main road. My heart sank. Just there were at least three white trucks like the one owned by Sam. Tea with milk and sugar, please, I said. The man presented the tray to me as I made myself a strong tea. With all these happenings, I had to think straight. And what better way to think straight than to take a cup of strong tea? So, how has Misty been doing? 
asked Dr. Odd. She has been doing great detective work. Haven't you, Misty? I played with Misty's ears. She purred back, back in affirmation. Lots of exciting happenings here in Mulberry, Heidi tells me, said Dr. Odd, looking towards Heidi. Yes, a lot. They are so many of them. I must make some sense out of them, though. Remember, Riza, this is the real world. Fiction doesn't have to make sense. But not the real world. Or maybe there is some higher purpose for things, but at least I cannot figure such things out on my own. Well, where do I start? We have Pedra Gill, who has been lying all along. And for all we know, is still hiding things. Yes, Pedra, she looked like a crook even the first time I saw her, said Heidi, knitting her way through. Heidi, yes you have a good pair of eyes, don't you? Said Dr. Faith. You found our dear Riza, too. Right? Yes, I did. I knew she was going to be with us the first time I saw her. So, Pedra, she might be lying. But it makes little sense for her to commit the crime, does it? Or am I missing something? I asked. Well, she certainly had a motive. She was going to be removed from the insurance policy, said Dr. Odd. Yes, and not only that, she had the opportunity. She got here and does not even have an alibi. Does she? Asked Heidi. Yes, but see, look at how the crime was committed. She certainly could not have done it on her own, even if she wanted. How did she pull him all the way to the place where he was found? Maybe she was working with Owen. And he would have helped her get away with the policy, too. Right? Oh, you are right. Risa, well done. But think it through again. Are you sure all pieces of the puzzle fit? Asked Dr. Odd. Some of them do. But I don't know if the others fit, I said, slowly playing with the knitting needles. I had learned from my two older companions in the club, and the first was going to be a sweater for Misty. I was much slower than the two. And then there is Sam's truck, right? Asked Heidi. Yes, I did not realize he had one, I said. Well, just having a truck means nothing. It is just like saying I, I had a house and in some houses, there are criminals. No correlation, Riza, said Dr. Odd. I know. Just had this gut feeling. And Misty, she has something against Sam, I said, don't you, Misty? Misty rubbed her soft head on my shoulder and purred. And where does Bob come in? We never figured out how he came to Mulberry. The only picture we found was on Enrique's phone. Oh, one minute, I have an idea, I said. I took out the phone and opened the two photos. The truck in Enrique's picture had a partial number plate visible. The left three digits were visible. I then opened the photo of Sam's truck. My eyes widened. These two are identical. I said. I must have said that a bit too loud. Misty slid into the backpack. The two ladies had stopped knitting and were looking at me, startled. I am sorry. It is just that the two trucks seem to be the same. If they are, then it is very interesting. So either Enrique was the last driver, or maybe he just took a photo of the animal. Still, it is something to investigate, right? Asked Heidi. Yes, that is what I am thinking. Maybe I should get a hold of Sam and ask him about this, I said. Yes, you should. I am sure it will clear up somehow, said Dr. Odd, oh and Risa, something else I thought you should know. Someone bailed Pedra out. Oh, that is interesting. Was it someone out of town? No, it was from around here. Who then? I said, sitting up straight. It was your old friend, Quinton, said Dr. Odd. Quinton Jackson. What were you doing with Pedra? How were you involved? Chapter 13 
It is a beautiful Wednesday, isn't it? I asked Misty. She purred and rubbed herself on my neck. She was sitting cozily in my backpack. This was the second class at Sam's rock climbing camp, and the fearless Riza was scared a bit once more. Luckily for me, Misty had officially become my rock climbing companion. The girl from the nook, Dana, was wearing a purple high neck shirt with jeans. Hi Dana, how are you doing? I asked. Hi, Risa. Um, should we be talking in public, considering, she said. Considering that you are my secret informant? Well, see, that is our internal arrangement. Right? And our external arrangement is that you are one of the few girls here who are my age. So, we can pose, can I say, acquaintances? I suppose that is possible. Okay, she said, looking deeply in front, her eyes a little squinted. You know, Dana, have you tried showing your eyes to a doctor? My eyes? My brother used to call me crazy eyes. Imagine that. Hmm. No, not really. We could never afford a doctor. I mean, we would only go if it was an emergency. And crazy eyes are not an emergency, she said, looking down. Well, you know something. Maybe I can ask someone I know for some help in that, I said. You would do that for me? She asked. Yes, why not? Well, I don't know. I mean, you barely know me. Why would you help me out? Because that is what I do. This is part of my religion. It means peace. And our prophet peace be upon him was always helping people out, helping animals out. So, don't worry about it. I shall get you to a doctor, whatever it takes. That is another thing that we do. When we make a promise, we keep it. Thank you so much. I cannot believe it, she said, a reddish tinge came on her cheeks as her eyes moistened with thankfulness. Don't mention it, really. If you two ladies are done talking and would like to pay attention, we have a very important topic for today, said Sam, in his usual authoritative voice, looking at both of us visibly annoyed. We giggled and then settled down. So, rock, rock climbing is all about surviving on the rocks. You live on the rocks. You imagine the rocks as your home. Now, rocks are a different type of world, Sam said. It was hard for me to focus. My mind was wandering. What had happened to poor Enrique? Who did it to him? Pedra, she was not good. But how did she do it? If you get stuck in some place, sometimes you must use whatever you have at your disposal. Like I have this pocket knife. Custom made with my logo on it. You can use it to get out of a situation. Say your car seatbelt is stuck and your car is about to get lit on fire or sink in water. You can use anything at all to get out. You just got a few minutes. What you do in those is what will determine the rest of your life. Or not. You can use a pocket knife to cut the belt. See, I can use it to cut anything, continued Sam, showing his custom knife. What was up with Pedra and Quentin Jackson? How did Quentin know Pedra? Why did he bail her out? My mind wandered on. My phone. Where is my iPhone? A shrill voice broke my solitary train of thoughts as I sat perched on the ground on a rock. Sam stopped and looked at the girl. What are you talking about? Young lady, his face twisted in a weird direction. Why don't you take care of your belongings? I do care about my things. It is a new phone. I just got it as a gift. Someone here must have taken it. When I asked you to sign up, I had two things in there. One, you must be an adult. Two, you handle your own things. You are an adult. So, please behave like one. Don't blame it on others said Sam. I am going to check every one of you. Do you know who I am? My father, the girl said, 
her fat cheeks turned red. We don't care who your father is. If you were a teenager, I would not have allowed you to join the camp without your father, said Sam. I closed my eyes. A veil came over me. My heartbeat sounded loud. I focused. Dub dub. Dub dub. Dub dub. My heart beat faster. Dub dub. Dub. Dub dub. I focused. Suddenly I connected. I was in the bag. I looked around. Wow. So many people. I jumped out of the bag. A girl was standing up. And shouting. The man pointed fingers back at her. What was it that this girl wanted? Focus. She wants what? Back on a rock near to where we were sitting, something glowed. I rushed towards it. Steering clear of people. Hands trying to touch me. Ah. What a cute kitten, I jumped away. I was getting near. It was there. A white thing. It was glowing in the blue light. I knew this was what the girl wanted. I went there. The thing was slippery, but I picked it up with my mouth, trying hard not to put my teeth into it. I moved back into the crowd. Quickly. I must do it quickly. No one should know. I came closer. Closer. The girl's shoes had one lace open. I hastened. I dropped the phone. And then, before anyone could notice, I merged in the crowd. Where was my owner? She was there. Sitting with her legs up. Head between them. I was there. I had to get to her. I slipped from under one pair of knees to another. Oh, what are you doing, you little one? I jumped back into my owner's lap. I woke up. My heart beating fast. Misty was in my lap. The girl had stopped screaming. She was holding her phone. You did a great job, Misty, I said into her ears as I petted her. Then I put her back into my backpack. So, now that we are back on the topic, said Sam, continuing with the class. The girl had sat down, looking down, her cheeks flushed with embarrassment as she played with her shiny little phone. I waited till the crowd cleared a bit for the break. Hey, Sam. How are you? That was a great class today. We learned a lot, I said. Thanks, Risa. Hope you folks learned. Now, it is soon going to be your time to practice after the lunch break, said Sam. Yes, I hope I can be better than last time. Yes, yes, you nearly fell off. Luckily, you had the rope. See, rock climbing is safe. I guess I will learn that over time, I said. Hey, I was wondering if I could pick your brain. You know at the station, I overheard you had a truck which was stolen and then found? Yes, I have a trucking business. So, those idiots. They stole it from me. I was wondering if you could tell me a bit. See, my friend. The one who died. He was here as a truck driver. Really? Well, there are so many of them here. They transport a lot of things. And come on over for a break or stay here. I hire a lot of temps. But I only hire reliable people. Let me show you a picture of my friend. Enrique, I said, opening the phone. See, here he is. I opened the picture of Enrique with the I.I. and the truck. I looked at Sam's face. Sam's face turned red. Hey, I know this guy. He was my driver for some time, he said. Really? When was that? This guy. See, look, what is that thing in my truck? Said Sam. That proves it. I knew he was doing a side business. There were scratch marks in my truck twice. I had to get it fixed. So, I fired him. Oh really? That is Bob, and I, I, I said. 
You fired him? When? He was with me for a few days. That and the man was an addict. Oh, I remember. My bellboy Wilbur told me he saw him once with drugs. Sleeping like he had not a single worry in the world. He was late that day. I am telling you, he was no good. My heart sank. How could this be? I knew Enrique was better than that. You know you should meet Wilbur. He will tell you about it. Today, when we go back. I might give you a lift. That would be so kind of you. Okay, we'll ask him, I said. Just a minute. Let me get Wilbur for you, said Sam. Wilbur, can you please come to the front desk for a minute? Yes, sir. I am coming, said Wilbur, holding a stack of tissue paper boxes. I am sorry for keeping you waiting, was just finishing up lunchtime chores. Wilbur, do you recall that Hispanic person we had as a driver? Asked Sam. Yes, Enrique. Sure, said Wilbur. Well, well, tell Miss Riza, whatever she wants to know about him, said Sam, oh, and then you can meet me with the guest list whenever you get free. Sure, sir, said Wilbur. Yes, ma'am. How can I help you? Tell me about him, I said. Be frank, please. Sam has told me some things already. So, you don't have to worry. Ma'am, I know he has another business, trucking. But I really know little about it. Some of these people, the drivers. We give them spare rooms at the B&B. So, Enrique was one of the many drivers. Oh, okay. So, there are others. Yes, there are. Although when I check them in, they are not listed as employees. See, Sam deals with the money himself. I just check people in and do the chores here. There are other employees, too. We come and go. Everyone works as the master pleases. Or he calls us whenever there are tasks. We are very grateful to him. As I told you, it is hard to find a job that pays well here. Oh yes, you told me earlier on. So, tell me more about Enrique. You know, one day, I just went into his room. He looked fast asleep. And on his side, there was this bag. There were drugs in them. Do you know? Syringes or something. Oh really? So, what did you do? I told the boss. Boss was unhappy. And the next day, Enrique was gone. I am assuming he checked out. Or if he was a driver. I think he was fired. I can only recall this much, Mississippi. Misty purred. The man was telling the truth. Okay, thank you. And if you recall anything else. Anything at all. Maybe you can come to the animal shelter. I work there. Okay, miss. If I can think of anything, I will certainly tell you. I went to get my bike. Two white trucks were parked next to it. One of them was the truck that Enrique drove. I stood by it. Looking at it. Suddenly, Misty was restless. As if she felt something. Something. I sat down on one side of the truck, hidden from view by the other truck. I raised my legs and closed my eyes. Dub dub. Dub dub. Heartbeat. Focus. I sank deeper. I jumped out of the bag. My owner was sitting in her favorite position. I looked at the two white things. They were huge. But one of them. It had a glow. The blue glow. Oh, I knew what it was. I had seen this glow last time when I was with my owner at that place. Near the water and mountains. I skipped to the place. I jumped. It was hard. I was tiny. I looked at the side. There was a ledge. I jumped on the tire. And then the ledge. Then I jumped to the side. The window was open. I looked in the truck. 
There it was. The blue glow. It was under the mat. I jumped down inside. Smells hit me. I felt many people. A struggle. That man my owner knew. I lifted the mat. It was a piece of white paper. I took it. My owner will figure out what it was. Misty, good girl. Did you find this for me? I said, looking at the white paper. The paper was computer paper with a set of numbers printed. I recalled seeing something like that in my computer security class. But that made no sense. It could also be a printout of random characters, which the printer prints when tested. How was this important? When Misty and I connected in my Marakaba, things were different. But it was difficult for me to figure out when I was myself back again. As much as I hated to admit, Sam might have been right. All the evidence did point to Enrique taking the drugs. And then what about Pedra? How did she have the drugs with herself? She had a motive. And what was her connection with Quinton? Quinton, the ruffian tr truck driver who fought with Enrique. I decided I needed to talk with both. It would not be easy. Pedra has a history of lying and Quinton, well, he could be rather intimidating. Also, I didn't really know where these two were. I had to find out more information. Maybe Dana could help. I rode my bike to the Crook's Nook. The hills and trees were a shade cooler than the last time. What a difference a few days make. The weather had changed, but so had I. I was no longer the Riza that was new to this town. Many people had gotten to know me. Heidi's shelter had an extensive set of visitors, people looking for pet companions from her home for lost animals. I had gotten better at knitting as well. Thankfully, my first intended customer was with me all the time. Aren't you with me always? Misty? Misty purred comfortably, enjoying the ride from my backpack. Hey, how are you doing? I asked. I am good. How about yourself? Dana said. I have a surprise for you, I said. What? Tell me about it, please. Well, I talked with my friend, and she wants to fund treatment and operations for your eyes. You are joking, right? Not at all. She has even given me contact information of a senior doctor at UMass. I am going to set up an appointment and you can take a bus there. She hugged me. Thank you so much, Riza. You are so kind. I never had a sister. But I feel like that for you. Hey, you know what? You can always call on me for help. Think of me as your big sis. I said. Thank you. Really, she said, Riza, tell me if you need any help in that case of yours. Oh well, first you need to get out of this business of being the guard for these people. Drug users need to get treated. And you know I would never tell on you. But this is illegal. If you get caught defending them like this, you can end up in jail. I know. It is just that all of them give me five bucks each to be the lookout for police or any other trouble. And, and I don't know of anything else to do. We will figure something out for you. You just need to get out of it as soon as possible. Thank you. So, tell me, is there anything that I could do for you? There is one thing. Dana had been helpful. I planned to catch Pedra and Quinton. I reached the location she had given me exactly at 5 p.m. Who is it? Pedra said, behind the door. I kept knocking. She opened the door. Oh, it is you. What do you want from me now? You know what I want. Can I come in? I asked. She waited for a moment, eyeing me. Okay, come on in. Thank you, I said. The room was musty and fitted with cheap upholstery. It was a cheap roadside motel on the road to the town next to Mulberry. So, how did you find me? Asked Pedra. The real question is, 
Why did Quinton bail you out? I asked. Aha, so you know, she said. Was this some sort of secret? I asked. No, I did not mean that. But yeah, I had kept it a secret. Would you care to elaborate? I asked, insisting. I suppose it does not hurt now to tell you, she said, sitting down on a chair. Why don't you have a seat, then? I sat down on the sofa, facing her. So, tell me. Okay, so a long time back, I used to do drugs. Long time ago? I asked. Yes, I left them. Enrique helped me. And then when he was not there. You found Quentin? I asked. Please let me finish. If after I do that, you don't agree, then call me anything. Okay. Continue, I said. After, Enrique got busy with his animals. And we separated. I wanted to keep clean. Enrique had enrolled me in N.A. So, this is where I met Quinton. And I swear he has been nothing but a big brother to me. So, why did Quinton and Enrique actually fight? They fought because Quinton asked Enrique to be back. Be back. He saw him here. And there was some other issue too. So, it was because of the other issue they fought. But then he recognized Enrique. He asked him to go back and support me so I don't get back into drugs. Enrique told him he had more important things to do. So, yes, they fought. So, Enrique, he did not come back to you? No, and I don't blame him. I was too hard on him. And we were done. I actually appreciate him for even letting me be in his insurance policy until now. Why did you not tell me about this when we met earlier? It was not my call. I called Quinton when I was totally sure that I would be convicted. Quinton was my alibi, as I was in the N.A. meeting. Normally, it is all anonymous, but of course, it just happened that we knew each other from our previous meetings. I still do not understand something, though. If he was your alibi when Enrique was murdered, why did you not tell me, then? See, let me explain. Quinton did not want his brother to know he had been doing drugs and had been in N.A. So, I could not tell you without asking him. But since I was going down, if I did not get him in, I had to call him. Jenny agreed to not tell the name of the bailing party to her boss, his brother. And she has verified all my claims. If you are not sure, just ask her. I was not sure what to believe anymore. My theories had all come tumbling down. I have thought about it, I said. I have given it a lot of th thought. Well, why are you keeping us waiting, then? Asked Dr. Odd, come on, now. Remember, we are the senior folks around here. Yes, tell us please, said Heidi, straining her eyes over her glasses. I am getting to it. It is just that there is so much to think about and say, I said. Let's start from the beginning. Just the facts. We know Enrique has been around here. He had a fight with Quinton and was working with Owen to change his insurance. Pedra has an alibi via Quinton and the N.A. meeting. Also, Sam employed Enrique for his tasks although he was fired because of some relationship with drugs. We also know Pedro was involved in drugs. But she could not have killed Enrique. Or Owen. Victor Parsons, well, he is shady. He is looking for the I.I. I have not told him yet. So, he is connected. Also, what do we don't know yet? Why was Owen killed? We do not know how Enrique ended up with the I.I. That is a lot of information. A lot of suspects, said Dr. Odd. How about the two criminals? Asked Heidi. Oh, yes, I forgot about them. They were involved in the truck theft. They could have done the murder too. But only Enrique. I can't think of a connection with Owen, though. Yes, but we don't know if the two murders are related, do we? 
asked Dr. Odd. Well, by the looks of it, they are not connected. But think about it. Owen and Enrique were dealing with an insurance issue. And everything in this town goes haywire with this. We have several town players moving and shaking. There must be some reason Owen got murdered. But if this was not planned, the murderer must have done it without planning. Right? I asked. Yes, he must have, said Heidi. I don't know what I am missing, though. I wonder if the police have made any progress, I said. You can always try asking, or maybe snooping around the station. Right? Said Heidi. Yes, true. Now, overall, who are the suspect suspects? Who are no longer suspects? First would be Quinton, then Pedra. And then we have some left, which are the two criminals, and Victor Parsons, I said. But how will you convince Jenny to go for Victor? Asked Dr. Odd. I had bad luck with that last time I tried. Apparently, the huge business ventures that Victor has, his jewelry store and all things, he has a lot of influence here. Good luck to you if you want to start a witch hunt against him without something concrete. Now, at least one thing we can do is, to see if they have any alibis at the times of murder, I said, like where was Mr. Parsons at the time of the two murders? And how about the two criminals? Yes, but you know, when we solve puzzles, we first open the puzzle up. Then we critically analyze all aspects. Only then does the puzzle becomes our friend. Then the solution comes out. So, ask yourself. Have we asked all questions? Or is there anything we ignored? Asked Dr. Odd. Well, there are a few sets of people left, of course. I would not count Officer Jenny as a suspect. And then there is Sam, of course, or even us. But see, he is on our side, anyway. And Larry, he runs the key shop here, I said. Yes, adding everyone as a suspect, that would mean even the three of us are suspects, too. Think about it. Said Heidi, chuckling. Yes, that would not restrict our case to exclude Alice or Wilbur, right? Said Dr. Odd. I agree, but in artificial intelligence, we have the Occam's razor, I said. Oh, that sounds deadly. Said Heidi. Is that something to do with killer robots? Ah uh, yes, Occam's razor. I shall let Riza explain, said Dr. Odd. No, not deadly. That means we should go for the simplest plausible hypothesis, I said, although there may be two types of simplest. One would be simplest, which is apparent but is not the case. The simplest path would be the one that shows the right answer. Am I right, Faith? Yes, you explained correctly. Causality or cause and effect are the key, said Dr. Odd. So, in our case, the cause would comprise two things, motive and capability. So, our suspects, such as Pedra, might have a motive, but she might not have been capable of murdering Enrique. Likewise, Owen, his motive might be there if he could get Pedra to help. But Victor and the two criminals, we know nothing about the motive. For none of the other suspects. Like if we considered Alice or Sam or Wilbur or Larry or even us as suspects. Right? Asked Heidi. So, we need a plan. Something to draw the snake out of the nest, said Dr. Odd. And I forgot to mention something. Don't know if it is important to our case though, I said. Bob, you know, the I.I. When he first came, and I cleaned him up. He had a collar around his neck. And there was something under it. After he was stolen and caught again, guess what? That collar is gone. Do you think collar could hold something? Asked Heidi. Something important or valuable? Yes, I think so. And if I check on Victor, maybe I can try to get him out of his nest somehow. Assuming, of course, our hypothesis is correct. Well, there is the only way to find out, right? Yes, we need a good plan, then. Did you look at the weather forecast? Asked Alice. 
Not really. What about it? I asked. There seems to be something big coming up, said Alice, wrinkles on her face getting emphasized. How big is big here? I asked. When it comes here, big can be huge. Should we be concerned? The issue is the animals. We didn't design the shelter to withstand severe weather. It was more of a makeshift. Normally, we are not at full capacity. But this time around, with all the exotic animals, we could be in big trouble. So that means I must check what is coming up. Up. Right? Yes, please check and plan. I don't want to be caught up with flash floods. Flash floods? Do they happen here? Riza, this place is next to the state forest. And yes, we have had flash floods in the past. I did a quick check of the weather. Alice, you were right. Severe weather alerts are coming up in around a five-hour window. Oh no, what do we do now? Said Alice. Where do we move the animals now? On such short notice. Maybe I can ask around in town for some help? Should I? Yes, go ahead. Get whatever help you can. Hi, Wilbur, I am here to meet Mr. Sam, I said. Yes, miss, he shall be with you in a minute, said Wilbur. Hi there, oh look who is here, said Sam, chuckling. Hi Sam, I hope I did not come in at a busy time. Well, we are always busy. So, that is all right. I was wondering if we can use your trucks for moving the animals for the upcoming thunderstorm. Sure, go ahead. If you need help, Wilbur can be with you too, said Sam. That is really very kind of you, I said. The animals started making loud noises a few hours before the storm hit full swing. Wilbur, Alice, and I had moved the animals to a big shed near the hills. The light was gone now. And flashes of thunder and lightning were coming every few seconds. Misty was disturbed. I felt her snuggle close to me in my lap. Alice was pacing around from one corner of the shed to the other. She was murmuring something. Alice, is everything okay? I asked. Huh, said Alice. She was completely focused on the animals. And I was not sure what was disturbing her. Alice, please tell me what is wrong. She stopped pacing. Risa, do you know how many animals do we have in total? Yes, I have the number. We have 110 guests with us as of today. Well, how long is the storm going to continue? Weather says, wait, three days? I said, my God, how can we manage 110 animals in this shelter for, th for three days? Yes, that is the problem. And you know it is not just survival. Animals need food too. And cleaning. You are already aware of these. And did we bring along the food? No, we didn't. Rather, we could not even bring it even if we had tried. See, that is what I am worried about now. We don't have the faintest glimpse of sun expected before 73 hours. Oh, you are right, I said. My heart sank. And Risa, do you recall, some of these animals are special needs? And remember, seven of them are injured? Oh yes, this is a tough set of issues. I can see why you are disturbed. Alice kept quiet and started pacing the shed again. I pulled up a blanket over Misty and me. It would not be an easy set of days. The shed door banged. Is that the storm, or is it someone knocking on the shed? Asked Alice. I am not sure. Let me check. I got up, slowly placing sleeping Misty down in the blanket. The storm had picked up its pace now. I unlocked the shed door. A figure stood in the dark. Who is it? I shouted. The figure came towards me. At first, I hesitated. Then I stepped back. Ah, the voice said. Who are you? And what are you doing here right now? In this storm? I asked the person. 
Wait, let me get normal, the voice said. As I closed the shed door again, the intruder said, It is me, Riza. Marine, what are you doing here? Oh my god, I said. Marine was shivering as she removed her raincoat. Riza, I thought I would give you a surprise, Marine said. Who is this? Do you know her? Asked Alice, shining an emergency light on Marine's face. Yes, Alice, this is my best friend Marine. And Marine, this is Dr. Alice. She runs a shelter here for animals. I think I told you about her and the shelter on the phone, right? Aha, Alice, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Marine, said Alice. Did I pronounce it correctly? You can call me anything, Alice, said Marine. Marine. Marine, what are you doing here? Well, I told you I wanted to surprise you. Okay, but really. Mulberry is not like a major city like Boston that you just come here. And that too in a storm? Yeah, I know. But you know me well too. I just decided that I was going to see you. And then, of course, the storm happened. Okay, but how did you find me? And in this weather? Well, I had booked a room at Sam's B&B. I booked in advance after your experience with him. So, he told me about you and the shed. I didn't want to stay there, so the bellboy dropped me in the truck. Okay, that is a very scary story. I mean, I am royally shocked. What if you got stuck or lost? But I didn't. Did I? Said Marine. You really are too much, I said. So are you, Riza. I am sure if I was in a similar situation, you would have done something even wilder. Like jump off a helicopter without a parachute or something. Oh Marine, you know me too well, I am afraid, I said, laughing out loud. Chapter 14 What is wrong? Asked Alice. It is Misty, I said. What happened to her? She asked. She is very disturbed. I don't know what is going on. As if something is bothering her, I said, I have tried to comfort her, but nothing is working. Alice looked at me, trying to console the restless kitten. I hope she did not eat something bad. That could be an issue. Well, I just gave her milk and cat food. Nothing out of the ordinary. Cats will not ask you before eating whatever they like. Oh no, I just recalled. She has been taking morsels from the leftover food for the shelter animals. Things were still dark in the shed. So, it had not been possible for me to separate the various foods for the various animals. I was wondering if Misty had taken something from one of the cans. Misty was used to eating cooked food. She couldn't handle raw meat. And most of the animals did not even touch anything co cooked. Maybe I could try connecting with her. I closed my eyes and started meditating. I started slowly. Dub dub. Dub dub. Then deep, deeper. A wall. Something blocked me. I got up. Something was stopping my connection with Misty. This was not good. I had been so busy talking with Marine that I had lost focus. And now Misty had eaten something bad. Luckily for us, and too bad for the forecasters, the storm cleared up the next day. It took us a day to move the animals back to the shelter. Misty's condition was better now, but I still could not connect with her. Every time I tried to connect, a wall came between us. It was disturbing both of us. I fell on my bed dead tired. Having said my evening prayers with low energy, I recited verses for protection and meditated lying down. I was on a mountain. There were people around flying in white dresses. They greeted me as I walked. Then a forest. Dark trees, thorns, the sky turned black. Then I saw it. It was shaped like a woman. She was sitting under a tree. Her graying, thin hair was in disarray. She did not turn towards me. 
but I heard her voice. Why? Why have you come here? What do you mean, and who are you? I asked. This is our place. This is our land. We live here and flourish. You are not supposed to come. But who are you? What are you? I asked, I am up to good only. No good can come here. We are evil and you will fail, her voice echoed. Well, I am here now, and you are powerless in front of the good. I moved closer to her. She did not move. Her hands were playing over what looked like a thread with knots. I stood on the other side. Show me your face, I said, focusing on my heartbeat and the recitation of the name of God from my heart. I lifted her cloak from her face. I woke up. Something evil was trying to disturb me and disrupt my connection with Misty. Hi, Mr. Parsons, I said in the camera. Who is it? Oh, it is you, said the voice. The gate opened slowly. I recalled how it was last time, time. And the feeling was still eerie. I went inside. I walked towards the house slowly, thinking about what I had to say. Come on in, the voice said, as I was about to knock on the door. The door was open. I went inside. The room was brightly lit. A magnificent chandelier shone in the center. Somehow, I had not noticed it before. The wooden floor creaked as I trod towards the center. There were three chairs there, each with plush red cushioned backs. The area was dark, but someone was sitting there. Victor Parsons apparently had company today. Whoever they were, they were busy talking with each other and did not turn. So, what do you have for me? The voice said, coming from the side. It startled me. Victor was standing on the left. Tell me. If Victor was standing, then who was in the chairs? The people in the chairs noticed me. They turned to look at me. On two sides sat the two men who had attacked me. In the middle chair sat an old woman with gray hair. Oh, it is you. The man on the left side said. He got up and turned to face me fully. The second man on the right also got up. Boss, this is the girl. Victor stared at me. Are you sure? He asked. How can we forget, boss? Said the man on the left. You are saying this girl single-handedly beat both of you while first hanging from a rope? Asked Victor. Both kept quiet. Yes, that is how it went, right, fellas? I asked, chuckling. I didn't feel any need to not disclose my encounter to Victor anymore. Oh, and did they tell you about the broken bones? The men's faces turned red. They looked down. Very interesting. Maybe I should hire her instead of you two, then. I can pay her for one person and will still be better than the two of you, said Victor. I am sorry for what these idiots did to you. But I am not sorry for you teaching them a lesson in the school of hard knocks. So, what do you have here? Brave girl asked Victor. Should I share it here? I asked. Okay, okay, you two. Go to your room. The two looked at each other sheepishly and left. I noticed the third person did not move. She was looking at me amusingly. There was something oddly familiar about her. Where had I seen her? I could not figure it out. Okay, so enlighten us, said Victor. Well, the I, I you were looking for? The animal? Yes, tell us about it. He is back. Only. Only what? Asked Victor, his voice loud with impatience. Only that I don't even know if it is important to you. Don't keep us waiting. Tell me, he asked, insisting. I mean well when he was not here, he had this collar. Now that he is back, it is gone. What? That collar, I mustn't just get the animal, but everything else, too. That collar, too. Well, I don't know where it is 
but I can ask the person who found the animal where he last caught it. Then maybe we can know its location. Yes, you got to find it. If you want your 500 bucks. You got to find this information for me. What is your name, young lady? Asked the old woman. Have we met before? She had been quiet till now, observing our interaction. A chill went through my spine. I could not forget this voice. This was the voice of the woman I had seen last night. I am Riza, and I don't think we have met. Or maybe you came to the shelter. I work there. I said. Strange that I feel otherwise, she said. What about yourself? Maybe if I get to know you, I can see where we met? I asked. The woman gazed at me. We will see about that. Victor? She said, turning to face Victor. Yes, my lady, said Victor. Shall we continue? She asked. Yes, of course, said Victor. He turned to me. Girl, you can go now. Let me know what you find. Wherever the locket was lost, just tell me the location. No need to go there yourself. You will get your 500 bucks and you need to forget about whatever you know, or even think you know, about this business. Clear? Oh, okay. Thank you, sir, I said. I turned to leave. About those, those two monkeys. I will not spare them. And they won't cause any trouble for you. I appreciate it, I said as I left the room. So, this is rather strange, is it not? I asked. Yes, Riza, you need to be careful with this sort of people, said Marine. You know, I just cannot tolerate people who do bad things and hurt others for no reason. Right? I said. Yeah, I've known you since you were a baby. Oh right, you never grew up, she said. I placed a quick light-hearted tap on her back, yeah, yeah. As if you have grown up, I said. Well, who is still afraid of blood? Asked Marine, rolling her eyes. Okay, but fine. I don't like or tolerate blood or doom or death. And by the way, the only reason you can do that is that you draw blood for a living. Only for helping them. It is not like I store or drink the blood taken for test samples. Dear Riza, this is not what a phlebotomist does. TSK TSK Little child, said Maureen. If you were not a professional, then I would have asked you. Honestly, I cannot tolerate the sight or smell of blood. Yeah, well then, why exactly are you the one who is trying to be an amateur sleuth? Murder investigation and all. It is needed. I must make Enrique's spirit rest peacefully. And Miss FBI intern? Okay, failed FBI intern. Fine. Yes, I like to investigate. Does not mean I want to deal with gore or something. So if you are such a pacifist, why not just take this case to the police, that lady you were telling me about, Jenny? Jenny will do nothing till she has evidence stored in her locker room. And you are telling me this as if this was a bad thing? No, no, I meant she does not even start an investigation before every clue is there. Still, I would call it the even-headed approach. And yours, the light-headed approach. So, I know you are going to go ahead with the plan. Whether or not I say anything, I know you. So, let's see, what do you have in mind now? I told you about the lady and Victor Parsons. Right? Yes, vaguely. Although I don't see how this is a plan? Well, well, trust me on this. I have a plan. Okay, for your sake, I hope it works. Are you nervous? I asked. Yes, a bit, said Dana. Don't know what will happen. Don't you worry, sweetie. The doctor will figure it out, said Marine. Yes, just look out the window. New England is so amazing this time of the year, isn't it? I said. Yes, I love the weather, said Dana. Hey, how old are you? Worry lines are permanent. 
So, be careful here, said Marine. We'll be twenty-one this year, said Dana. Twenty-one is no age to get wrinkles because of worrying. Dana smiled. She had agreed to go to the doctor at first, but had been reluctant when we got the appointment. Heidi had been so kind to not only arrange the appointment, but also get us a ride with George. That was not too bad, was it? I asked. No, not bad. I was just scared, said Dana. I have a surprise for you, I said, turning towards Marine. Will you do the honor? Marine got up and brought a kennel from the car. The wind blew encouragingly as she brought the kitten out. Oh, my God. You didn't, said Dana, her face beaming with excitement as she held the little furry companion. Now is the time for the tough decision, I said. Ah. Nothing is tough with this little cutie with me, said Dana. Misty purred with excitement in my lap. It had been several days since we had connected. She was fine with me physically. But whenever I meditated and tried to connect with her, a wall appeared. Well fine, but you need to name her, right? Or she will never know her own real name, laughed Maureen. Let me see who you are. You know I should call you Tinkerbell. Because you are magical and all. And have this golden mane, said Dana, lifting the little kitten. Oh, you are so adorable. Thank you so much, Riza. For everything. Everything. For her, for the doctor. Her eyes moistened. No one has done anything for me, ever. Well, this is nothing. It is in my religion. To help people. Because we believe in an afterlife. The more we help people, the more successful we will be there. So, if I helped you, maybe I am just helping myself. Dana gave me a hug out of the blue. I never had a big sister. Thank you for filling a void I never knew I had. I hugged her back. Don't mention it. It is my pleasure. Now, come on. Wipe those shiny eyes and let's do something which I am always scared to do. We are climbing? She asked me. Only you two. Not me, said Marine. Oh, wow. So, I found your point of fear, I said. Yeah, we all know how Riza would take a day's long bus trip rather than fly. Okay. I am still scared of heights. But this is for Enrique, I said. So, where are we going, Riza? Asked Dana. I will show you, I said. Marine, will you join us? Only to the place where it does not require me to climb. Okay, fine, I said. Misty, do you want to go with me? Misty was behaving strangely again. She was restless. Maybe you can leave the two kitten friends with me. I don't mind, said Marine. As long as they cuddle with me while we wait for you too. The climb that we took was a medium level. Something quite more advanced than I would have taken with my few climbs till now. But I had to see for myself. Owen had been killed on this climb. And the place had only been unsealed just yesterday. I had to be in the same place as Owen to connect with the place. The first part was not bad. There were ropes in place. I am guessing one of them was the one that had broken. But they must have removed it as evidence. I climbed only to the first ridge. Dana joined me on the ledge. There was just enough space for the two of us there. I closed my eyes and meditated. The wind blew. It felt I was going to fall. Powerful gusts. Enrique. Owen. I saw him pull Enrique from a truck. There was someone with him. They were talking. I overheard. The locket, did he let that animal, animal out? All of them? What do we do? Then I saw it. Owen falling. Victor. I tried hard. A gust of wind. Risa, wake up, said Dana. You are going to fall off. So, how did it go? 
asked Maureen. She dozed off, said Dana. Oh really? I can't even imagine sleeping after imagining rock climbing. And how can you sleep there? On some rock or ledge or something? Asked Maureen. I was just trying to calm down. And absorb the environment. And think about what was going on, I said. Think about what? Like the news? What was going on in the world? Or something else? Asked Dana. Just think about what was going on around me. That is all, I said. Why are you blushing then? Riza, I have known you since you were little. And you blush every time you are embarrassed, said Maureen. Yes, yes. And what else do you know about me? I asked. That you can become embarrassed for the weirdest reasons, said Maureen, laughing. So, tell me, did you find anything out about the man who was killed? Asked Dana. Not sure, but I saw something, I said. You are psychic, aren't you? Asked Dana. I wish I was, I said. She definitely is, said Maureen, chiming in. I have seen it so many times. Like this one time, we had a theft. And the police investigated and all. So, she was ten, I think. I still remember my mother's expressions. Riza just touched one item left by the thieves. And then sat down. She told the exact method of the theft. From where they entered. What they did. And the interesting thing was. This was the first time she had come to our place. And that is how I met her. Did they find out who did it? Asked Dana. Yes, that is a whole new story. She is part amateur sleuth and part psychic. And even though I am the older one, somehow I end up being her sidekick, said Maureen. Not really. She is the one who guides the investigation. Especially if it is food-related, I said. Maureen punched me. Do I even look like I love food? Yes, you are so blessed. You can eat anything, and it does not show. Not at all. Just look how many parathas you have when Auntie cooks them. And she thinks I ate half of them, I said. Yes, what is life without Mama's partha? What is a partha? Sorry, I do not know, asked Dana. Partha is like bread or pancake, of sorts. We make it with flour and sometimes in layers. If done well, as Auntie does it, it can be crunchy and satisfying with a strong milk tea, we call it chai, I said. Oh, my mouth is already watering for this part of the thing, said Dana. Well, don't worry. I shall make one for you. And five for my sweet Marine, I said. Marine nudged me again. Five? I only eat two. Especially if they have potatoes in them. Oh, you two are really making me crave this thing. Now, what do we do here? Asked Dana. Well, let's feast. I brought some nice homemade kebabs and sandwiches. We sat down and enjoyed the beautiful scenery as I took out the lunchbox. The sounds of the flowing river surrounded us. The fall mulberry air was welcoming. Still, something inside was making me cautious. It was like the calm before the storm. Something was coming my way. And I was not sure if I could handle it. I could not share what I had seen with these two and did not want to destroy their mood. I had always investigated mysteries and solved so many that I have lost count. But they were very simple ones. Like missing cats, dogs, stolen goods, and, of course, the most common ones included who took my ice cream from the fridge. Yes, most times, the culprit was Marine. It did not even take an investigation to find this out. I still needed a saner set of ears to discuss what I had found. I think I need to attend a meeting at the Odd Knitting Club. So, so, Riza, what happened out there? Asked Heidi. We went to the rock where Owen's death took place. And I thought I should see what I could find there. Oh, and what did you find then? 
asked Dr. Faith. Well, I thought about the entire incident. And well, I used my gut feel, I said. I really didn't want to appear like a psycho to these fine ladies. My meditation and psychic experiences and all. So, better give them a logical statement. I feel there is a connection between the locket and the animals. The picture with Enrique and I. I. Well, you need to find the connection, though. The police will do nothing until they have evidence. Hard evidence. Or a statement. And do you even know who it is? Asked Heidi. Victor was involved. I can feel it. I mean, he is the one who was looking for the I.I. If I go to the police and then show them the picture, maybe they will start looking at him, I said. Be careful here, Riza. Victor has contacts and has a lot of stakes in this town. If you go after him, you have to be sure. You are an outsider here. I mean, we love you here. But if you go against him, it will not be easy. The issue is that there is still nothing connecting him directly with the murder. Fine, he is looking for the animal. And he is interested in a locket. Enrique had the animal. That might even substantiate Enrique as a bad guy. If he were considered stealing the animal for the locket, whatever it was worth and then the drugs, already substantiated by the bellboy, right? Said Dr. Faith. You are right. I cannot go to the police just yet. Maybe I have to set a trap. If I can somehow get him to come for the locket. Maybe that would work, I said. Well, you need to be careful. You know he is a big man. He has helpers and with no help, you can be in big trouble with him. In case he is the guy, guy, said Heidi. Yes, I must think of a way to solve this. Maybe. Maybe if I don't do it alone, I said. That sounds wonderful. If you have someone strong with you. Maybe this would not be a problem, said Dr. Faith. As I left the club on my old rusty bike, my mind was clouded. I need to find someone. Who could it be? Wait, how about Sam? He has always been very helpful. Eccentric, annoying, but helpful. And he was interested in helping me with the investigation. I could try him. Hey Riza, what is happening? Said Sam, fumbling with something under the front desk. These helpers, they always forget things here. So, tell me. I was wondering if I could get you to go on a climb. I mean, I am trying a new place. I heard it is steep, I asked. Which one are you going for? Asked Sam. I think it is called the Cider Rock, I said. Oh, that one. Yeah, it can be rather tough for fresh climbers. The first part of the climb is by a rope. So, not bad. But after the first 15 feet, there is a ledge. And then there is a steep climb of around 30 feet. We do it without a rope. It is actually something we do in mentoring. To go up the scale, he said. Interesting that you are aiming for it. Yes, I thought it might be nice to practice. I know I could not do it on my own. Probably could do the rope part. But not the one without it. So, I thought I should get your help. Okay, when do you want to do it then? Would tomorrow be a good day? I asked. Okay. Then let's plan for it, he said. Sounds great. We'll coordinate with you then, I said. Okay. Take care, he said. I left the BNB and went for my bike. I knew this was an unsafe place to be, but with Sam, I was hoping this would be fine. Now I had to set the next part of the plan in motion. And this was the tricky part. So, so, what are you telling me? Asked Victor. I am saying they found the eye I near a cliff. This place, to be exact, I said, showing the location on the map. That is a steep climb, is it not? He said. I know little about it, sir. 
I am just doing what you asked me to do, I said. Just looking to earn some bucks. Well, I need to think this through first. Okay, you will get your money by tomorrow, as it is late now. I will check the place out. If I find something, you get your thing. Victor had seemed to take the bait. I needed to get him alone and maybe try to get a confession. I had installed the voice recorder. Things seemed to look up for me now. I could handle Victor. And if there was a problem, I had Sam as a backup. I didn't think I could share my plan yet with Maureen and Dana, though. They would say it was too dangerous. Heidi and Dr. Faith had approved of the general idea. Maybe that was because they had not seen the Cider Falls. Looks like I was going to get rid of my fear of heights once and for all, somehow. Chapter 15 Reza dear, there is a package for you, said Alice. Oh really? I was waiting for it, I said. You can sign here, said the delivery man. Thanks, I said. The package felt nice and light. The box was sturdy. I opened the package up. Oh wow. This looks like the real thing. I had heard of 3D printing, but this replica is really awesome, said Heidi. She was here for some routine work. You sure about what you are going to do, kiddo? It is actually not the same. There is a little secret something inside that I had my friend at MIT install. Anyway, I have to try it. Victor is looking for it. I want to see what he is looking to get. And if I can somehow, gently or not so gently ask him what he has done with Enrique, maybe we can find out something from him. I just need to make this look a little used so he can believe it's real. Sure, go ahead, nothing a little machining cannot do. I am sure, said Heidi. Winking at me. Heidi, you never cease to amaze me, I said, winking back, back at her. The gate to Victor's house word open. No matter how many times I had seen it, I could never get used to it. I walked inside. So, what have you got for me? Asked Victor. I have a surprise, I said. I don't like surprises, tell me quick, said Victor. Well, I think you will be happy to see it, I said. I opened the box for him. The locket shone. Victor's jet black eyes glowed. He grabbed the locket. And looked at me suspiciously, where did you find it? I told you it was in that location. Where else? Oh, but Victor opened the locket space to reveal the compartment. His voice turned dark. A grim look adorned his face. Where are they? Where is what? I asked. The jewels. Where are they? He asked. I honestly do not know what you are talking about, I said. I was just teasing you. No, you were not. You told me exactly what you got hidden in these lockets. Oh, okay. You got me worried just there. Victor called the two assistants in. They brought a device with them. What is that thing? I asked. Just a routine security procedure. We check everything for bugs. The assistants waved the machine over the locket. There was no noise. Is the machine still working? Asked Victor. Did you check first? Yes, boss, it is, said the assistant. He took his cell phone out. And waved the device close to it. A shrieking wail sound filled the room. He drew it back. The sound died. He now moved it over the locket. Nothing happened. Looks good, boss, said the man. Okay, they found it in the location that you showed me? Asked Victor. Yes, told you already. Now, are we done? I asked. Yes, looks like it, said Victor. He motioned one of his assistants. The man went inside and brought a fresh set of dollar notes. Here you go, girl, said Victor. And for your sake, I hope you keep in mind. You know nothing of this business. I nodded silently. 
Victor motioned me to go. I left the place. So, it is done? Asked Heidi. Yes, yes, and I just need to thank my MIT contact. This uses an experimental method for recording, rather than traditional ones, involving wireless signals. It only activates transmission when used with its receiver, I said. Oh, if I did not know you any better, that would sound like a sci-fi mumbo-jumbo to me, said Heidi. Well, it involves specialized radioactive tagging in circuits, which activate only at certain times. See, they have an experimental method like PET scan and are very safe. She has even sent me a device that we can use their server to track. I don't think we need that, but I'll give it to you just in case. I gave Heidi the small device that came with the locket. All you need to do is connect your phone to it using Bluetooth. That sounds like a plan, said Dr. Faith. I was concerned about your safety. These people don't seem very nice, said Heidi. So I am just glad you are done with them. Yeah for now. Let's see what we get in the recordings. The tricky part would be to get close enough to the unit to activate it for retrieving them. But for now, it can just do its job. My old Rusty was glowing. I had spent a few hours cleaning it. Hey, you look brand new now, I said, finishing cleaning the handle. Talking with your bike now? Is it giving any psychic vibes to you? said Marine playfully. When did you appear on the scene? I thought you were in deep slumber. I said. Well, I was up and made myself some latte. And then was watching you from the window, she said. Aha. So, you rose and shone? I asked. Yeah, something like that. Hey, the bike looks brand new now. Wow. Risa, you have changed. You really can clean up, she said playfully. Hey, you stop pulling my leg all the time. I shall still call her old Rusty though, I said. Yeah, the name sticks with its personality, she said, sipping noisily on her coffee. So, today is the big day? You going to climb the rocks? Rocks? Well, yes. And I finally got something out of Victor. He is looking for missing jewels. If I can hear him exclaim something, something at all with the locket, I will have evidence to get to the police. You know this sounds like a crazy plan, right? Asked Marine. I know, but do I have any other option? I was hoping to catch him on video or something. But that is not happening. So, other than that, I am not sure what else I could do right now, I said. Good luck, anyway, said Marine, and enjoy the climb. I will. Don't worry. I drove old Rusty to the town center. The mulberry wind blew in a mellow manner. I reached the coroner's office. The office appeared to offer a grim look at the otherwise cheerful surroundings. I knocked. There was no response. I pulled the door open. It was unlocked. Hi there, miss, said the man. Oh, it is you, miss fainting. It is Riza, I said. I blushed, recalling my last encounter with the old gentleman. Hopefully, I won't faint today. You have nothing to worry about. When you say it like that, I am worried already, he said. So, how may I help you? I was wondering if you still have Mr. Owen's body? I asked. Let me see. Nicholas peered down his glasses onto a register. You are in luck. He is going to be picked up today, though. Can I? I mean see him? I asked. You can meet him. Yes. But. Only if you promise not to faint on me again, he said, looking at me wearily. I did not blame him. I really don't know what came over me last time, I said. Was it the first time for you? He asked. Seeing a dead body? It was not the first time. My father's face came into my eyes. I was little when that happened. He was an army officer in intelligence. And I can never forget it when they brought him home. 
Are you okay? He asked. No, I am fine. I have seen a body or two maybe in my life. I am just making myself strong this time, I said. Well, if it helps, I hope you have eaten something to keep your blood sugar up this time, he said. I opened my bag and took out a chocolate bar. Okay, I shall ensure it this time around, I said. As I munched on the bar, Nicholas went about on his computer. I had always wondered how people work in such places. Does it get lonely here? I asked. Lonely? Well, I have a lot of company. Don't you think so? He said. Well, they are all. Dead? He asked. You know. They are now. But each of them has a story to tell. They had lives, families, happiness, sadness. When they come here, it is the end of the road for them. But it is not entirely sad. They had a life. So, when I am here. I see them. I see all that in their faces. Oh, I cannot imagine how you do that though, I said. This is your second time here, girl. You keep coming more often. You are going to develop a connection with them too, he said. A connection with them. This was something I had always dreaded. I did not want that connection. I hope I don't connect with one of them now. I had already got my hands full. Hello, Mr. Owen. We have a visitor to see you, said Nicholas. He pulled the body tray out of the holding box. The man's eyes were closed. He looked as if fast asleep. An eerie formalin stench hit my nose. Can I see his hands? I asked. Nicholas showed them to me. Nice clean hands. Anything else you want to see? Asked Nicholas. This caused the death. He showed me the fatal blows on the skull. I cringed, but thank God for sugar, didn't faint this time. Nah. It is all right. I have taken a general overview of his injuries and noted them on my phone, I said. Nicholas smiled. For a person scared of dead bodies, you are improving well on your second trip. Perhaps you can join the police as a career. I am just trying to get all the facts straight here. Nothing special, I said. I am just saying, said Nicholas. I already, already tried my hand at the FBI. Didn't work for me. I was an intern there, I said. FBI has a unique set of expectations than other law enforcement authorities. You never know, he said. I shall keep that in mind, I said, smiling courteously. Once outside, I started dialing on my phone. The person you are trying to reach is not available. Please leave a voice message after the tone. Wow. No wonder few people in Mulberry carry mobile phones. It seems pretty useless to keep one, anyway. I was off to my adventure and Jenny was not available. But I really could not stop now. I left her a voice message. Hi Wilbur, I said. Hi, Mississippi. How may I help you? I am here for Sam. I have texted him though, I said. I think I shall inform him. He is not much for reading text messages. I waited at the desk. I looked down. Interestingly, the bookings register was there this time. I looked around. There was a camera next facing the desk. Sam likes to keep tabs on his people. Wait. What? If there is a camera, that would mean there must be footage. But it would be fairly hard to ask for that from Sam. Wilbur came back rather quickly. He will be with you in ten minutes, he said. That is all right, I said. May I ask you something, Wilbur? Sure. Did you know Enrique well? I asked. I was just sad the way he ended, he said. I mean, I told you about him last time. Come to think of it, I do recall, he was a very kind person, though. Strange, he turned over to drugs. I don't think he was using them. 
The police think he was murdered, I said. That would be strange, though. Considering that I had seen him with drugs, as I had told you. Yes, that does not add up. I know, I said. So you ready? Said Sam, barging in. There was something about him that made him seem like a beast. Yes, was just waiting for you, I said. Let's go then, said Sam. Here we are, said Sam. The ride to the parking lot of the climbing area went away quickly. We stayed quiet mostly, mostly. I had been caught up thinking about the plan. There were so many things that could go wrong. But my visit to the morgue had opened up many new things. I just could not place all the pieces together. Sure. Sam, let's start, I said. You nervous? He asked. A bit. I mean, I know I can do the rope part. But the one later. That seems daunting. Is that really thirty feet? I said. Yes, thirty feet it is. But you are slim and athletic. So, I don't see any problems. You know, Riza, this is just training of the mind. So, you are saying this is just a mental hurdle? All it will take for me to fix would find my inner rock climber? I said, chuckling. Yeah, exactly. Just think about it. If you can do five feet of a wall, there is no actual difference between that and a thirty-foot rock, he said. True that. But then if I look down, I said. Well then, don't look down. Keep thinking you are on that five-foot rock. That would help, said Sam. Thank you. I shall try that then. Sam led the climb. He was fairly fast for his age. It almost felt natural for him to go up. I started slowly at first. Then remembered his advice. Started taking long breaths as I felt the wind and the surrounding land. Rather than thinking about where I was. And this time around, I was on the ledge in no time. Or at least, it felt that way. We sat there on the ledge for a few minutes. I closed my eyes. Took a long breath. Hey, don't sleep here. You are not a pro, said Sam. Oh, was just trying to unwind a bit, I said, trying to open my eyes. The sun shone brightly in my eyes. You want to stay here a bit? I'd like to move up now, he said. Oh, okay. That is all right. You can move on. I shall go up in a few minutes, I said. Sam got up and started his climb to the top. I had decided decided to first calm myself down before attempting it. I got up and looked up. Sam was almost near the top. I started. As I reached the top, I was sweating. The sky looked a deep blue. Something was different today. The cold mountain breeze stung my face. Sam was nowhere to be seen. I wondered what had happened here. This was the place Owen had lost his life. I could not connect with him, as I was too focused on the climb itself. My heart was beating itself out of my ribcage. If I can only find out what had happened here. I stood among a group of trees. The forest completely obscured the view. Smells of pine and other evergreens filled my nostrils. I adjusted my backpack. It felt empty without my rock climbing and life companion. I was already missing Misty. I wonder what she is up to. Why did she not join me? Her thoughts had calmed me in my climb. I sat on a stone wondering as I caught my breath. Crunch. A sound startled me. Someone was here. Maybe Sam? I looked at the side. A clearing. Someone was coming. Not one, many and I could hear them talking. Deep voices. I wondered who it was, but there was barely any time to hide. I looked around. Most of the area was visible from all sides. There was a set of rocks, though, on the side. But if I went there, I would be stuck. Why was I behaving in this manner? 
It could just be some family on a trip. Right? Or maybe some other climbers. As much as I did not want to believe it, something inside me urged me to move. I had to do something. The eagle in the air gave a sharp noise. The wind was talking to me, and the grass quivered as I rose. I got up and sprinted to the trees. That was the best chance I had. I had. I found some cover. Victor appeared from behind the trees. His battle-worn face was agitated. His half-covered head of hair blew in the wind. He was alone. Who had been with him? Who had he been talking to? He was wearing a brown leather bag. I was in my thoughts, but then I saw. He had spotted me. You. Girl. What are you doing here? I knew it. He ran towards me. I looked around. There was no way out. I could not go down just yet. Even if I tried, I would end up falling. I recalled having given him the location on top of the rocks just to throw him off. But this was not good. Think Riza think. I could make a run for it. That was my only chance. Let me try that. I ran towards the forest. Victor was coming in fast. Too fast. He did not get time to make amends in his path. He tried to stop and slipped. But he was strong on his feet. I did not look back, I was thin and athletic, I could make it easier. As I ran towards the forest, my ears plucked sounds from behind. There was no time though to look back. I saw a light. I ran towards it. The sound of huffing and puffing was behind me. But I felt I was putting enough distance between him. I was in a clearing now. I looked back. I had been following a random path to get him off my track. I tried checking my phone. Oh no. No signals. Ugh. Mulberry and mobile phones. Suddenly, I heard a thud. I turned. Victor was here now. He was coming towards me. I must give it to him. The man had energy like an ox and ran like a racehorse. There was nowhere for me to run. For a moment, I thought I had a few seconds to relax. I started taking long breaths. I had to face him. But not let him show I was waiting. He came to me quick, fists drawn, bloodshot eyes. I adjusted my pose, ready to get my first shot. I sized him up in my mind's eye, a colossal frame, maybe six feet four inches, square box mustache. He would not talk. I could see it. I had to use his momentum to my advantage. He came closer. I readied my right leg behind me. His hand was ready to punch. It was almost in slow motion. I figured out what I had to do. As he came within an arm's length, his right fist was moving towards me. I moved to my left a bit. I rotated on my left leg. My right leg adjusted the kick. With the roundhouse kick, I hit him. It connected to his head. The momentum of his body with my foot to his head. There was a thud as my hiking boots hit. There was a crack. If it were someone else, it would have broken a few bones. In those seconds, he looked at me. He had a confused look on his face. He had not expected me to act like this. But he reacted quickly. He stabilized himself. His hand grabbed my neck. I tried to get away. But he had long arms. I felt his claw-like hold on my thin neck, I had to do something, I analyzed the situation. I was not in full strength because of the climb. And the unexpected situation. He was big. I was little. He was not in a mood to talk or reason. I had to do something quickly. But he knew my strengths from what his men must have told him. I had to use something harder in one of his soft spots. I reacted. A stab in his neck. It startled him. I tried again. 
His eyes shot out. I could feel his grip on my neck weakening. I kept stabbing. Finally, he let go. He took a breath. Before I could do anything, he pushed me and rolled on me, pinning me with his elbow. Pressing my neck. I knew there was not much time left. Whatever I had to do, it was now. I took in a long breath, constricted by his elbow. With my nails, I attacked his neck again, applying a tiger claw to hold on to his already hurt, hurt larynx. It felt like forever, but then he was down. I pushed him over, sat up, and held his neck again. Just tell me, what did you do? He coughed and spurted. I. I. You girl. You, you are here for the jewels. I don't care for your jewels, and I don't care for the five hundred dollars you gave me. I want the truth. Did you kill Owen and what was the role of the animal, the I.I.? What do you do with them? Okay. Okay. I will tell you. See, I get exotic animals transported from foreign locations. No pets, he said, sputtering again and coughing. Nobody checks them much. So, they are given collars and lockets. These have items, expensive items like diamonds, sapphires, rubies. That is it. But Enrique. Who is Enrique? Oh, that driver who let all the animals go away. I know him. The middleman handled him. Tell me his name, I asked. Pressing his neck again. He does not have to tell anything. Let me tell you, a familiar voice said behind me. I turned. Sam was standing holding a heavy pistol at me. He lifted the pistol, and I blanked. I could not move. They tied my hands behind me. I tried moving my legs. They were bound, too. I looked. Sam was standing by Victor, who was seated on a rock. He was massaging his neck and looking at me. His two assistants were standing there. Well, well, look who just woke up, said Sam, laughing. It was you all along. Oh, my goodness, I said, tears of rage filled my eyes. Yeah, and just imagine how you were coming over with me here. No idea that I was the one who did your friend Enrique with Owen, he said. And Owen, you did him too? I asked. Yeah, poor stupid Owen. He thought he had me. Well, look who is now six feet under. He and that scoundrel, Enrique. How dare he let go of all the, the animals? Said Sam, a frown clouding his long face. Well, enough talk. We need to send you packing, too. Right, boss? Victor was still clutching his neck. This girl is very feisty. Too bad she is not on our side. I could have used her for training my minions, said Victor. How will you get rid of her? Boss, I got rid of Enrique, right? Said Sam. You are not very good at it, Sam. You got Owen to get rid of that driver. And then your Owen turned back on you. So, you led a set of breadcrumbs. So, tell me, girl, asked Victor, where did you get the locket, and where are my jewels? Victor took out the locket from the bag. I really don't know about the jewels. I was only here for my friend. My eyes were closed. Everything is a mess. I had been wrong. Sam, the person I had thought was my friend. He was just there with me to ensure I did not get too close. I took long breaths. Started listening to my heartbeat. Dub dub. Dub dub. Dub dub. I went deep. I could see all the pieces of the puzzle. They had to make sense. And I had to get out. I looked. I needed Misty. Too bad she was away. I saw her far. The wall. It came again. I had to break it. I asked for help. I knew I was in trouble. There was nothing I could do. I had to do it. 
I used my heart. I found strength coming out. A light. First small. Like a brief candle. Beating. Then it started spreading throughout my body. Then beyond. I saw it. The wall stopped it. And then I was on the other side of the wall. I did not have to break the wall. I had passed through it. Misty was there. She was looking at me. I had to connect with her. She was my only hope. I entered. My owner. My friend. She is in peril. If I do not do something, she will be. No, I cannot let that happen. What do I do? I jumped off the mat. Her friend. She is sitting there watching the big screen with pictures. I tried to jump. I could not make it. I tried again. She looked down, picking me up and talking to me. As her hand, hand touched me. I entered. Oh my God, said Marine. I am seeing you, Riza. I can see. Where are you? Oh, this is too much to handle. Okay, okay. Let me call the police lady. But I don't know her number. Let me ask Heidi. Okay. Stay with me. No, no, where are you going? I was back. This was the first time I had connected to a person. And it was only because of my special connection with Misty. Through Misty, I had connected with Maureen. Was it all real? Or was it just a dream? I know time is short. The men pulled me out from the tent where they had kept me. I opened my eyes. So, Risa, any last words? Asked Sam. You are all going to hell, I said. We know that already. Don't we, boss? Said Sam. Victor looked at me triumphantly. Yes, we do. We worship evil. Miss Riza, you don't know which forces you have messed with. Which forces are they? Enlighten me, I said, defiantly. I am not scared of you. Good shall always triumph over evil. Yeah, maybe. But you are going down, said Victor, and the forces I am talking about. I think you know them already. You came in the court of my esteemed lady, who is part of the high command. The face of the strange old woman at Victor's place came to my memory. I had also seen her in my dream. She was much more than just a human being. She practiced the dark arts. You know something? The funny part? I said, I am not afraid of you. Why? Why are you not afraid? You realize you are going to die, right? Said Sam. Yeah, and is there anyone on the planet who won't? But like my father, who died fighting the terrorists, he was a martyr. What I care about is that I shall die in a fight for a just cause. So, even by dying, I shall win, I said, smiling back at them triumphantly. I so want to wipe this smile off her face, boss, said one of the assistants. Untie me and I shall show you how I can wipe the smile off your face. I think you have forgotten what I did to you last time, have you not? I said. Enough talk, said Victor. Let's get this one going. Going. She has seen too much already. The men lifted me up. I could do nothing but show my anger. We need to make sure it looks like a fall from the rocks. So, we will have to untie her first, said Sam. But boss, how can we do that? She will attack us, said the other man. We are four adult powerful men here. Are you telling me you are afraid of a young girl? Asked Victor. Okay, let's incapacitate her first. Bring a rock, said Sam. The men started looking around for one. I started my prayers. I thanked God for the life and all blessings and especially for allowing me to die for a just cause. The man had brought a stone and raised his hand over my head. I closed my eyes. The day had spelled nothing but trouble for Jenny. 
First, her son was down with the flu. Then, her husband had to go for a remote location overnight trip. And now, this voice message from Riza. The girl had been extremely annoying since her arrival in Mulberry. And she came with a bang. One dead body after the first one. The phone rang impatiently. Yes, yes. I am coming. Just let me do one more document. Whoever you are, Jenny said, impatiently. The phone kept ringing. Oh, goodness gracious. Who is it? She got back to her desk and lifted the phone. You have reached Mulberry Police Department, she said. What? Where? God no, she said. She looked at her desk. Keys, car keys. Where did I put them? A loud bang filled the air. And a thud. I opened my eyes. The man's hand was bleeding. Both hands raised. Fear in his eyes. The stone had fallen just next to my head to the right. Move and next will be between your eyes, Jenny's familiar voice echoed. I looked around. She was standing around fifteen feet away with her service pistol aimed at the group. Raise your hands, she said in a commanding voice. Victor looked at her and me. His face crept with contempt. Contempt. He was having a hard time finding words. He raised his hands. Followed by the three others. Throw your weapons on the ground. And lie down on the floor, hands behind the head, she said. It's over for you folks. Risa, are you all right? Yes, I am. Though just a bit tied up, I said. We'll get you out in a minute. State police are on their way, too. I heaved a sigh of relief. And closed my eyes. I saw Enrique. Thank you, Riza. You avenged me. When I opened my eyes, the place was crawling with the police. A policewoman removed my ropes. I stood up. Better now? She asked. Yes, thank you so much. I am, I said. I saw Jenny standing nearby, looking at me. So, you have gotten yourself into trouble again. Lucky for you, your friend Heidi called, said Jenny, smiling. Yes, that is what friends are for, I said. Jenny, thank you for this. I got your back, Riza, she said. To be honest, I am not sure what this all means yet. I shall tell you all about it. Whatever I have, all evidence this time, including recordings, I said, smiling. Chapter 16 So, the case is closed? Asked Heidi. Yes, I think it is, I said. I am still not sure I understand how everything is connected, said Dr. Faith. Let me explain. Sam initially smuggled the I.I. Bob for his boss, Victor, I said. Enrique had joined the job, as he loved transporting animals. Now, when he realized they were mistreating animals, he let them go. He was like that. So, they must have been really unhappy about this? Asked Heidi. Yes, they were. And that is why Sam planted those drugs on him first, to just show Wilbur that Enrique was taking drugs. And then later, he fired him in front of Wilbur. So where does Owen fit in, then? Asked Dr. Faith. Owen. Owen, yes, he was Sam's accomplice, and he would insure the drivers. He also did drugs. That is how Sam got the injectable drugs, too. So, they placed Enrique on the spot after the overdose. And what happened to Owen, then? Asked Dr. Faith. Owen was getting greedy. He was planning on extracting money from Pedra, I said. So Sam took him to the rocks. But when I went to the morgue, I discovered he had clean hands. If he had fallen off while climbing, he must have magnesium carbonate on them. But he didn't. So he must have been hit on the head and then left there. The rope cutting was to distract. But if they hit him on the head, then there must be something which was used. Right? Asked Heidi. 
Yes, I am guessing police would now have to find the murder weapon, but considering that Sam kept a toolbox in his van, it's possible a hammer or something might be there or else he must have discarded it in the forest someplace. Either way, he is caught, I said. That seems like a wrap. But what about hard evidence? Asked Dr. Faith. Well, luckily for me, they have been booked for trying to kill me. Besides, their entire conversation has been recorded in the locket, which I have retrieved and given to the police, I said. That explains it. Now, what happened with Pedra? How did she have drugs? Was it Sam? Asked Heidi. You are right. Sam felt I was getting too close to solving the case. He did not want to take risks. That is why he planted those drugs in her room. So that is also why he was trying to be in your good books. Asked Dr. Faith. Exactly. He wanted to get as much information from me as I had, I said. But you could not figure out if it was Sam? Asked Heidi. Sam was very well protected. Although I had doubts, I got confirmation when I connected the dots. I wanted Sam to be frank. Though I had not expected it would go this way. Well, we have something for you, said Heidi. Faith, would you like to tell her? So, we were hoping if you can join us as an external member of the Odd Club, said Dr. Faith. The club has not opened for external members in the past decade. So, this is a first, said Heidi. We are impressed by your skills, the way you have solved this case. I am flattered. Really. It is just that I was hoping to get back to Boston. The excitement here has been unbelievable, I said. But I guess it is time to go back. Well, external members do not have to be physically present in the meetings. We have members from around the globe. So, I doubt going back home would be a problem, said Dr. Faith. In that case, I will be thrilled to accept. Just let me know what I am supposed to do. I asked. Everything in its own time, Riza dear, everything in its time, said Heidi. Hello, Catherine, I said. How are you doing? Riza, how are you? I have been thinking so much about you. Did you find something about my brother? said Catherine. Yes, I am calling to confirm that the police have the murderer in their custody. And it is clear now that Enrique did not do any drugs. His name is cleared. The voice on the other end broke down. She was sobbing hard. How can I thank you? May God bless you, Riza. You. I don't know what I should do for you. Tell me. Anything. Any favor. From here. I shall do it for you. It will relieve my mother. She has been crying the day since we came to know that Enrique has passed away. Don't mention it. Really, I did it for Enrique. These are bad guys and they deserve to be caught. Just keep remembering us. Keep in touch, please, said Catherine. I will. I will, I said. The shelter was looking delightfully pleasant in the morning sun, usual suspects were up as I filled in their feeding bowls, they had all gotten used to me and my habits by now and me with them. I had come early today. The excitement had not let me sleep. So, today is the day? Asked Alice. We were both standing in front of Bob's place. He was looking at us calmly, something he was not particularly well known for. Yes, looks like it, certainly. The company should be here in an hour, I said. He does not know where he is going, said Alice. I could see the undercurrents of a rare smile. Well, the poor animal has had a lonely life here, with all the people after him and that dreadful collar, I said. Well, yes, but one thing is sure. He won't be lonely where he is going. The zoo has many members of its species. Who knows? He may settle down there and be happy, said Alice. Yeah, he is weary. He is wondering what we are up to, I said. Misty purred and jumped out of my bag. 
she was up to no good, as usual. She was picking up little crumbs wherever I dropped them. Well, he can. Mommy Alice has found a great place for him, said Alice. I looked at her looking at Bob with such love as she was his own personal mommy. I was going to miss him, Dr. Alice, the shelter, and Mulberry. I heaved a sigh. I was having mixed feelings. On one hand, the mystery of Enrique's murder had been solved. On the other, I had grown attached to this strange little town and its quirky funny at others, but quite interesting inhabitants. Dana, you look awesome in these, said Maureen. Really? I feel embarrassed, said Dana, adjusting her golden glasses. You know, I think you look really cool in them, I said. Misty, what do you think? Misty purred and rubbed against my tummy in agreement. And let's see what my Tinkerbell has to say about it. Said Dana. Tinkerbell touched her face gently. She is intrigued by my new look. Dana, you need to use these glasses regularly. Remember, the doctor advised them. You may have a little headache at the start though, said Marine. But you will get used to them in a jiffy. Thank you so much, both of you. Risa, having you here has been a blessing in disguise. I didn't realize, realize my problem could be solved so easily, said Dana. Well, this is the first step. And you need to go see the doctor regularly. He has already talked with Heidi. And you are all covered, I said. I am going to miss you though, Risa, said Dana. Why do you have to go back? Dana, I love this place. I really do. But looks like my tasks here are done. I have helped put the wheels in motion and you know, things happened. But I guess it is time for me to return home, I said. Still, you are welcome any time, said Dana. She hugged me strongly and took a selfie with Maureen and me. As I sat there looking at Maureen chatting with Dana, packing my stuff, something touched my hand. A rough piece of paper. I took it out. It was the strange paper I had found in the truck. And I had completely forgotten about it. As I held it, a strange quietness came over me. Darkness fell. I was in a room. I was extremely tired and worn out. My knocks were now muffled, and my hands were aching from scratching the wooden door. One side of the door was a bit more open. I could see a glimpse of daylight outside. Smells of fall leaves were coming inside, but there was also the stench. I smelled sweat feeling had been here for days or weeks. I felt weakness gripping my legs, if only Susan was here, thoughts and cries of my elder sister's laughter echoed through my mind. No one is going to find us. We will all die here, cried the girl sitting on the left. Why do you say that? I know someone will look for us. I can feel it in my heart, I replied. No one will come here for you, the old woman said. I recognized her. And then I saw her looking at me. She could see me inside that girl. Wait, how did you get here? Get out. She brought out a sword and pointed it at me. Looks like Victor and Sam did not finish you. No, they did not. I shall now send in reinforcements. Get out of my property. Her sword breathed fire. I closed my eyes and focused. A blue shield covered me, and the woman fell backwards from its glow. I woke up. My heart was beating fast. Looks like I had to be in Mulberry. Those two girls needed me. Evil was still here. I could not go away. Want to read more? Check out the next in the series. Ghost of Mulberry Pines, a paranormal kitten cozy mystery. Riza and Misty are in big trouble again. Riza is accused of murder and from all that she can recall, she might have actually done it. Why is the ghost haunting Riza's dreams? Can she solve the mystery of the Mulberry Pines, find out who killed Olivia, and save the two girls? This is the second book in the Meditating Psychic Cozy Mysteries, but you can read the books independently. 
https colon slash slash www.amazon.com slash dp slash b09qj9vqks. Check out the other books in the Meditating Psychic Cozy Mystery series here. https colon slash slash www.amazon.com slash dp slash b09mk3pppx. Afterward. Writing a book is a labor of love. My goal is to write clean fiction, a fun read for the entire family. It takes a lot of effort on part of the author, editor, beta, and proofreaders and, of course, the cover designer. If you liked this book, please leave a review. I love reviews since they tell other readers that this book is worth their time and money and encourage me to write more. I hope you feel that way now that you have finished this book. If you find something in the book that you think that my team might have overlooked or if you just want to be part of my beta readers and get early access to the other books in this or another series, please drop me a line at zephbaxter at thefulltimeauthor.com. If you would like to get free content and learn about promotions, please subscribe to my newsletter here, http colon slash slash www.thefulltimeauthor.com. If you would like to check out my occasional shares on interesting topics ranging from science to astronomy, and from pets to recipes, check out my Facebook page, https colon slash slash bit.ly slash 3fdnsat. If you are on Twitter, have read this book, and want Reese's adventures to continue, let me know, https colon slash slash twitter.com slash authorsf.